in this course we are going to dive into the dart programming language this course is specifically designed for non programmers now if you're someone who has previous coding experience in another language don't worry since this course is designed for everyone even those with coding experience you can follow along at an accelerated pace so i'll recommend you to watch the videos at 1.5x speed for topics you're already familiar with like variables functions classes and so on before we dive into flutter specific concepts i want to make sure you have a solid foundation in dart thus this course serves as a prerequisite to the flutter beginners course which will release shortly after this one one last note for non programmers learning a new language can sometimes bring up questions or confusion that's completely normal if you encounter any difficulties or have questions about the concepts or syntax we cover in the tutorial don't hesitate to ask you can leave your questions in the comment section below we also have a discord server with over 2500 members including myself ready to assist you every step of the way link to the discord server is mentioned in the description below so that wraps up our introduction now let's understand what dart is and how is it different from other programming languages dart is an open source language developed by google it shares similarities with other popular programming languages like javascript and java If you're already familiar with these languages, learning Dart will be a breeze. But now the question is, why would you use Dart instead of JavaScript or Java? The primary reason many people use it is because they want to learn Flutter. Flutter uses Dart and allows you to build apps for iOS, Android, web and desktop with a single code base. This doesn't mean Dart is only used to build user interfaces. It can also be used to build backend, your own server or anything else you prefer. So before diving into code there's a thing I want to mention really quick dart comes with two compilation processes by compilation i mean the process of translating the source code the code we type into machine code so compilation is basically converting from human readable format to a format which the computer can understand so the two compilation processes are just in time jit and aot short for ahead of time compilation During development Dart uses the JIT compiler which allows for fast iteration and immediate feedback. It means you can make changes to your code and see the results without waiting for a lengthy compilation. However, when it's time to deploy your Dart app, you can use the AOT compiler. The AOT compiler compiles your Dart code into optimized native machine code. This results in faster execution and improved performance, making your applications really efficient. So to write dart code we need something known as an SDK. SDK stands for software development kit. Now what is this software development kit? Let's break it down. Software development kit, a kit for software development and it's somehow related to dart, right? So let's take an analogy to understand this better. Suppose you're building a model car. When constructing this model a whole kit of items is needed including the kit pieces the tools needed to put them together assembly instructions and so on similarly in dart or any other programming language when you want to try to run it on your own machine you need something as an sdk so that you can write your code test it out and run your code as well right now your system doesn't have any information about dart when you give it a set of tools it knows that yeah this is how i need to process dart code and if you give me this instruction in the command line this is how i will do it so those are the set of tools we require there are three primary ways of installing dart sdk first one is by installing the flutter sdk flutter sdk contains the dart sdk so using it we can create flutter apps where we can write dart code or we can create dart packages or dart projects that will allow us to write dart code second option is to go to dart.dev and install the dart sdk when we install the dart sdk from here we won't be able to create flutter apps and run them but we'll be able to test out our dart code and the third option is using dartpad dartpad is a bit different from these two solutions dartpad is a way to write dart code inside the browser itself So you don't have to go through the hassle of installing the SDK or anything. You can directly start writing your Dart code over here, and that's exactly the approach we are going to take. The reason we are not installing the Flutter SDK or the Dart SDK is because 
there might be some installation processes where you might get stuck and the point of this tutorial is not about installing anything it's just about practicing to write dart code when we get to the flutter section we are definitely going to install flutter sdk so that we can have local development and with that we'll get the dart sdk so we are going to locally install flutter and dart in the flutter section but for now let's start writing a code in dart pad and let's dive into dart so first thing we are going to do is remove all of the code that we see here and we are just going to have an empty thing right here don't remove this part because this thing right here is very important this is what is known as a function and we are going to know more about it as we go forward in the tutorial but for now you can consider this thing as the entry point to your dart applications and dart programs But if you see right now, this thing right here is empty. And if I try to run it, nothing is spit out in the console or in the documentation or anywhere. Everything remains the same. What I want to happen is something should be spit out in the console so that it gives me some sense of encouragement to keep coding. So I want to see some output in the console. How can I do that? So to do that, we have some special keyword Keyword are basically special words that carry special meaning in Dart or any other programming language in general. So if you have print and if you type it like this, you'll be able to print out something in the console. But here we get an error. It says one positional argument expected by print but zero found. What does this line even mean? You'll get to know more about it when we move forward and by the end of this tutorial, you'll be able to understand almost all the frequent error messages. I can just try experimenting something, right? In the print, I'm just going to pass in what I want to see in the console. I want to see hello world to be seen in the console. So if I do this and you know, then try to run, but even before running, it gives me an error. It says undefined name, hello. Try correcting the name to one that is defined or defining the name. And here it says too many positional arguments, one expected but two found. Now, this error message is similar to the last one if you notice. When we had nothing typed out here, we got one expected, zero found. But now we have two found. Just keep this in mind. So when we move forward in the tutorial, you'll be able to analyze these error messages. And the reason we are getting all of these errors is basically because we want to wrap all of this text that we have in single inverted or double inverted commas. So if you do that and click on run, you'll be able to see something in the console. Earlier, it didn't work because it thought it is something known as variable and we have not defined any sort of variable here. And to print something, that is a text in Dart, all we need to do is wrap it with a double inverted or a single inverted comma. Both of them work the same way. And we can also pass in numbers instead of this text message. And while in text, we needed to have the double inverted or single inverted comma. When spitting out some number, we don't have to do that. We can just have three written over here and run it and we'll be able to see it in the console. But even if you do this and try to run it, it doesn't matter, it prints it out. So either of them work, but both of these things are not similar or same. They're quite different from each other. To show you these th two things are different from each other, what I'm going to do is use operators to explain them. Now, I hope you know operators, and if you don't know, well, they are basically addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, all of that. So I'm going to use operators to make you understand that these two things are different. So we are going to have three plus two over here, which we can do it in the print statement and it doesn't throw any error. And the result we should be expecting is five. And that's what we get, five. And we can keep doing this. We can have three plus two minus two into so this is the sign for into in programming. You have to add an asterisk to do into. If you use x, obviously it thinks it is some sort of variable. So you have to have into two 
divided by 4. And if I do this much and run it, we get 4. Now, if I just remove this from here and instead have 3 plus 2 like this, we get an error. The error says the argument type int can't be assigned to the parameter type string. Now, what does this error mean? I'm not going to explain it to you right now, but you'll understand it very soon. And I'm sorry for doing this, but you'll understand as we move ahead. The point I'm trying to make here is not to make you understand error messages now. I just want to tell you that these two things are different. And if I just convert this to in a string as well and add a plus over here and then try to run it, we should be expecting five, but we get 32. Why is that the case? Well, that's because Dart considered this a text, this a text, and this plus operator here thought if either of them are string or both of them are string, I should be adding them. By added here, I mean concatenated. Now let's experiment a little bit. What if we get put minus sign over here? And as you can see, we get an error. Minus multiplication, division, anything of that sort is not allowed. You can only put in a plus because it thinks it's concatenating, but it does throw a warning because that's not the way to do it. There is another way to do the same thing, but we'll explore it as we move along. Interestingly, if we put multiplication here, we get an error saying the argument type string can't be assigned to the parameter type int and it only highlights this part. So what if I convert this into number and this into a normal text and then try to run it. As you see, we get 33. That's because it prints three, two times. So it's basically multiplying the text and adding it together. So if you have 22 and then try to run it, you'll get three 22 times written over here. You can count it for yourself. Now, I just want to show you something related to numbers that we've done previously. If we have five divided by four plus two minus four, and let's add a multiplication as well, and then try to run it, you get minus 4.75. And if you try to calculate on your own, this will be the answer. And you're calculating this using board mass. And that's exactly what dot follows. Dot follows operator precedence. That means things like multiplication, division, take precedence over things like addition, subtraction. Also, if we have bracket over here, that's going to take precedence over division or multiplication. So if you try to run it, you get the same thing because four into two takes precedence over minus. If I have to show you a simple example, just to clear it off, we have 75 divided by five plus two, and then try to run it, we get 17 because 75 divided by five is 15 plus two, 17. But if we put bracket over here in five plus two, what will we get? Will we get 17? No we should be getting 75 divided by seven, which is 10.742. So now that you know about these two things, what if I want to make my notes over here? I've learned something new that Dart follows Bordmas or any other programming language mostly follows Bordmas. I just want to make a note over here. Dart follows Bordmas. I just want to write this here. But if I try to write this here, we get an error. So do I have to enclose this in a string? No, that's not a good idea because this thinks this is a text which is different from what I want. I want to make notes for me. I don't want to make some text that is understood by the Dart program. I want to create something that is understood by me as a programmer. So to do that, we have something known as comments and comments are of different types as well. These comments allow me to make notes for me so that I can understand my code better even if I look after, you know, 10 years. And the different type of comments I was talking about is first this one, the single line comment. What if my note extends more than two lines, you know, more than one line, sorry. So if I have another one which says dot is cool, right? Now I can do this, you know, put 
single line comments to make it multi line but what's a cleaner solution for us so that i don't have to put this two forward slashes again and again so for that we have multi line comment with this i can just have a syntax like this syntax basically refers to the script in a programming language if that makes sense so this is a script of english language this is a script of dart all right so i have this comment which says this is the start of the comment but i've not ended it so it doesn't know where to end so it covers everything rest of the line in the dart program so to end it what i have to do is put asterisk forward slash again and now it knows that this thing right here is my comment and this is the scope of it that means this is the part where i can create my notes and if you want you can go ahead and create your notes here as well you can create as many comments as you want but if you're extending more than one line it's obviously recommended to use multi line comment a third type of comment exists as well which is called a documentation comment this might not be useful to you right now but when you start creating your flutter apps you'll be able to use and make sense of these documentation comments now if documentation comment doesn't make sense to you don't worry about it you'll understand as we develop our own app in flutter and when we have several files to scan through so now that we've completed all of this let's remove it and dive into variables what are variables i'm just going to ask you what do you think variables are variables by looking at the word it just means things that can vary right and that's exactly what variables are variables are just ways to store the data and later on change it now you might ask when would i need to manipulate or change some data let's take an example to understand this further suppose you know we have a print statement and here we are just asking for the user input and the user input gives us 19 i'm not really asking for a user input here i'm just faking the value but in a real life scenario we are going to ask the user what is the first value going to be what is the second value going to be and based on that we are going to carry out multiplication addition subtraction all right okay so this is my first value after that i'm going to ask for the second value also and that is going to be input from the user as well let's say the user entered 5 now i want to make some calculations based on this so i'm just going to have print 19 into 5 print 19 plus 5 and print 19 minus 5 all right so i'm taking the first value and the second value and multiplying adding and subtracting if i run i get 19 first value that we printed second value that we printed 19 into 5 is 95 19 plus 5 is 24 and 19 minus 5 is 14 so we get the correct values now what's the problem here well the first problem is we are just faking the value by ourselves right but in a real life scenario we don't know what the user will enter will the user enter 19 20 25 we don't know we have to assign a variable to this which will contain this value and we can use it later on and let's say we are not taking the user input only we are taking the values on our own all right so no user input is involved we are basically telling this is 19 this is 5 and we have to do multiplication addition subtraction based on these two values but later on someone else comes in and says the first value shouldn't be 19 it's very easy calculation let's make it something more difficult let's make it let's say 302 and this should be 51 now now i'll have to go through this entire program change everything everywhere so i'll have to add 302 into 51 302 plus 51 302 minus 51 and suppose we have like hundreds of print statements will i do that in every single print statement or every single line that's not an effective solution right i'll have to do so much work just to change one value and if the value changes again and again that will be a big problem and that's why variables were introduced so to create a variable this is the syntax for it this is how it looks in dart every programming language has something differently done in dart this is how you can do it so we have to first mention a data type then we have to mention a variable name then i'll assign 
using the equal to and then i want to pass in some value and finally a semicolon semicolon is used for the print as well it's going to be used here as well it's used for probably almost every single line that you have there are some exceptions like you know this thing right here this doesn't have any semicolon it has a curly bracket but we are going to discuss more about this curly bracket and why it exists the advantage of having this semicolon actually is if you just want to put everything in one line so you have multiple print statements in one line and that will work as well okay so if you just do this and run we get the say we cut the right output so you can have all of them in a single line thanks to the semicolon it's kind of like a full stop in your english language all right so coming back to this if you want to come back to anything you just need to press control z if you're on windows and if you're on mac command z and you'll be back here it is the undo option and if you want to redo you can have command shift z and it will redo all the stuff for you so now that we have all of this out of the way let's create variable for first value and second value and use those variables so first we need to understand here what is a data type so there are multiple types of data right it can either be a number it can be a text it can be something else what do we want well i want my data to be a whole number a natural number a negative number a positive number that doesn't matter but it should not be a decimal number that's my restriction i need to know if my number is going to have a decimal or not if it's going to have decimal then we have a data type assigned to it called double but if we don't have a decimal we are going to have something known as int both of them double and int allow you to have negative numbers positive numbers but the difference lies in the decimal point so with int you can store proper numbers not any fraction or anything but with double you can store decimal fractions etc so we are going to use int because i don't want there to be any decimals and then i'm going to have variable name which is first value now you might ask why do we need variable name variable name is needed so that we can distinguish two variables from each other for example i am rivan and there's some other person called naman we are given two different names so that we can uniquely identify each other that's the case with variable we are giving this the variable name of first value then you are going to create a second variable and that is going to be called second value okay and then i'm going to add is equal to set it to a value my value is 302 and there we go we have first value variable created and if we tap over this in our documentation part we see int first value local variable now we are going to have second variable and that is we int second value which is equal to 51 now i can remove all of this i'll take this first value and instead of print i'm going to print first value over here I'll take the second value. I'll print second value over here. And now you see warnings are going. The warnings appeared first because we had not used this variable, but we had created it. Dart is very smart to know that we haven't used this second value anywhere in our function. All right. So that's why it says, "Yeah, you have not used it. It's better to remove it." But we have to use it, so I'm just going to use it over here. Let's remove the comment. then i'll take this first value replace it with 302 then the second value replace it with 51 and i'm going to continue doing this over here so i'll have first value 2000 years later now my entire code is dependent on variables and if i try to run it i get the same output i print first value okay so it checked yeah this is first value first value has already been created so let's take first value from here Let's take its value and print it. Then we have second value. The same happened over here. Let's find for a variable second value. Yeah, it exists. So we are going to take this fifty one and print it over here. Then we have first value. We already know the first value that is three hundred and two into fifty one. So it multiplied them. Then first value plus second value. So it had three hundred and two plus fifty one. So the same thing happened, but now instead of hard coding it by hard coding, I mean 
manually typing 300 and 251 every single place i'm going to replace everything with variable and i did it the benefit of this now is if i have 310 year and if i decide to change this to 102 and then try to run it i will get completely different results the benefit is i don't have to keep changing every single thing here i just needed to change one thing or second thing the values and all of them automatically change their values now let's try to do the same thing with double now so if i use double here and let's say we use double here and then i have 310.50 and 102.22 just to demonstrate to you that i wasn't lying if you have interviewer it will throw you a compile time error that means while you're coding while you're writing in your code editor it will tell you with a red warning or red error that yeah this is wrong and if you try to run it it will give you an error so we have double now we got rid of the red warning and you see, I get 310.5 instead of 0 0.50, I get 0.5 data smart. Then we have 102.22 and all of these, which you can calculate on your own. Now, other than numbers, we have other data types as well. Another data type is string. So you know how in your print statements you used to write, let's remove all of this so that we don't have any confusion. We have understood why we need variables. Now, if I use string over here, you know, we get an error because this is a type of double and i've used string now what exactly is a string you know how in your print statements you had written hello world like this and then when you try to print it it printed hello world now this thing right here this text is a string so if you take this paste it over here you see the error goes away now there's just a warning that you've not used this value of course we can just use it over here and then run it and we get hello world so string is used for text for words for characters you can use string so you can even store a single character in a string and this string like in the print statement we saw can have single inverted or double inverted comma and that's going to work just fine there are two more data types that i want to show you right now of course there are going to be more but as of now, I'm going to show you two more. Later on in the tutorial, we'll cover more. Another type is bool like this. This bool here stands for boolean, all right? In other programming languages like Java, you define it like this boolean first value is equal to false or true, you know, either of them, either it's going to be false or true. And as you can understand, boolean value only tells you if you're going to have a true value or a first uh, or a false value. So you cannot have string numbers or anything. You can either have true, which is a keyword in Dart, or it can be false. Again, this is a keyword. Of course, if you use this within a string, it loses its value. But as of now, like this, it has a special meaning. And when you try to run it, you'll see false printed out over here. Now you might ask, why would I need a Boolean value? Why would I need just a true or false? There are many cases where you might need Boolean. For example, we're going to have is adult. So we just want to know whether the child is adult or not. And this is a naming convention. All right, let's make this small. So this is a naming convention. Whenever you have a Boolean, most people prefer to have is before it. So, you know, you know that this is a Boolean value and you don't have is not adult or nothing no sort of negation is there it's either is adult or is child and that's much better to read it's just a convention obviously you can name variable names whatever you want but yeah they cannot be repeating themselves so you can have boolean is child which is false and then you can print is child and run it so with this variable now you get access to you know getting to know is this a child or is this an adult if the child is false that means it is an adult and the last type that i want to show you is very interesting and that is dynamic and you see when i have dynamic i can put boolean value i can put in string value i can remove all of this i can have 10 10.5 i can have anything i want so i can just name this some value and then 
use this some value over here this is going to be dynamic that means it can take any value it can take integer it can take string it can take boolean whatever you want and then run it and it will tell you that yeah it's 10.5 it's doing stuff correctly but it's generally not recommended to use dynamic by yourself there are certain cases where you cannot avoid dynamic but it's re recommended that you use values like int bool or string or whatever don't use dynamic because when you use int string or whatever you're basically telling the system that yeah this is this value and it is easier for the system to know that this is an integer value when you have dynamic you have dynamic value you don't have any clue what it is going to be so it can be a bit tough for example when you have int here and you put dot you get a lot of things that you can use all right so these are the things that i'm going to cover later on but for now you can just see that when i have integer here and if i do some value dot is even that will let me know if it is even or odd and as you can see it is prefixed with is if it is prefixed with is we can get a clue that this is going to be a boolean value so it's going to give me a boolean value and tell me if it is odd or not and then when i try to run it i get false here there we go and if i have is even it will give me true and there are lots and lots of things is finite is infinite is negative absolute like this the syntax is a bit different but i'll let you know as we move along why the syntax is like this why it's not like this etc etc of course you can use it but it wouldn't work so if i just try to run it like this you see we get something like this which doesn't even make sense to us we can just do this and run it and we get 10 abs here stands for absolute value of this so absolute value of 10 is indeed 10 and there are loads of other things now if i just convert this to a string and then put this inside of string as well and then i do string some value dot you see we get a whole bunch of new properties these are called properties i get is empty whether my string is empty or not you know is empty is not empty length what is the length of my string so if i just do this i get 2 over here okay because that's my length of the string if i add something like this it should increase and it definitely does then we have more things like compare to contains ends with index of last index of i'm going to explain all of this stuff later on when we dive into functions getters and all of that so it will make much more sense but for now my point to tell you all of this is whenever you used int or string it gives you capabilities like this but when you try to do dynamic and then you try to do some value dot you see you only get all of this hash code then runtime type so if i have runtime type and then i try to run it i get string over here so you see the difference at compile time the value is dynamic that means when we are writing in a code editor it knows that this is dynamic it can contain any value but at run time you know when the code has been executed or when the code is executing you get string because at run time it knows yeah this is a string now just to demonstrate one last problem with dynamic if i have some value plus 3 over here we know this is not possible because this is a string this is an integer and when we tried to do it earlier it didn't work and now if i try to do it it gives me an error over here it doesn't give me a compile time error it doesn't give me red lines over here if i use string like this it does but with dynamic it doesn't because at compile time the value is not known at run time the value is known and when it is known it says no this is error how can you even run this code that's why it's generally recommended to use the type as it is one last thing i want to tell you while we are on this is the variable naming convention this is not the convention to name a variable generally naming convention is used which is camel case so you have some and when you feel like it's a next word right some value is 
consisting of two words right sum and value so you want sum and value sh v should be bigger okay so this is a convention obviously you can go ahead and make the sum value but just for better readability it is recommended to use camel casing now you can take this put it over here and there we have it so if you don't trust me now you can see when i put sum value dot is empty is consisting of two words is and empty is not empty is consisting of three words is not empty so the first case is small second is capitalized and third is capitalized so except first everything is going to be capitalized that's how the naming convention is so now that you've understood all of this let's remove it and use integer here let's call this first value like this which is equal to 20 and i said in my definition of variable that variables are things that can store some value and when needed it can even change the value so if i want to change first value how can i do it well do i have to do int first value is equal to 30 like this no you cannot do this you see we get an error the name first value is already defined if you already have some value defined you cannot create a variable again but yeah you can create a variable like this first value like this and first value like this is different because dart is case sensitive even if you have double over here you cannot be naming them like this the variable name should not be same it can be like this but it's generally recommended to have a different name altogether if you're creating a new variable because it can create a lot of confusion as your program grows go, grows bigger for example if you have one variable that says first value is 20 and then you have another one which is similar to this but v is small then you have 22 then you have a third variable where let's say e is capitalized it can be a lot tougher to read and when you want to print something and do your operations you're like which one should I use? It can be confusing, right? So it's generally recommended to make your names as descriptive as possible and to be quite different from each other. But yeah, please don't name your variables like f, v, whatever. Just name it something that makes sense, right? First value 20. Now I want to change the value. I can just do first value is equal to 100. All right, now I have changed the variable. Now, if I just try to print stuff, so this is first value, then I'll print first value again. And we should be seeing two different values now. I have 20, then I should have 100. And we get that. So you create a variable, you print it, then you reassign it. And don't put it over here because that's like assigning a variable again. You're reassigning, so you don't have to pass that in. And then you have printed. Now, what if I want to increase the value? I don't want to set it to a definitive value. For example, if I change it to 25, I want 75 to increase. If I have 20, I want 75 to increase. All right. I don't want it to be 100 only. So I can just have first value equal to first value plus 75. And then we run it. And we get 20 and 95. So if I change the value to 25 here, I should be seeing 100 and that's exactly what I want. So this is how you can use operators to give value to a variable, right? You can even multiply, you can divide, whatever you want. So let's minus it for now and run it and you'll see the result. Now a shorthand syntax for this is just removing all of this and you can do minus equals 75. And then when you try to run it, you should be seeing the same result. Why does that happen? This is a shorthand syntax for what we just typed. This stands for first value is equal to first value minus 75. But yeah, if you want to do first value, which is equal to 75 minus first value, this wouldn't work. And you cannot do equal to minus 75 because that just means first value is minus 75 yeah if you try to run it you see we get 25 and minus 75 because it's like this so you're reassigning it to minus 75 but you can do this minus is equal to 75 and that will make sure that this happens 
and now if you do want to do plus you can do that if you want to do multiplication you can do that if you want to do divide you can do that so let's try to do this and there we go so this is how you can reassign variables and use operators to give new values to variable now let's remove all of this and get into strings so we have string first value which is equal to let's say hello what and let's make this variable name more descriptive this is a greeting and now if i try to print greeting i will be seeing hello world we now have that much confidence now i want to reassign it so i can just have greeting equal to hello world without a comma then i print greeting again and then when i try to run it we see hello world with a comma and hello world without a comma that's good now you can obviously add to greeting as well so you have greeting plus yo like this and then try to run it and you get hello world hello world yo but now where you you see an error we've seen before use interpolation to compose strings and values we get this error because this plus operator should generally be not used with strings what you should be using is string interpolation and how does string interpolation work well i can just remove all of this and we have this right so we have reassigned it to you but now here i'm going to pass in dollar curly bracket greeting and then when i try to run it we get the same output so with this we have added the va variable hello world over here like the value hello world is added using this syntax and you that means dollar and after that curly braces have a special meaning in strings so if you whenever you use dollar in a string it isn't just a normal dollar it carries a special meaning so you have to use dollar curly bracket greeting but even if you see now unnecessary braces in a string interpolation and that warning is quite descriptive when i have greeting like this i don't have to put curly bracket i can just do dollar greeting like this and the error goes away the warning goes away and now if i try to run it i'll get the same output now you might ask why did i put curly bracket earlier if i already knew that's not allowed because i wanted to show you when we have to use curly bracket curly bracket is to be used suppose when we have something like this all right so i want the length of this string so i want 12 yo to be present over here and that's when i will use curly bracket i cannot do something like this because this way it thinks dollar greeting is a variable all right so we'll have hello world then it will print out dot length and then it will print out yo so it considers dot length as a normal string dollar greeting as a variable and it isn't what i want i want 12 yo to be present because that's the length of hello world so that's why whenever you have something like this you put curly bracket over here and when you have curly bracket and when you run it you get 12 yo so in this case we don't get any warning but yeah if you have a single word you have to use it like this if you have something that adds up to it it will consider it a normal string you can see the highlighting also gives you some clues about it so you can just have like this and run it and there we go we get the nice output so this was string interpolation and a new way to concatenate strings now you might ask what if i just want a normal string with a dollar there so if i am having an e-commerce site and i have dollar 12 to be written how can i write that right i mean dollar is my currency well to avoid that you can just put a backslash and with a backslash it will consider dollar as a normal dollar sign it will lose its special importance and then when you try to run it you get dollar 12 perfect so just put a backslash to remove its importance now there are a few more cool things i want to show you so if we have hello world like this and i want to print world on a new line how can i do that if i do this will that work no you can see we are getting an error because all of this needs to be in a single line to make it multi line what we can do is put three things like this three single inverted commas and even here we are going to have three single inverted comma and now it knows that this is a multi line string 
and this is generally used for bigger values right i mean if you have like a very very long text you might want this so if you have three strings like this and then you can have multi line strings so you can do like this and run it and you get hello and hello world like this perfect but what if you don't want to do something like this you want everything to be in a single line but you want to go to a next line so for that we have special thing in dot so let's put it in a single line again if you just put it like this you know it will work as well but this is generally used for multi line comments or multi line string sorry so let's put it in a single inverted comma and here to make world go on a new line what i can do is slash n and then when i run it we get hello world on a new line but you might see hello is over written over here then there's a space and then world that's there because we have left a space over here if we remove the space and then do it we will get hello and world right below it and you see we get that so slash n basically stands for new line if we just put n over here it will just think it's a normal value but when you put slash it adds a special importance over here which says yeah leave a new line and then when you run it you get hello world like this great and one last thing that i want to show you is if you have a string written over here and if you try to later on change its value to 10 that's not allowed because dart's type system is very powerful what is this type system well just knowing that this value is a string so if this is a string it cannot be reassigned to an integer value a double value a boolean value anything if it's a string it needs to be a string you cannot change it later on and that is type system because those are data types right you can consider it like data type system but for short we just say type system and the type system is so strong that it knew yeah this is a string you cannot assign it to an integer why would you do so if you use dynamic and if you have a string over here you can reassign it to an integer and it will all be good all right so if you just try to do this run it it will work well for you you get hello world and 10 there's no runtime error there's no compile time error nothing at all because dynamic is basically saying give me whatever value you want i'll take both of them but yeah at runtime it knows both of its value so if you just have greeting dot runtime type first it should print out a string then it should print it out an integer and that's exactly what it did so i hope you understood dynamic and string integer etc now let's get rid of all of them and i'll show you a new way to create variables now you might ask what is this new way now let me tell it to you so another way of creating the variables is like this first you'll have to mention either var or final or const followed by the variable name equal to and then the value so this part right here is the same but instead of int string whatever data type we had we can just type in var final or const not all three of them either one of them and we'll get to know what's the difference between all these three but let's first type something out so we are going to have var some value is equal to 10 all right so it gets to know that one line is completed then you are going to have print some value and then we are going to run it and we see 10 over here now you might say this can't be the exact same thing as integer over here because you know we are using a different keyword here we are using var and it might be similar to dynamic because you haven't mentioned a type right but that's not the case if you go over here in the documentation you'll see int some value and if we just see the nice auto complete features that we get we get those things just like we have an integer because it has correctly identified that this is an integer now you might think this var only stands for integer you're fooling us by saying that is is for all types but no that's not the case if i convert it to string it will automatically get to know that this is a string why is that the case it's again because of dart's powerful type system you need to know that every variable must have a type 
So even if you put dynamic, the variable's type is dynamic. If you put a string, it is a, of the type string. If it, if you put int over here, it is of the type int. But if you put var, it correctly identifies the right hand side and gives the value of the right hand side to this variable. And again, if you go ahead and try to change it to let's say an integer, it will throw an error. This is not dynamic. This is of the type string and it's got to know that. So although every variable must have a type, the syntax for specifying types is optional whenever you use var, final or const. This happens because Dart's type system or the type inference system can automatically know the types of variables based on what you've written over here. Now let's put in final as well. So we have final some value which is equal to 10 and const some value which is equal to 10. All right, let's make all of them strings so that we know all of them are the same thing. But now you might see, obviously we get an error. The name some value is already defined. I told you all variables cannot have the same. So you need to go ahead. Let's place some value two, some value three over here and let's call this some value one. Okay. Yes, you can add numbers to your variables. Okay but you cannot add these numbers to the start of these variables. Keep that in mind, okay? So if you have one sum value, that wouldn't work. You need to call it sum value three or sum value one or sum value two. So now that we have this, let's print everything out. So we have sum value two, sum value three, and we print it. And we should be seeing 10, right? Because, well, it's all the same. And note that, yeah, everything here, sum value two is also string, sum value three is also string. So the type inference works for all these three things, but the difference comes in when we have to reassign the values. All right. So we've printed this. Now let's put some space over here. So we are just going to print, you know, kind of a divider. And then we are going to have print or let's reassign it first. So we'll have some value one, which is equal to 1001 now. Okay. Then we'll have some value two, which is equal to 10,001 and some value three, which is equal to 10,001 as well. Okay. Now let's try to print all of these values again. So I'm just going to copy them and paste it. But there we go. We get an error. Why is there the error? Well, let's see the final variable. Some value two can only be set once constant variables can't be assigned a value. So this is the difference between where, final or const, all right? Where basically stands for variable. That means the value can vary. Final stands for, this is like the final value, the ultimate value and const stands for constant value that this is constant. So obviously based on the context that we have here, based on these keywords, we get to know that these can't be reassigned. So once their value is set, they can't be changed, but variable can be changed. So this is the difference between variable final and const. So you can do this and then run it again. So the value will now print 10, 10, 10, then it will print out 10,001, 10, 10. And that's what happens over here. So hopefully you've understood this, but now you might ask if final and const both can't be reassigned. What's the difference between these two? Variable is understood. And by the way, I forgot to mention this, but this is what is called mutability and immutability. Mutability means that the value can be changed after it's set. And immutability means the value cannot be changed after it's set. So variable your where or var or whatever you call it is mutable. And these two things are immutable. So now that we have this, let's remove variable out of the scene and let's compare only final and const because you might be confused in that. Both of them look similar. Both, both of these values cannot be changed later on, but there has to be some purpose. That's why these two keywords were created separately. Otherwise it could just be final or it could just be const, right? So to understand this difference, what I'm going to do is completely remove the strings from here and give a value of date time dot now. Now you might not have seen this before. 
or if you're already familiar with dart and you're just watching to revise you might have seen this we generally use this more often in flutter apps because you want to get the current time or current date that's where it helps it gives you the exact time right now so th this using this thing you can get it but obviously you're not familiar with the syntax we'll understand more about this when we go into classes functions and all of those stuff but as of now you can just blindly copy that this thing just gives us the current date time all right so it's the correct date with the time but now if i set it to both of these things the constant one gives me an error but the final one doesn't give me a compile time error why is that the case that's because date time dot now retrieves the current date and time at run time so its value cannot be known until the program is executed and that's the difference between final and const final is a run time constant and const is a compile time constant now this might be confusing because there are a lot of words juggling around so let me clear it up so what i want you to do right now is just think about it logically date time dot now can it give me the variable value such that i know it before the code is executed that doesn't make sense right if i give it 10 like this over here it knows that the value is 10 at compile time but when i give date time dot now that is not really a constant 10 is a constant date time dot now cannot be because it gives me the current date and time and current date and time is always changing so it cannot be a constant it is a variable so the value is known only after we press run but in case of const const is a compile time constant and you're assigning it the value of a runtime variable that doesn't go hand in hand right that's why it gives you an error constant values can be 10 you know strings sort of these things but it cannot be runtime variables it can only be compile time constants so i hope that was clear now if you just try to change its value obviously it won't change so you'll have some value 2 is equal to date time dot now let's say again and if you see we get error the final variable can only be set once now if i try to run it and the output is 2023516 so this is the date when i'm recording this is the time if you want to match it here it is and obviously it goes into much more detail and if i again run it this part will your change right because time is not fixed that's why this is a runtime value not a compile time value so this was the new way i wanted to show you but obviously it's not like you can eliminate integer it's against the syntax you can pass final let's say date time over here we'll get into the syntax more but basically you can pass date time over here and you can pass string over here both of these things will work it's not like they won't work but if dart can automatically handle it for you why would you want to type it right i mean if dart is already doing all of this why should i do it so this is the convention that people generally follow now you might say if this is the case if i can use variable final constant all of those things why did you show us this string approach string some value is equal to thousand why did you show me this way isn't it adding more confusion well first of all i wanted to show you more about types i could i wanted to show you about reassigning the variables and i wanted to show you about type safety meaning you cannot assign string to an integer you cannot assign integer to a boolean etc but other reason for doing that was just having final const var doesn't really mean you can eliminate using these data types all the time there are certain cases when you can't avoid using them and you'll have to avoid using variable final or const let me show you some situations like that and that introduces us to a new concept which is nullable variables or optional variables so let's remove it from here let's put the heading optional variables over here now what are these optional variables optional variables basically say that your variables can have two values not at one time but it just says 
it can have either one value or other value so what are these values well first value is string or integer or boolean whatever you've mentioned like this and it can have a null variable or null value what is this null value well null value is basically null nothing it doesn't have any value so suppose you want don't want to give any value to a string when you initially set it but later on based on some condition or something you want to change the value that time null is used because if you just pass in an empty string that's not a solution because this is not null this is not like it doesn't have any value that's not the case here you're saying that it has a value of an empty string but when you use null you say that this doesn't have any value let's take an example of int if you have int sum which is equal to let's say 0 you're not saying that sum doesn't have any value sum has a value of 0 to not have any value you set it to null so when you pass in null which is a specially defined word it's a keyword you get an error over here a value of type null can't be assigned to a variable of type end now if you were using dot sdk 2.0.0 or below you would be able to use it because these optional variables these nullable variables were introduced in dot 2 but with dot 2 and above including you know dot 3 you have to do something else with int here after the int you have to mention this question mark to show that this is an optional variable that means it can have null values the same with string if you pass in stuff like this it will get to know that you can have null values assigned over here so we can have null we cannot use final for this so you cannot have final some value is equal to null like this because that's not allowed you see we get an error so you can just have some value 2 which is equal to null and you'll say this is fine right but that's the problem if i just hover over this and let's remove all of this so that i can see the documentation you see a variable is now dynamic i i said that dy using dynamic is the least preferred way you should always try to avoid dynamic and if i just type it null i lose everything related to types that dart has to offer so that's why I don't prefer using final sum value to is equal to null or variable sum final value is equal to null or constant which is equal to null. Okay. And that's why I prefer using these string with a question mark int with a question mark because if I come over here, let's remove this. If I have this over here, we have string question mark sum value. So I still get the nice features the string thing has to offer. So if I just try to print some value dot, I still have access to all of these things, but with final, I wouldn't have them. So I hope that was clear, but now let's see why we are getting this warning. We are getting this warning because it says redundant initialization to null. What does this even mean? Well, it basically means that you don't have to explicitly set it to null because even if you don't set anything over here, our variables automatically get to know that the value is null. So if I just print some value over here and then I run it, I get null. And then if I reassign it and I have some value equal to 354 hello world, then I print the sum value again we should be getting null 354 hello world right and that's what we get and again you can set this value to null again so you have some value is equal to null print it and then you have some value like this okay so dart basically has support for nullable variables or optional variables and this is called sound null safety now you might ask what is this null sound safety where's the safety coming from well that's because if I just try to find the length over here, because this is where I have the value. And then when I try to run it, so this works fine. But if I come over here and here I type dot length, it gives me an error. <laughs> Why is that the case? Well, the property length can't be unconditionally accessed because the receiver can be null. The error messages might be driving you crazy, but stay around. This is basically telling 
that the dart compiler knows that the value is null it knows because you are in this void main thing right here this thing is called functions we are going to take a look at that very very soon then you'll understand what i'm talking about and it will make sense but as of now just think that this this thing this function right here is giving dart the additional context and telling dart that this value is set to null and if the value is set to null dart knows about this null value so it's telling that you can't con unconditionally access the receiver because it can be null so to avoid this error what you need to do is put this which basically tells that this variable that you, we have is not null but that isn't the case right we have reassigned it to null and if we try to run it we don't get any compile time error but we will have a run time error we get null and 15 printed out that's correct but here we get uncaught type error cannot read properties of null so this thing i told you is a property and it's saying that it cannot read properties of a variable because you're telling that this is not a null but in fact it is null so it's your logical error so we cannot use this method what else can we use well we have another thing we can use question mark now and if we use question mark we are basically telling that if it is null then just print out null but if it is not null then use dot link and when you run this you get null 15 and null so if i just set it so to some value let's say hi you see we are getting this error the receiver can't be null so the null aware operator question mark is unnecessary it has got to know that this some value is not null anymore so you don't have to use this question mark just like you had over here you can just use dot link and then when you try to run it you get null 15 too now you might again have many questions about this why is this null operator there when dart compiler already knows that this is null it should do manage all of these things by itself right to make this example better what i can do is just shift this out of the main function all right so we have this thing right here and now you might see some changes when i shift the string variable outside of the main function we get an error here and this error is basically when what we had when we assigned it to null when this string some value variable was inside of this function why is that the case this is the case because these functions have the special ability to give context to the dart compiler this function was basically getting to know all the values some value could take and would know that yeah this is now null this is now null you cannot use this but now that is in the case because some value is declared outside so it doesn't know much about the context so it since it doesn't know it's throwing an error and this is why we have null aware operators now you have to manage everything on your own so now you'll have to do this by yourself you'll have some value dot length i can use this or i can use this both of these things are fine in this case because some value already has a value so if you try to run it we get null to null so that's fine you can also use question mark that would be no problem that would just make sure that if by chance you change this to null it is handled by its own so you have null 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 now but again if you're building your application you don't want to show null to the pro, uh, user right you're a programmer you know what null means but your user doesn't know null so if the value is null what i want to do is show zero all right so i can achieve this by just having question mark question mark which basically says if some value dot length is null then i want zero to be written i don't want null to be printed out and the same thing can be done here as well and then if i run it i get null so take the zero and the same thing over here some values va dot length value is actually null so put one over here and if i put hello world like this it should be printing out the length of this hello world right here 11 and that's exactly what it does if i put exclamation mark over here and that's not the case why do we get this way, uh, warning we get this warning because 
here you've mentioned that some value cannot be null all right and that is why you're able to access the length property on it but then you're saying that if some value dot length is null then take zero that's a bit of a confusion from your side right you're first saying this value is not null so give me the length but if it is null then give me zero so you can think of it in an english sense as well question mark is basically asking is this null is this null and exclamation mark is forcing dominance all right that yeah this is null and this thing right here is basically a short form for something known as a ternary operator we're going to look at this right away now that we've completed the entire variable section we can move ahead to control flow which includes if statement switch statements and there itself we are going to learn about ternary operator so let's get started first with if statements and this if statements doesn't contain just if statement it will be if else if and else so what are these if statements and why do i need them well let's consider we have an int age of 30 and i want to check if the user or the age is adult or not that means I want to check if the age is greater than or equal to 18, right? Only then is the user adult. How can I do that? With the help of if statements, you've already said it in English what you want to do. You want to check if. So the syntax for it is if, then you put parenthesis, then you have age is greater than or equal to 18. Now this is something new. But hang with me, then print adult, otherwise we are just going to print child. Okay, so let's try to run it and we see child written over here because the age is 13. If I put 21 here, I should be seeing adult and that's the case. Now what is this entire thing? Let me explain it to you. First, we've mentioned the variable name that we want to check. So we want to check if age is greater than or equal to 18. So this is the greater than operator. That means, you know, you've already learned it in math, I assume. Age is greater than 18 or age is equal to 18. That's what this greater than or equal to operator means. So if you just try to put in 18 over here and then run it, you should be seeing adult. But if you just remove this is equal to then you should be seeing child. All right. So we had the if condition here and we had to specify this using the curly bracket, exactly what we have in functions. And these brackets serve a special meaning over here, basically saying that if this is the case, then this code needs to run else you can run this code. So else and if are special keywords here, you don't have to mention else and again, mention a condition. However, if you want to check something else as well. See so here, you want to check for something else. Let's say else if this is where you have something else. So this is how you check something else. Okay. And here you'll have to mention the condition again. And here you basically want to check if age is greater than equal to 21. If that's the case, I want to print adult to one. Okay. And then when I try to run it, you should be expecting adult 21, right? But we only get adult. Why is that the case? Doesn't this else if work? That's not the case. Let me go through this code. We have age 18. Then we are checking if age is greater than or equal to 18. So if age is greater than or equal to 18, you print adult and then you ignore all of these conditions. You don't even check it because if condition passed. So you don't have to check the else and else if conditions. So to fix this issue, what we can do is just use age greater than or equal to 21 as a separate if condition. If we have that, we see adult and child both showing up at the same time because here age is greater than or equal to 18 and there's no else condition, which is fine. Then it moved to if condition and then it said if age is greater than or equal to 21, that's not the case. So I'll run to the else condition and in the else condition, I see print child. So I get child printed out here. 
but still my problem isn't fixed what i want to do is print out only one thing so that means i'll have to put all of this in one condition only so the condition will have to be modified like this if age is greater than equal to 21 then print adult 21 else and then i'm going to copy this else if age is greater than equal to 18 so we print adult else we print child now if i try to run it i should see adult that's true but if i put 21 over here and then i try to run it i see adult 21 what happened here was you said if age is greater than equal to 21 yeah age is greater than equal to 21 so you print adult 21 ignored all the else if else conditions and then it worked but if you put 12 over here what happens is age is greater than equal to 21 no that's not true it is false so you put else if over here age is greater than equal to 18 no that's not the case so we'll go to else block and well else obviously doesn't have any condition so you just print child and if i run it i should be seeing child over here and this else condition is totally you know optional even the else if condition now notice how i said this is false this is because if conditions over here need to give be given an expression of boolean you might remember boolean from our variables so we have boolean you need to put in boolean conditions over here because that's what if conditions are at its core it's either true or false if this is the thing then it's true or false if the user's age is above 21 then it's true otherwise it is false that's how if conditions work you need to pass in a boolean value over here so you might think what if i just go ahead and create a variable boolean is adult is equal to false then i use this is adult over here can i do that yeah for sure you can do that but it gives you errors or warnings because of the dead code it's dead code because our compiler already knows that the value is false then why are you having this if condition so obviously we'll just put it out of the main function so that our compiler doesn't have any knowledge about it and there we go so if other if is it adult is false now that means i should be going to these conditions now let's run it and see what we get and we get child why is adult is false so we will just shift it to else if then else if says age is greater than 18 it is actually 12 so no we cannot do this let's pass it to else and else will print the child so we get child over here so i hope this was interesting for you i just wanted to put that here now let's get rid of the variables and there are more things i want to show you in if statements you saw age could be compared using age is greater than equal to 18 there are more operators like this there's less than equal to 18 so that's the same thing you know greater than equal to the opposite of that will be less than 18 make sure to remove that is equal to if age is greater than equal to 18 it might contain 18 so the opposite of that shouldn't contain 18 so yeah if age is less than equal to 18 then i want to print something let's say haha otherwise we are going to have naha all right so let's try to run it and we get haha because age is less than equal to 18 because age is 18 other operators here are is equal to is equal to basically telling if age is 18 then do this now this is different from age is equal to 18 with age is equal to 18 you're basically telling that age is 18 and you cannot put expressions like this over here they need to be true or false when you put age is equal to 18 it's reassignment it's not a boolean thing even in the error it says conditions must have a static type of bool so this needs to be age is equal equal to 18 and because of that you should be printing haha and that's the case 
uh, opposite of this is is not equal to so if age is not equal to 18 then print ha ha otherwise na ha and we should be seeing na ha now so i hope you understood the difference between assignment and relational operators those are two different type of operators assignment is is equal to this is assignment and this is relational because it compares two things but this just assigns the value to the variable now what if i have another variable which is actually a boolean value which says boolean is allowed and that is equal to false and obviously we are just going to put it out of the function otherwise we will get the dead code warnings whatever i'm showing you is a fake value obviously this isn't happening in your real life applications i'm just putting it out of the function trying to simulate the bigger apps so is allowed basically tells me if i'm allowed or not so as of now it's saying false over here so i can just add a condition over here the condition will be if age is not 18 and if i'm not allowed then i want to print ha ha otherwise i want to print na ha so i'll have if age is not 18 and the user is not allowed then we will print ha ha so you can have two ampersand signs which basically suggest that this condition and this condition both should be true so that we can print ha ha so if i try to run it we get na ha and that's the case because age is not 18 that's false so it probably doesn't even look at this it just says age is not 18 so we will go to the else block but what if age is actually not 18 it is 20 then what will we get well age is not equal to 18 that's true and is allowed is not there and we have put exclamation mark over here what is this exclamation mark you might ask it's basically reversing the condition we are just saying that if is allowed is not true that means it is false so if we run it we get ha ha because both of these conditions are true now if you're confused about this part right here let me fix it for you this basically means is allowed is not equal to true that's what not is allowed means okay but if you put is allowed is equal equal to true and then try to run it you get na nah. because is allowed is false and you said that age should not be 18 and is allowed should be true then only we will print ha you can even follow this approach over here so if you have is allowed just reassigning it we will have not is equal to not is allowed that basically means whatever value is allowed has will be reversed so you can even do this but obviously you cannot do this over here you'll have to do all of that stuff in a function over here so we can just put it in a function if we try to run it we should be getting ha ha now because age is not 18 and is allowed is true thanks to this statement that we put in and that's exactly what i did this was a shorthand syntax we used a boolean variable over here if instead i just put age over here that won't work because age is an integer not a boolean not what an if condition wants what if condition wants is a boolean value so i can use a boolean value over here just like this but if i have an integer i'll have to put these relational operators or something other than the and operator we also have the or operator so you just have to put these two symbols and you can find that on your keyboard if you press shift and the button above your enter button when you use just a single one it's probably called a bit wise operator if i'm not wrong but with this this is called an or operator in and conditions both the conditions needed to be true in or condition either of the condition need to be true so if age is not 18 or is allowed is not there or is allowed is true then we will print ha ha so let me remove this that means the value is false that means this condition right here is false but age is not 18 that's true then what will we get we should be seeing ha ha and that's what happens and it's not restricted to only two conditions you can put as many as you want over here so you can put and and again put some condition 
and after the condition is done again you can put or or but obviously you'll have to nest them correctly according to your logic other thing that you can do is have a nested if condition so if age is not 18 if this part right here is true then you can have if condition again which says if is allowed is there if is allowed is there then you can print lol all else you can print haha and then we can run it and we will be seeing haha because age is not 18 that's true but is allowed is false so we come over here and we print haha and one last thing i would like to answer which i started this session with what is the purpose of these brackets these curly brackets that we see in if conditions in functions well that's because of something known as scope all of these if conditions and all have some scope within them by scope what do i mean well if i have a variable described inside of the if condition let's say string for some value which is equal to hey and then i have print some value yeah this works but if i just take this print some value and put it over here it doesn't recognize this variable it says undefined name some value because this variable is not defined this variable is only accessible behind these two curly brackets not even inside of this else condition so to use this value you'll have to define it outside of the if condition so that you can use it everywhere so you'll have to define it in the function scope not inside of this if condition that's what the bracket signifies it's not just integer you can compare you can also compare string so we will have string some value which is equal to hi then we will have some value is not equal to but obviously you cannot compare integer because it throws so throws a warning neither type of the operands of is equal to is a subtype of the other this basically means some value is a string 18 is an integer you cannot compare both of them they are way different from each other so here you can have if some value is not equal to high then we are going to print wow otherwise we will print nah just the standard one and we get wow over here because it's not high it's high and then when we run it we get nah over here that's cool so you can have is not equal to working with strings as well other things that we can do over here is by using if some value dot is empty that means if some value is equal equal to this this is what is empty stands for so if we run this we get na and if we have dot is empty and then when we run it we should be getting na as well because that's the same thing and then if we use if is not empty which is the opposite of is empty there are other values that you can use here so some value dot starts with so you need to mention like what does it start with so if it starts with h then you can have that or you can have dot ends with and then you can see if it ends with quest uh, exclamation mark so this was about if condition ternary operator this is basically like if statements but instead of if statements being so big you can just write it in a single sentence what do i mean by that let's say we have string value which is equal to well i just want this thing to be here so what i'll do is some value dot starts with h all right so if some value dot starts with h then we'll put a question mark here which basically says if it starts with h if the condition is true what do i want to return well i just want to say that then the value is wow otherwise so for otherwise you put colon and then you have nah and then you can go ahead and print the value so then if we run it you get wow 
which is this wow right here and wow again so what have we done here well we have put the boolean condition now if i just stopped at this this wouldn't be a string value it would actually be a boolean value right starts with returns a boolean and that's why we could use it in the if condition but i don't want to store string a uh, boolean sorry i want to store string so to store a string i put a condition over here and the condition is started by a question mark so you say does this start with h if that's the case if the condition is true then i want wow to be the value of string otherwise i want naha to be the value of this string and then after we have assigned the value we just print out the value now variables are just a way to store data you can just eliminate the this variable copy this print it and that would work exactly the same way and in starts with you don't have to type in just the initial characters you can pass in much more so if it starts with ha then you can run it and we should be seeing naha now and that's exactly what we get so this was ternary the third type of control flow is switch statement this is the syntax for switch we have switch then you pass need to pass in a variable whose value needs to be checked so we'll pass in some value then we are going to have a curly bracket which specifies the scope again then we have a keyword called case and in the case you type in the value so some value will be hi if that's the case i want to print so i'll have hello and that's it let's try to run it so if i run it i should be seeing wow wow but the third one is not printing and the reason for that is some value is high with an exclamation mark and here the case is not there of click exclamation mark so i can put it over here and then run it so we have wow wow and then hello what is this weird kind of syntax well we are just passing in the switch with the value that needs to be checked and these are the values that you know some value can have so the first case is high with an exclamation mark and if some value is equal to high with an exclamation mark you print hello since this was the case you got hello so to handle the else condition what you can have is default if this is the case or something else is the case okay so you have case high with an exclamation two exclamation marks over here or if you have a third case which says high with three exclamation mark but none of the values are matched by some value then we will have print yo okay so let's try to run it and we get wow wow and yo so i hope you understood some value is basically matching with the cases over here if you're from other programming languages you're familiar with this but what you're not familiar with is you don't need to put break over here so if you're from java or something you know that after every case condition you need to put a break over here that's a rule in java but you don't have to do that in dart especially after dart 3 the break thing was removed from here you only have to write this break if you know this thing right here is empty so if this is empty and you don't want to execute anything you put break over here so break is required when the case is empty over here but if it is not empty then you don't need to put break what i mean by this is if i remove this high let's remove this high let's remove this high and actually let's put our first case matching as the value of some value and now if you try to run it you get wow wow which is wow wow and yo which is the default one why did the default one run when the first case matched because we didn't put break what if i put print over here i say hi i can just run it so we have wow wow and hi but that's quite strange right i mean the first case matched my value but i'm getting the print statement of my third case which doesn't even match my value that's why i said when you have empty cases you need to put break so if you have break and then when you run it you will not see hi yo anymore 
you only get wow wow from the two conditions up here there is some limitations with switch for example just like we had int age is equal to 18 then i could check if age is greater than equal to 18 i cannot do that with switch so switch statement is basically there so that i can check for equality however there are more things you can do in switch statements now after the release of dart 3.0.0 switch statements were enhanced more like they were upgraded so what now i can do is int age is equal to 20 okay suppose age is equal to 18 and then i want to if the case is high then i want to print yep and here we can see yep will work what i want to do here is not just check if the case is high i also want to check if age is greater than 20 so to do that i can do something over here what i can do is add when over here so here i can just add relational operators or relational things just like we had in if statements so i can just add when age is greater than or equal to 20 that means some values case should be high and if that's the case then we will check if age is greater than equal to 20 and if both of these things are true then we will print yep so if i try to run it i get yep written over here but what if i just reverse the condition age is less than 20 i get yo because that's the default one since it did not match this condition it executed this default part obviously it also ran through these two things but they weren't matching it was matching with this one so this was a new thing that was introduced in switches in dart 3.0.0 which you can do so this was all about if conditions ternary operators and switch statements so here's a challenge or exercise for you you need to develop a program to calculate the shipping cost based on the destination zone and the weight of the package and these two things are provided to you usually they, these two things are provided by the user input but since we cannot do that in dart pad let's assume these two things to be a certain value all right and based on this you need to calculate the shipping cost so if the destination zone is xyz the shipping cost is dollar 5 per kilogram if the destination zone is abc the shipping cost is dollar 7 per kilogram and if the destination zone is pqr then the shipping cost is dollar 10 per kilogram and if the destination zone is neither of these three things then you need to display an error message saying the destination zone is incorrect so what are the given things to you well the destination zone and the weight of the package so let's say we have two variables destination zone let's say the destination zone is pqr and you're also provided the weight of the package and weight of the package can be let's say double because weight can be in decimals so we have double weight in kgs equal to let's say 6 all right so we have a package that is 6 kilograms so now you need to follow these conditions and print the stuff out pause the video and try to do it on your own if you are able to do it then you've successfully mastered if conditions and you know how to go about it congratulations if you are able to complete it now let's code along so what do i have to do let's understand the question first i need to check if the destination zone is xyz or abc or pqr so that means i can either use a switch condition or an if condition so i can just go ahead with if if i'm unsure about anything then i can just take if destination zone is equal equal to pqr yeah if that's the case then what will the shipping cost be it is 10 dollars per kilogram and i have 6 kgs of parcel so that means i'll have to multiply 6 with 10 so that just means i'll do print weight in kgs into 10 right and then maybe i want to type something else so what i can do is you know string interpolation so i'll just have dollar weight in kgs into 10 like this also a string over here then i'll have shipping cost as weight in kgs into 10 right now i'll just put in my else if condition 
and now if destination zone is equal to let's say xyz so we just put xyz over here then we are going to go ahead and print shipping cost weight in kgs into 5 because we have 5 dollar per kilogram here and finally we have another one not finally we have another one which is destination zone is equal equal to abc and if that's the case then i want to print shipping cost weight in kgs into 7 and if it's none of them then i just want to go ahead and print else invalid destination zone all right so i think we are done with the program it was a very small program but it solidifies the concept of if conditions now we can run it and if we see we get shipping cost as 60 6 into 10 because it's pqr what if i change this to abc and this to 4.5 and then i run it i get 31.5 because 4.5 into 7 and if it's some invalid destination zone like nyc and then when i run it invalid destination zone great now we can write this exact same thing in switch as well because we are using equality so we can just have switch destination zone then i will just go ahead and put in some cases so i will have case pqr then i can print this exact thing then i can have another case xyz then print this same thing here and finally the last case which is abc so we'll copy this paste it over here and print this and we are forgetting the default one so let's put that in and there we go now we can comment this thing out just because you know i just want to ignore it temporarily and if we see we have invalid destination zone correct and if i put abc we should be seeing 31.5 again great now there are a few changes we can still make in the switch and the if conditions and what is that if you see we have shipping cost written over here three times and if i want to change the shipping cost written over here in my ui let's say i want to call this billing cost so i'll have to go ahead and change it everywhere now this is not very acceptable to me you know i have to put in extra efforts to, to so to resolve this what i can do is just have double cost which is equal to let's say zero initially then I can take this cost and put it over here. So I'll have cost is equal to weight in kgs into 10. Then I can copy this, put it over here as well. So I'll have kg, weight in kgs into 5. Then I'll put cost is equal to weight in kgs into 7. Now I can just copy this print function and remove everything else. Then I'll have statement printed out over here. So I'll have billing cost, weight in kgs into 7, not that. We'll just print out cost, right? Because that's what we have assigned over here. And whenever I want to change the UI, I can just go ahead and change it in one place. And it will affect everywhere. So if I run this, I'll see billing cost now. This was a slight improvement, but you know, I just don't have to go through every if condition there. I can just change it in one place and that works well. But now the problem comes in when we have an invalid destination zone. If we have PQRA, I will get invalid destination zone and shipping cost both. Why? Because it matched through all of these cases, then went to else condition and in the else, it printed out invalid destination zone. So it printed out this and it also print out the shipping cost, which is a normal statement. So what I need to do is make a way so that after this else condition gets executed, this print statement doesn't get executed and nothing else after it gets executed. So for that, I'll just have return over here. This is a keyword that we'll learn more about in the function section. But for now, you can just consider that when you return like this, you're returning well, nothing from this function. So it just says, hey, the function has terminated at this point. 
it has been completely executed and there's nothing to run forward so when we run it only this gets printed and nothing else after this will get printed and there we go so after this return this program ends over here and doesn't execute anything else so if you were able to do it on your own congratulations if not try to rectify your errors and build your logic this is a good time to do so now let's get done with it and dive into the concept of loops so what are these loops when when would i want to use loops well you would want to use loop in condition like this let's say you want to print something let's say hello world and you want to print it six times for some reason so you'll just type go ahead and print there six times and then run it so there we go we get hello world written six times now what if i want to write it 10 times i'm just going to copy this and write it four more times and then run it and there i go so we have 10 hello worlds written now what i want to do is just go ahead and index all of this so i have hello world 1 hello world 2 hello world 3 10 years later so i had to do a lot of tasks to get all of this running and as a programmer i'm always trying to reduce my task because i'm lazy so what i want to do here is introduce you to the concept of loops and the first type of loop which is for loop there are multiple types of loop so in this for loop what i need to do is write a for and then a curly bracket so just like we had in a function you know a uh, if condition as well we need to have first if so instead of if i have for after that parenthesis and then a block and you know why we have a bracket over here a curly bracket to signify that whatever comes in your needs to run that many times first you need to initialize so you need to create a variable and initialize over here after that you want to pass in a condition and after that you need to pass in some sort of increment or decrement for the variable you've created now all of this is quite abstract right so let me comment it out so to comment it what i just did was select all the code pressed command slash and there we go all of this code is now commented so i don't have to go through and you know just add multi line comment over here that can be erased by just you know selecting a bunch of code and doing command slash anyways now let's follow this pattern that we have so i'm going to have first initialization so i'm going to have for int i which is equal to 0 generally in your initialization part you have int i written so you've created a variable here now why did we have a variable so that we could put a condition and what is the condition well the condition is generally based on the variable that we've created so i'm going to put here a condition i is less than 10 so i'm starting i from 0 so over here you could have 1 but then you would want to make this condition i is less than equal to 10 why because i want it such that this hello world gets repeated 10 times so this is my condition and i just want to increment it so here i've created a variable now i'm using that variable over here i which will be less than equal to 10 since it starts from 1 i have to put less than equal to 10 so it will be 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 10 if i started from 0 and did till i is less than equal to 10 i would print it 11 times this loop will run only if this condition is true after the condition is false it will not run but it will just get out of this for loop now we can take this print and paste it over here and let's remove rest of the things and run this and here we get we get hello world 1 written 10 times why did this happen let's go through this again we have created a variable int i is equal to 1 then we have put a condition i is less than equal to 10 and then we have incremented it i plus plus basically stands for incrementing so i plus plus is basically equal to i equal to i plus 1 and i minus minus is equal to i is equal to i minus 1 this is what it stands for okay so here i've just done this this is a shorthand syntax you can also do stuff like i plus equals to 2 which basically means i you know i plus equals to 2 means i is equal to i plus 2 
so you can guess how many times this hello world one gets printed and it gets printed only five times because initially it starts from one and it matches the condition one is less than equal to 10 i plus equals to 2 so now the value of i is 3 hello world one gets printed then we have the value of i as 3 so it will neglect this condition so this is just the primary initialization part all right this will only run for the first time when the for loop begins to run after that it loses its value then we directly have i is less than equal to 10 so 3 is less than equal to 10 so that's true the condition is true so it prints it out again and then we have i plus equal to 2 which means 3 plus 2 5 then 5 is less than 10 5 plus 2 7 then 7 is less than 10 7 plus 2 9 and after that 9 is still less than 10 so it will have i plus equals to 2 which will be 11 but now 11 is not less than equal to 10 it is greater than 10 that's why it will not print this and then it will terminate this loop meaning it will get out of this loop and won't run this loop again so that's how we get hello world written 5 times So let's come back and print hello world 10 times. So now instead of showing one year, I'm just going to show i. And we already know how to do that. We've seen that using string interpolation. And there we go. We have all of this written. But generally, most of the for loops starts from 0 and they go till less than 10 i++ and then if we run it, we get hello world 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9. But how I want it is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 10 the way i had earlier so what i can do over here is have dollar i plus 1 written over here so whatever is the value of i i'll just increment it by 1 and display it over here then i'll run it and there we go we have hello world exactly the way we wanted it why does this i start from zero because most of the calculations or most of the things that we have in programming start from zero for example if you want to extract some part of a string you have a built in method for it so let me show it to you we have string hi which is equal to hello world and then if you want to get some part of this string let's say i just want to get hello from here what i can do is hi dot substring and substring basically asks you to enter a few things Here you have to enter the starting point and an ending point. If you just click over here in the documentation, you'll see string substring. You have to pass a starting value and an ending value, and this means you know in a square bracket, it means you have to optionally enter it. You'll get to know more when you learn about functions. But as of now, just understand what I'm saying. With this method, you need to mention a starting point. if i mention a starting point as 1 like a normal person would and you know i want it till here so i'll just say 1 2 3 4 5 so i'll just pass in 5 and then you know print it out so let me run it we get hello written 10 times obviously because we are in a for loop right but we get hello written instead of hello why is that the case that's the case because the numbering in strings or substring starts from zero just like anything else in programming as i said only length was an exception because length gave you the real length like a normal number it didn't start from zero it started from one but other things start from zero and that's why it's recommended to have i started from zero as well because if you're using hi dot substring in a for loop that's probably because you want to do i comma 5 or let's say 11 so we have hello world because i was 0 then i incremented that's why i was 1 so we have 1 to 11 so we have hello world low world low world o world world and so on if you used one year instead that would cause a problem it would just start from hello world right so i hope that was clear and this is why we start from zero way or generally not always but generally and here you can have any kind of assignment that you want you can even have multiplication division but make sure you don't do anything wrong because if you do something wrong like 
i minus minus over here that can cause big problems so if i run it hello world hello world 1 and we get uncaught error range error because initially it start from 0 so it print hello world exactly then hello world 1 but then its value became minus 1 and you cannot pass in minus 1 to a substring you know i'll just remove these things and then run it maybe it fixes the problem but you see after i run it there's nothing printed out in the console if you can see anything my computer is now frozen and you can see page unresponsive it is unresponsive because we got stuck in an infinite loop why did we get stuck in an infinite loop let me explain and then i'll exit the page and come back the reason for that is int i is equal to 0 i is less than 10 i minus minus so it ran the first time hello world 0 that's cool hello world 1 actually that's nice after that it became i is equal to minus 1 if it became minus 1 that means minus 1 is less than 10 after that it became minus 2 is less than 10 minus 3 is less than 10 so it's an infinite loop the condition is always true so it's going to print every single time causing our app to lag and you know my pc to crash so let me close the app i'll run this again and fix the condition over here so make sure you don't run into infinite loops like this great so suppose we have some value over here let's call it hello okay and then what i want to do is loop through every single character in this string and after i've loop through every character i just want to print it you know so to do that what i can do is for int i is equal to 0 just like the previous approach and then i is less than value dot length i know this value dot length will give me the length of the string and then i'll increment the value of the variable i cool i can do this because value dot length will give me a number here also we had a number don't wrote learn whatever i'm typing here just understand the fundamentals so obviously now i want to extract one character from it so to do it let's see if value has any method for it so i can just have character there's nothing like that so if we don't have any method for it what we can do is print it like this value then a square bracket and then you'll have i mentioned over here now if i run it let me just remove the previous for loop let's run it again and we have hello written over here we have hello written on every new line because print is getting called again and again we are getting h e l l o hello if i want just this l i can just have three written and i'll get l written five times and there we go so i hope you have a good understanding of for loop the foreign loop that i've written over here in the comment is basically another type of for loop that i wanted to discuss but the example can be a bit more tricky and for that we'll have to learn something known as iterables less then it will make much more sense to you using it with string is not very much intuitive as of now so we are going to cover this in the list section all right Now let's try to do something similar in another type of loop which is the while loop. Now while loop is similar to for loop but instead of having all of this what while loop has is while and here just a condition. So this is similar to the if part right? You have if then you pass in a condition and the block. With while you also have a condition but it will run as long as the condition is true. So let's get started. I'm just going to comment this out just so we have reference because we are going to rewrite this for loop in terms of the while loop. Now, coming to the while loop, we don't have to pass in any kind of, you know, initialization. We do have to put in condition, but no value assignment is also needed. What can we do then? So we have int i equal to 0. All right? So I've created this variable outside of the while loop. 
then i'll have i is less than value dot length so we have a condition written over here then i'll print value at i and then if i try to run it you can see our dot pad is again stuck because we have stuck in an infinite loop we'll have to exit the page we'll have to run this again and understand why this infinite loop happened in the first place so let's go over the code we have value written over here in i is equal to 0 while i is less than value dot length that means 0 is less than 5 we are printing value at i so that means i'm printing value at 0 then this is true again so i'm printing value at 0 this is true again value at 0 this is true again value at 0 now you're understanding why we are stuck in an infinite loop it's because we have not modified the variable we are using for the condition either the value dot length has to decrease or i has to increase so to increase i what we can do is just have i plus plus or i is equal to i plus 1 if we have that and then we run i hope things are neater and indeed they are now we get hello written over here so the initialization is done over here the condition is put over here and i is equal to i plus 1 is done over here but obviously this int i can be used anywhere in our code so example if i have this and i try to print i over here that's not possible because i scope over here is limited it's just limited within this thing right here but since i've created i is equal to 0 in this function not in the while loop because it's not allowed i can just print i over here and it's fine i can print i over here and that's fine there's a third type of loop and that is the do while loop so right now the problem with these loops or the benefit of this loop is it is entry control loop meaning if you want to enter this loop you have to pass the condition but what if i want to run the loop at least once and after that i will check the condition and based on the condition i'll write the code how does that work that's what you know entry control exit control loop means these two are entry control just think of it like security guards in your building all right they will let you enter only if you have a valid pass or something this is what for loop and while loop does if you have a valid condition met you can enter but with do while loop you don't have to have any conditions met you can do that after you've run it once so this is the syntax for it we have do so you can do whatever you want over here and while so this should run while this condition is true and our condition is i is less than value dot length let's comment this while let's comment this for loop and let's shift our i down so that we have a clear understanding of what's going on so we have i is equal to 0 do what do i want to do well i want to print value at i all right and i'll do that while i is less than value dot length and i'll put a semicolon here this is a syntax for it and then when we run it and we are again stuck in an infinite loop why is, why are we stuck in an infinite loop again we have not put any incrementing decrementing conditions over here so let's exit the page run it again so now you have an understanding you'll use i++ over here in the for loop but in while loop you'll have to do it over here in the do loop as well you'll have to do it over here let's say we incrementing it over here and we get hello printed out over here but you might say what's the difference right i mean that's fine but let's do something else what if i have i is less than i or while i is not equal to i this is just always a false condition because i will always equal i if that makes sense right so what we should be seeing here is h being printed out zero times you know it there should nothing be printed because the condition is false obviously so if we try to run it we get h printed out anyways well that's because do while is an exit control loop 
meaning the condition is checked only after the do loop has run so what's happened is the dart compiler saying do print value at i then increment the value of i and obviously then if you have while i is not equal to i while i is not equal to i i will always be equal to i because i is i right so it just prints out h one single time and then the condition is false it never runs again but if we do the same thing in for loop it will never run because it is an entry control loop so this was the big difference between do while loop and while loop for loop so i hope you're clear with this now there are a few more statements by few i mean two so there is two things that i want to show you break and continue let's say we have to ignore this e all right i just want h l l o to be printed or let's just ignore all three of them e l l so we have ho printed out all right so what can we do here well we'll have to do something in the for loop only because that's when we get the characters right so we know we have to do something over here but what do we have to do well we only need to check if i is equal equal to 1 because if i is 1 that means we are going to access value at 1 which is e remember that h is 0 e is 1 so if i is 1 or i is 2 or i is 3 then i don't want to print anything i just want to skip it that's where continue comes into play so let's just have it and then run it and also let's comment out while loop over here let's run it again we have ho printed out why did that work well what happened here was we put our if condition here and checked if i is 1 or i is 2 or i is 3 so in our first case none of these conditions matched that's why it printed out h then i was 1 so it checked i is 1 that means it needed to continue with continue you basically get out of this for loop and run the for loop again skipping the current condition so if i have to show you what happened over here well when i is equal to 1 came continue basically said a hey, let's rerun this entire thing from the for loop but with the incremented value we are going to skip rest of the things that are mentioned down below we are directly going to start from here again with the incremented condition so then i is equal to 2 came in and again this condition was met so we again ran continue that means we again skipped rest of the things down below and we again started from for loop but with i equal to 3 then we had i is equal to 3 condition also met so we again continue and then we started it over here then we had i is equal to 4 4 is less than 5 i is less than value dot length right 4 is less than 5 none of these conditions were met that's why print value at i was value at 4 and value at 4 gave us o and that's why we printed out o so we had h and o printed out so this is a case where continue might come into your play or might come for your rescue obviously you could con uh, you could tweak your conditions a little bit and without using continue you can make that happen it's a task for you actually if you're familiar with for loops and if conditions by now and you followed through this video i'm sure you'll be able to do it right now so give it a try and let me know in the comment section anyways i'm going to move ahead and talk to you about break what if instead of i have i is equal to 1 i is equal to 2 i is equal to 3 continue i have break written over here and then if i run it i get h printed out what's the matter with this well what happened here was i is equal to 0 none of these conditions were met so we had value at i which is value at 0 which is h then one came along i is equal to 1 condition was met break was called with break you exit out of the loop to the next code only so while continue took you from year to year and you know skipped rest of the things over here what break does was throw you out of the for loop so that you can execute next pieces of code it doesn't throw you out of this function all right many people get confused here it's not throwing you out of a function 
it is just throwing you out of the loop you used it in so it's throwing you out here and you might know this break right this break was the thing i talked about in switch cases as well in dart 3 switch break is not required for non empty conditions after you've mastered loops we're going to get into the fun stuff and the fun stuff starts with functions we've talked a lot about functions without even covering functions right now we're going to dive deep into it so let's get started so before creating a function let's understand what functions are and why do we even need functions well what functions are you can see it right over here they are blocks of code well just that they are just blocks of code that you know contain your code why do we need functions well it's easier to have functions than write your entire code in just one function so imagine me writing my entire program in just one function do you think that's good idea because there will be like hundreds of things i want to do doing all of them in a just one function which is the main function can be a lot of headache i'll have to write 10000s or 100000s line of code in just one function so it's better to have multiple functions so that they have their tasks ready for example i can have one function to figure out my name one function to calculate my age one function to you know identify my gender one function to display them etc etc so it's good to have multiple functions so that they can all do their task and if there are more engineers working on in your team you always want to segregate the tasks right you don't want everyone to just work on a single function that's why functions are very important and this is how functions look so we can deduce a type from here what is the type of the function or how do the functions look syntactically this is how they look so i'm going to put a multi line comment here and first thing that we have here is void so first thing we are going to have is a data type so this data type can be integer string boolean whatever data types we've learned till now it can be either of them then we have the function name so i'm just going to call this fn for function name then we have these parentheses and then we have the curly bracket this is a simple function definition all right so let's create another function we have void main let's create another one so we will create void now you might ask what is this void void is basically saying that this function does not return anything so it has a data type return data type and that is void but void basically means that yeah this function is not going to return anything it is different from null null means that you're returning a null all right void means that you're not even returning null you're not returning a string you're not returning a null you're not returning anything at all and i'm going to say print name and this is my function all right and here i can just have print rivan all right because that's my name now if i run this application nothing shows up in the console and rightly so because i told you the trigger point of this application is main and it will trigger only when this is void main so it first has to notice something known as void main if it notices that it's going to run our app and there's nothing inside our main function so what i basically want to do is take this function and call it over here so i can take this so i did something and it's giving me an error basically they're asking me to put a semicolon i can put the semicolon and then run it and as you can see nothing works why is that the case it should work right i mean that's how i can call the function not exactly because if you try to print this print name it gives you something known as closure print name this is basically giving you the address of print name it's not exactly calling print name it knows that yeah something known as print name exists and it doesn't know because we have not called the function to call a function this is what we do and we'll have to remove print from here and our errors will go away we needed to remove print from here because you can see this expression has a type of void so its value can't be used when print name is called like this it returns void so we are trying to print 
void and void is basically telling that it doesn't return anything so what exactly are we printing doesn't make sense right that's why we are going to remove this print from here and then run our app or run our program sorry and as you can see it prints rivan so this is the syntax for calling a function and this is how you declare a function now let's try to do something different now we know how to call the functions let's return string from here all right i'm not going to print it i'm just going to return a string now i've been saying that this returns nothing this returns string what do i mean by returning well it basically means that this function is going to well throw a value which is of the data type string that's what i'm trying to do so how can i return a string well it's very simple just call return which is a keyword in dart so you call return and then you pass in a string and there we go we have returned a string as simple as that and the same thing goes for integer if you want to return something you return 0 1 12 and same for double boolean whatever we have learned till now so let's return a string here let's return my name rivan r and then if i try to run it nothing in the console Well, that's because I've not printed anything. I've just returned a value. Returning a value doesn't mean I'm printing anything. Returning a value means whenever I call this function, I get access to the value returned from this function. I know it doesn't make sense to you right now, so stay with me. If you come over this, you see string print name. What I can do is just print print name like this because it's returning a string, you know, and I'm calling it. i can print this right and it will give me access to a string and that's exactly what we get as simple as that now we can return an integer let's return 12 run it and it will work there we go other things people usually do is whenever they get a value from it they store it in a variable how do you store it in a variable just like any other thing right if you are getting an integer what you can do is int let's say name it's not really a name but since we've named this function print name let's call it name but yeah please be descriptive i'm not descriptive here but you need to be and then you can set as equal to why did we do that and why does it work well that's because whenever we call print name it returns 12 to us so we're basically assigning it to 12 right but it's disguised in the form of function you can think of it this way now you cannot do string name is equal to print name because our function knows that it's going to return an integer if you return a dynamic from here it it is fine okay but again you will get run time error and i've obviously said it to you don't return dynamic and when i say this i mean this run time errors that we continuously get because of the type checking that is disabled in dart Also if you just do this this is also a valid syntax but this print name is basically dynamic print name you can see it over here you always want to return a data type for your functions make sure to do that all the time okay if you don't it's going to return dynamic and might cause problems because it disables type checking it's very important that's why i'm repeating it many times all right so we have integer or you can have final or you can have variable but you cannot have constant over here if you have constant it will give you an error because constant variables must be initialized with a constant value functions are not constant values so you can use final meaning the name variable is not going to change again or variable which means it can change again now that we've understood the basics of functions let's see what other things we have first thing i want to show you is from this function if i want to return two data types you might be thinking how to return two data types right can i return something like int comma string like this will it work not really this is not a valid syntax and you cannot do this so what can i do you might ask well dart 3 added the support for something known as records in other languages it is also known as tuple So you can use that. What you need to do is wrap this with a parenthesis. Then 
you need to have int comma let's say i want to return string and here we are again going to have 12 comma let's say divan so this is a valid syntax before dart 3 this was not allowed but with dart 3 this is enabled and i can do this and now if i run it's not going to print 12 anymore it's going to print 12 and divan so we are able to return two data types from a single function we can also return two or more data types so if you want boolean if you want string again you can do that but obviously make sure you match it okay since this is an integer you need to pass integer over here since this is a string you need to pass string since this is a boolean you have to pass boolean if you try to pass string over here and say let's say hi and then if you pass false it is not valid because of the error you can understand it from here int string string bool can't be returned from the function print name because it has a return data type of int string bool string so this needs to be reversed and there we go so i hope you understood now you might ask what if i want to get one value from it i just want to get rivan name value from it and other things i might figure out later on so to do that what you can do is name dot and you see here you get access to dollar 1 dollar 2 dollar 3 dollar 4 these things are known as getters we are going to take a look at that when we get into classes which is the next topic after functions so these getters are helping us now dollar 1 stands for the integer value which is the first thing string is the second boolean is the third string again is fourth so i want dollar 2 because i want rivan from here and then i can run it and we see we get rivan and yeah you are able to get the types over here so dollar 2 is giving us the string type okay our dollar 2 is knowing that this is a string let's confirm it and how do we confirm it you can just call dot run time type on it and then run it and you'll be able to see string over here not just run time type even the compile time type of dollar 2 is string you can trust me on that so this thing was called as records now another thing that goes hand in hand with records is patterns so instead of doing name dot dollar 2 what you can do is just destructure it right away so if you're from javascript this might feel seem familiar so you will have to match everything over here since the first thing that is being returned is integer i'm going to call it age then name then let's say is adult and finally greeting now i can take this name and you can see no longer i can call dollar 2 on it that's because it's no longer a record it's actually giving me a string value if i come over here you'll see there's string over here if we can just get rid of this error so to get rid of these errors let's quickly print all of these things out so we'll have print is adult and then print greeting then let's run it here you see rivan 12 falls high and here string name so it's correctly able to get the data type and it's correctly able to get the value which is cool so you've destructured all of this in one line this is how you can do it but obviously you need to match everything over here if you don't match it like this you see you're getting an error so you need to match it and carefully name your variables right over here because it can be confusing when you're returning more than 2 because you know it's kind of tricky but there's a neat solution to that we'll get to it after i've discussed more about functions all right so now let's get back to our normal function we'll get to records again but just after some time when we get basics of function clear we've known how to return values from here how to return certain data types we know how to return more than two values in a variable now you can also return string with a question mark so that it's nullable variables that are returned and then obviously you can return null okay but you have to return null or you don't have to do anything at all over here but yeah it throws a warning but it will compile okay but yeah it's definitely recommended to return null but don't do this okay if you just do return it will give you an error 
because when you have string question mark it is asking you to return a null or a string you cannot return nothing so that's how it's done another thing is if i try to print after return statement you'll see we get a warning over here saying dead code why is this a dead code if i just move this above let's copy this function and put it over here and run it you'll see we get hello and then null it's not saying dead code anymore why is that the case this is a case because return works in this manner you remember break and continue it's kind of similar to that but not exactly same return basically ends the function after returning a value all right and even if you have something like void and you cannot return anything you can just call return like this and it will work because you're not returning anything you're not returning a value you're not returning null you're not returning anything but you're basically telling that this function is over just end this function right away just terminate this function no more code has to be executed after this and if we have string question mark so nullable strings we can just have hi you can return string from here and it won't go to the next thing so that's what return does it doesn't let you execute things after it you have to do everything before it functions can do much more and they are quite customizable so what are the things functions can do well first of all if you want to give some parameter over here by parameter i mean if you're having some value in your main function all right so if you have your name over here okay suppose it was a user input and you accepted user input from the main function now you want to give this name to the print name so that it can print it out and printing it is basically let's say void okay that would make more sense you can obviously return the name that is over here but let's not take that route let's remove all of these things so it's just a void function meaning it won't return anything and it's calling print name but now what i want to do is print the name that i got in the main function in the print name so now i want to pass this name to this print name so to do that i can just pass it over here so i'll have string name written over here this thing right here is arguments so this is argument of a function and now you're saying that yeah i'm ready to accept name whenever i call it and you yeah, we get an error the error is quite familiar we saw this in the start when we were just starting out and printing something right so when we had print like this you know i tried to print hello world like this if you remember we've come very far with it undefined name hello now you know what this means basically means that you don't have any variable hello defined you don't have any variable world defined too many positional arguments one expected but two found let's understand this error message now so let's remove this print function and to resolve this it's basically telling me just pass in some name here and it should be a string so i can just pass in rivan like this or i can pass ranavat or whatever okay so i just need to pass in a string and it can be an empty string as well but i cannot pass in null because this is not string nullable name it is just string name so i need to pass in name like this so i can pass in this name and well i just want to print this name that i got over here so i can just have name and then if i run it i should be seeing rivan r and that's exactly what i see now why did i have to mention string name over here well if you don't pass string over here it won't give you an error but just like in the function if you don't pass in the type of a function it will assume that it's dynamic here if you don't pass in anything it will assume that it's dynamic so i'm just going to have string over here and then i'll print the name now why did we have to give a variable name over here just so that i could use it in this function block as simple as that yes i cannot use it outside of this function block it's limited to the scope just like over here we had this name limited right i could use this name just over here i cannot use this name in this function that's not allowed but yeah one thing we can do is put this string name outside of this function and then i can remove this name from here because it doesn't re require any argument and it works 
but th- this thing right here is called as a global variable and many people don't like global variables if we put this thing right over here it's called a local variable meaning function can access it right N- only one function where it's defined can access it it's local it's not anything global you can consider it like your government all right you'll have local governments you'll have your nationwide government if i put string name is equal to rivan r this is kind of like a global government or your national government and this is like your local government many people are not in for of this you might ask why just you know imagine it in the form of a bigger code base this is very small so you might think yeah i know name is being changed over here over here but think of it like hundreds and thousands of functions and if you have a global variable like this which is accessible in any file in any function you can change it anywhere it is a lot of chaos because at some point you lose track of this variable name and then you'll ask yourself do i want to rename this variable by mistake you might rename this variable it might cause a big bug in your app and you won't be able to figure it out because the code base is so big so you cannot co- uh, you know blame it on code base you need to find an efficient solution for it and one of the efficient solution is you know just keeping this local variable i agree sometimes global variables are necessary they are important but most of the times people try to avoid it so coming back to this function we have string name like this now i can change the value over here all right and then print it but the value changed over here doesn't mean the value of this name is changed i hope that makes sense basically let me try to print name i'll show you the difference now you see i get rivan naman rivan r well first i've defined a variable name then i've print name which is this function and then passed in a name and i've accepted the name from here now i'm setting this name that i got from the parameter here to rivan naman and then printing the name again so then i'm able to print name which is rivan naman the currently changed value and then i'm printing name which is this thing right here you're not taking this name passing it over here and then changing the name that was mentioned over here you are just changing the name present over here you can edit it but it doesn't affect this original variable right here so i hope this was clear this was a very important property many people don't know about in dart so let's remove it and let's remove this thing as well cool now that we have understood this you know i just wanted to tell that you can have multiple arguments here just like we have in records you can have more than one you can have 0 1 2 3 in records you need to have at least two that's why you're returning a record right if you wanted to return a single value why would you use a record you could just go ahead and return a string but with function you can have 0 you can have 1 you can have two and as many as you want but what if you know i have more than three more than two it can be a bit difficult right i need to constantly match it like print name this is int 8 so i need to pass in 12 now this is greeting so i need to properly make sure that i pass in hello and i can get confused in this especially when i have two strings over here if i have two string i can mess up name and hello and it won't even complain right so if i just have name hello switched over here it doesn't complain because the conditions are being met you have, you want a string over here we got a string you want an end you got an end we got a string you got a string perfect so it works but it doesn't know we have messed up things and again this results in a bug in our program so to fix it there's a good thing created in dart which is named arguments this thing right here was called as positional arguments whenever we did print hello world it said too many positional arguments one expected but two found basically print is a function as well so these are positional arguments and you gave it two instead of the one that it requires so i can remove this but again it gives an error because it thinks that this variable is not defined actually i just want to pass in a string what i need to do is convert this positional argument 
Why is it called positional? Because it depends on the position, right? I need to match everything carefully. But now I can do something known as named arguments. With named arguments, I'll pass in the name and according to that, I can pass in the value. That's safer. Why do I, what do I mean by that? Let's say, you know, I put the console over here, just shift it a little bit. Now I'm just going to remove everything from here just so that we have a fresh start. Then I'm going to put a curly bracket over here. Now this might be a bit of a syntax change for you because you've always seen these curly brackets be used over here in a function, but we're using it over here. And this is the syntax for required arguments. What we need to do over here is pass in, you know, string name, int age, string greeting, just like we had before. All right. These are just positional arguments with curly bracket around it, but you get an error. It's telling you that the parameter name can't have a value of null because of its type, but the implicit default value is null. Try adding either an explicit non null default value or the required modifier. By this, it's basically telling that, you know, you've told that you want these named arguments, but you've not told that are they necessary or not? Can the user not pass them and it's fine or not? We need to mention that. So to mention that we have the required argument. So you need to pass in required. In earlier Dart versions, you had to pass in at the rate required, but that's not required anymore. Nice pun there. So you see the error got fixed over here. What this required is telling that this name thing is compulsory. If you don't enter it, it will be a problem. So please enter it. The same thing with age. If I pass required over here, it says pass in the age. It's required. And the same thing for greeting. Now, if I do this much, all the errors go away. Now the errors are there over here. So to fix them, let's get rid of them. So you pass in name like this, age like this, and greeting like this. And you see the errors got resolved. Why does this work? Well, it works because we've converted this to a named argument. By named argument, I mean, I meant this. You see, before passing in anything, I don't have to match positions. I just need to pass match the names that are mentioned over here. And this is quite easy, right? Um, I, I don't constantly have to make sure that this is greeting. So this has to match. This isn't. This has to match. This is name. This has to match. No. I can just pass an age over here, pass in 12. I'm good. I'm greeting. I can pass hello like this name. I can pass name like this and yeah, this works. Now, if I try to run it, let's come over here and you see, we get Rivan R printed out correctly. So this is the thing about named arguments. You don't have to match the positions anymore. You just have to match the name that's written right over here. There is just a less scope of error. You know, you've minimized the errors. Now, if you have more than, you know, two or three arguments, I would recommend you to use named arguments. Otherwise, positional is fine. It will work. Now, what if you don't want all of these fields to be required, right? I just force them to be required. But what if they're not required? For example, this age, if the user doesn't pass age, I don't care. How can I make sure that happens? If I just do this, it gives me an error. So to avoid that, what you can do is make this integer nullable value. All right. So even if the user doesn't enter a value, it will be fine. It will work. And if the user enters, then it's fine. User can enter integer value or a nullable value. Both are fine. So if I just remove this, you see, the function doesn't give any error because it assumes that age is not passed. Age is null. I also want to print out age and then run it and I get null over here. And if I pass age like this, it will work. It will print out 40. So this was about, you know, named arguments and positional arguments. I hope you got a difference between them. Now we can get rid of this age entirely. Now, what I want to show you is how you can use positional and name arguments both together in this function argument or function parameter, whatever you want to call it. 
just to get the names right this thing right here is called arguments and whatever we enter here is called parameters now coming back to positional plus named what you can do is just have string not string i think it was int age so let's have int age like this and there we go you see <laughs> that's a magic you can have positional as well as named arguments together now if i mention some other thing boolean is adult it gives an error this error is there because you cannot have anything after required arguments all right you need to have them before the required arguments so you can have boolean is adult over here and it won't complain but yeah it gives an error here because you need to pass in positional arguments so you need to pass in 12 like this you don't have to pass in age 12 like this it will throw an error what you want to do is 12 like this false like this and rest everything is fine now if i run it there we go we have 12s now that you've understood this let's remove all of these arguments and just going to remove this as well now let's remove this let's call this function let's say print stuff now it's not print name anymore and here we are coming back to records i want to return a record we know how to return a record int string then we are going to have return 12 comma revan and here i'm just going to have final or variable whatever you want to call it or you can also have something like int comma string stuff equal to print stuff so you can do this as well this works or you can just have you know final like this and then get age and name and then you know print the stuff out age print name and then run it so yeah this works but again just similar to the positional arguments this can be a scope of error and i told you i'll come back to this because of this particular reason you know i'll have to match this again and again so it's quite cumbersome error prone so there's a solution to this as well just like we had for named arguments we can have named records like this or named values like this but here it gives an error do i have to pass in required now no <laughs> if you're passing in a record you're returning a record it has to be required that's why you're returning it right and if it's not then you can just have int question mark which means nullable so you're returning a null value but i'm not doing anything of that sort it's giving me an error because i have to name the variables so i'm just going to pass int age string name then i'm going to return age 12 name revan like this and that resolves the error but here you can see it gives me an error it gives me an error because it's giving me some stuff and here by the stuff i want to do dot but now it doesn't give me dollar 1 dollar 2 dollar 3 anymore since this is named it's giving me stuff dot age stuff dot name so i don't have to wonder oh dollar 1 is this dollar 2 is this i can just use stuff dot name stuff dot age and my you know solution becomes much more easier to read let's get into the interesting stuff we have learned almost everything we need to know about functions and things that are generally used but there's more what if i tell you that you can return a function from a function so to return a function so you can just have function and you see we are getting an error we are getting an error because we are returning a string in fact we should be returning a function and then i just print out the stuff here okay So let's see how it turns out. Let's go over this code. We've got this, but let's go over the code. For this, we have final stuff is equal to print stuff. In print stuff, we are returning a function, and we are printing yo. So we have returned a function. Now, all I want to do is call this function. So I'll just do stuff because at the end of the day, I'm returning a function. If it's giving me a closure, then I've not called it. I need to call this function. So I'll run, and I get yo. that's cool then i get null and then i get closure main closure why do i get closure main closure closure main closure we get is because we have still not called this function right here to call this anonymous function 
we need to do this we need to call this as well right you can just consider it like a variable like this stuff variable is this exact thing right and to call it we have passed in two para parentheses i'm able to run it and i get yo null yo null that's great now if you're wondering why we get this null thing right here we can just remove print from here let's just call stuff let's just call this anonymous function as it is let's remove the surrounding prints from them run it and we get yo yo so the null are gone by this we have shortened it we don't have to pass in you know curly brackets like this you can just have is equal to followed by a, a greater than operator which creates a fat arrow and this is called a fat arrow function or simply an arrow function arrow functions are used when you have just one statement to be executed or to be returned if you want you can also print over here so you'll have hi but then you'll have to change this to void because you're not returning a string you're having void and we can do this because print essentially returns void you can see this print is a type of void you know it has a return data type of void that's why that's why we can return it like this and it will execute the code so now we are done with functions now we are going to dive into classes where we are going to use functions variables if conditions for loops and everything will come together in this class so let's get started with classes now what exactly is a class and how do we define it classes are like blueprints or templates for creating objects now you might ask what does that mean now let's take an analogy to understand it better let's imagine we are running a bakery all right so in a bakery we have a variety of baked goods such as cakes cookies bread etc each type of baked good has its own distinct characteristics and functionality right now classes are similar to these bakery items you use a class to create objects that share similar properties and behaviors for example you could have a class called cake that defines the properties and methods specific to cakes the properties of a cake class might include attributes such as flavor size frosting type the methods of the cake class might include actions like baking decorating and slicing using this class blueprint you can create multiple cake objects each cake object created from the class will have its own unique set of values for the properties for example a cake might have a chocolate flavor a medium size and let's say a vanilla frosting similarly you could have another class called cookie that defines the properties and methods specific to cookies the cookie class might have properties such as shape flavor size and methods or actions like baking cooling and packaging by defining different classes you can create multiple objects with their own specific attributes and behaviors each object belongs to its respective class just as each big good belongs to its specific category so classes are like the blueprints for creating objects similar to how different types of baked goods have their own unique characteristics and recipes so i hope that definition and that analogy was clear if it's not i'll give you an example in the code itself and you'll understand it better so i'm going to go ahead create a class that's how you create a class and i've done this outside of this function all right so to define a class we have class written then we need to give a name to the class and the naming convention for a class is different from that of a function of a variable name for a function or variable name we followed camel case right camel case looked like this in classes we use pascal casing meaning we are going to write it like this let me type it pascal case so everything here is big all right so yeah i'm just going to go ahead and create a class let's say cookie and then obviously we are going to have this curly bracket this curly bracket is specifying the scope of this class whatever we define in this class is going to be within this class it cannot be used outside in this main function i hope you're clear till there so yeah we have created a class now but what does our class do as i said cookie might have different properties now what are these properties we've actually learned about these properties before these properties are basically variables or methods 
methods are also known as functions all right so classes can contain variables so that they define different properties on a cookie then it might include functions so that we can change the behavior of the cookie or we can put in some actions like baking cooling packaging so how do we define a variable here exactly how you would do in a function so here you can have a variable let's call it string shape which is equal to let's say circle so this is a shape and this is also a property of this cookie class because this cookie class is known by this variable you know you can access the shape property and get a definition of how this cookie might be so if you do cookie dot shape you'll get access to you know that it's a circle now we can introduce more variables you can create as many as you like so we can go ahead and create let's say int or double if you want to be precise double size is equal to 15.2 let's say this is in centimeter all right you cannot put go go ahead and put centimeter like this so i've put a comment here saying that this is in centimeter or inches or whatever i would go ahead with centimeter and then let's say i just want these two variables now i want some function now what will my function do well it's just going to let you know about some actions in my cookie making procedure so it's just going to have void baking and then i'm going to create my function and this function in a class is known as a method so i can just name it like this you can call this function but to be more precise you call this a method when it's inside a class and now i can just go ahead and print baking has started all right now i can create another method as well and this method can be another function so it can be boolean let's say is cooling and then we have this and then we are just going to return false so the cooling process has not started yet obviously right now this is a false variable but later on we are going to modify this a little bit all right so now you have a clear view of what this class is this class contains a bunch of properties that are unique to this cookie class because if i create another thing you know if i just define all of these publicly in a main function there can be other things that use these values i don't want that i don't want you know a cake to have all of these properties because cake might have something else i wouldn't want something like a bread to have these things or what a cake has because all of them have different properties and different methods of creating them that's why we have created a class and have all properties inside of it now how do i use this cookie class for functions we could call the function like this if i had a function let's call main again you know if i have a function i can call it like this but how do i call the cookie class it's quite similar to how you would call a function all you need to do is cookie just the name exact name and then you go ahead and call it and there we go we have instantiated this is called instantiating so we have instantiated a class and then when i run it what should i expect should i expect baking should i expect a schooling value or should i expect all of these values well nothing really comes why is that the case well first of all we are not printing anything why should we get access to anything right so let's go ahead and print cookie now you might say yeah you're printing it over here so we are printing something not really these methods will only get called when you actually you know go ahead and type cookie dot baking or cookie dot is cooling let's run it and we get instance of cookie printed out what is this thing well this thing is basically saying that we have a variable or we have like an object of cookie created that's what it says and what do you mean by object you might ask well cookie object can differ as well right i mean a cookie can have a different shape it can have a different size that's why this is called an instance of cookie it is an object made on the same properties that a cookie has now you might ask how can i ac access all of these values i just want to print them out well to do that you can just do cookie dot so you need to call this okay if you don't do this you'll have cookie dot and you won't get any auto suggestion but if you have cookie like this 
So if you have instantiated or created a cookie instance, then you have access to this and then you can call dot. And then you see we have access to shape, size, something known as hash code. We know runtime type, baking, is cooling, two string, no such method. Let's call two string because we know what two string means. It will just convert it to a string, right? So let's run it. And we again get instance of cookie class. Basically, it's just saying that whatever you have in cookie class, I'm just going to convert that to a string. So whatever it gives me, I'm just going to convert that to a string. So it was basically returning, you know, let's say instance of cookie like this. And let's say the string wasn't there. So it just converted it to a string and returned it to us. But in the console, we see this as a string format only. There's no difference. Let's call cookie dot shape. If I do that and run, I see circle here. That's cool, right? Now I can just have size. And then when I run it, I get 15.2. Now you might say, I want to print out centimeter as well. How can I do it? Well, we already know how to do it. We'll convert this into a string format. We'll put braces over here, curly bracket, then dollar. This is string interpolation. I told you whenever we have more than one thing, you know, accessing the property over here or something, we have to put a curly bracket over here. So, and let's leave, leave a space between them. Otherwise it will be stuck together. As you can see, 15.2 centimeter. I'm just leaving a space here. So we have 15.2 centimeter like this. Now I can go ahead and remove all of this. And what I want to do is call cookie.baking. But I'm not going to do that in the print function because I'm smart. I know print is already called here. So why should I call print again? So I can just have cookie dot baking and then we run it and we have baking as started. We can also have cookie. Let's save it over here. Cookie dot is cooling. And then when I run it, should I be seeing false over here? Not exactly because you're not printing it. So we have to print it. And this is just like a normal function, all right? If we have called as cooling, it is going to return a Boolean value. So I'll have to store it in a Boolean value. Let's say is cooling or let's make it more descriptive is cookie cooling. And then I will print is cookie cooling. I've named it this way because there's a chance I'm going to create a cake class and use it here as well. If I'm having a cake class, I'll have two is cooling because baking a cake also requires cooling. I hope so at least. And then when I run it, I get false. All right. So my variable name is quite descriptive, something to learn from it. But now you might see that I'm using cookie with parentheses over here, cookie with parentheses over here. As a smart programmer, I do not want to create these classes instance again and again. So over here I'm creating one instance. Then again, I'm creating another instance. I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is just create one instance, which I will use again and again. And how can I do that? Well, I'm going to treat it like a variable. All right. So I'm going to store the instance of this cookie class in a variable. And then I'm going to use that instance every single place. So I'm just going to have cookie, cookie, which is equal to cookie. And then I can replace this cookie with dot baking cookie dot is cooling and then run it and we see the same output. But the difference is the cookie class is not being created again and again. Now, I don't want you to trust me on this. And by the way, this is the syntax for creating a variable, right? You mentioned the type of the variable. So now the type is now cookie. Earlier, we were using int double all of that, but I've introduced you to something new, which is cookie. So you can create your own class and mention it as a type over here, and then you can use it. Or you can just have final cookie equal to cookie and let dot do its job and it's able to create cookie over here. That's great. There will be no visible difference in the output. Now there's a few things more we can do actually. I'm just going to remove all of this. And now what I can do is, let's say I've created a cookie class, but I don't like how this shape is over here. I want it to be rectangle and I want to increase the size. How can I do that? Well, I'm just going to use this cookie class and uh, cookie instance. Let me make that correction. Cookie instance. All right. Or 
a cookie object this is what is known as an object and this thing right here is a class and as i said classes help us create blueprint of an object and using that object we can call properties or actions or methods on it so i hope the definition makes sense now now what i want to do is change the shape so i can have cookie dot shape which is equal to let's say rectangle i can do that and i can go ahead print cookie dot shape over here i can go ahead and print cookie dot shape over here let's run it and we should first see circle then rectangle and that's exactly what we see sweet now you might say hey this is a final variable right if this is a final variable how can i change the value of cookie dot shape the reason for that is this cookie object is final the cookie dot shape the shape property is not final right i've not defined it like final string shape or final double size if i do that i won't be able to change it over here but i've cha i've put final as cookie that means i can go ahead and change the shape and the size property on it so if you just go ahead and create cookie class again because cookie can only be given to cookie you can see the final variable cookie can only be set once so now that we have understood this i just want to take an ex this example and tweak it a little bit what if i do cookie dot shape like this then i go ahead and do cookie dot shape is equal to rectangle and then i have cookie dot shape i'm just going to remove this all right what do you think we will get let's run it and see we are only getting circle we should be getting circle and rectangle right we have changed this but that's because i've told it to you before the reason for that is we are creating cookie class or the instance of the cookie class here then i'm having dot shape so i'm creating a new object okay and then i'm calling the dot shape property on it that means this cookie class gets created all right and then we are accessing the shape property on it which is circle then here we are creating a brand new cookie object if you don't understand this let me draw it out let's say i have this thing right here and this is a cookie class i've created an instance of the cookie class and i've named it let's say cookie1 because i've not really put it in a variable but let's assume i've put it in a variable all right so this is final cookie1 is equal to cookie so i've created this over here so all the properties are being run again so that means the shape is created size is created all the functions are created over here then i've gone ahead and created another cookie class and this is a brand new cookie class because i've initialized this cookie class again and then you know when i create the cookie class i'm just going to have let's say cookie 2 over here so i've created size shape and all the other functions and methods on it then what i've done is cookie dot shape is equal to rectangle that means this shape thing i've just replace this value with another value so i can go ahead and remove this and now this is a rectangle all right so i'm just going to denote it by r and then i'm creating a third cookie class and here i again have to create size shape and then all of the actions like methods and all of that so we have done that and then i'm just printing it so these two are just being print but this value was changed but was never printed and that's because this cookie dot shape cannot be you know used again until we store this in a variable only if we store this cookie instance in a variable can we know that yeah we have changed the shape now we want to use this cookie to because that's what it is this is cookie to right so i just want to print out the shape of this cookie to since you have not stored this cookie to variable anywhere we cannot use it because every time we call this it creates a new object and rightly so why would it not create because i might have to edit out the shape i might have to edit out the size and i will have to create different things for it and that's why it's important to store instances of classes in variables and use them correctly also it's better to store them in a variable because sometimes as you can see we didn't want to create the cookie class again and again i just wanted to use the cook same cookie class but also in some cases you know class creation can take a lot of memory in your app not a lot of because it has to go ahead and create like these 
strings, these doubles, all of these methods, it has to newly create it. And that requires memory because all of these things, where do they get stored? They get stored in the memory of the program you're running. So when I'm running it, all of these things are getting stored in uh, the memory of the program. And I don't want to increase the memory, right? Do you like any app that is, you know, big in size? Not exactly, right? So we are trying to reduce that. But since this is an example of a program, we don't want to increase the size of the program. And it might also take more time than expected or more time than normal to create all of these classes instance again and again, because I'll have to create this first, then I'll have to create this again, then I'll have to create this again. So I have to create three objects that takes more time than creating just one object, right? That's why. So I hope you understood this concept of classes. Let me just go ahead and create the final cookie instance. So I'll have final cookie, which is equal to cookie. Great. Now to edit out some values, I have to do cookie dot shape, which is equal to, let's say a rectangle. And then I have to edit the size. I'll do cookie dot size is equal to 16.2. That's fine. Right. But the problem I have right now is whenever I have to create an instance of the cookie class and you know, if I want a rectangle, I'll have to continuously pass in. Yeah final cookie is equal to cookie, cookie dot shape is rectangle, cookie dot size is this much. Now I have a modified cookie with me. I don't want that. I just want to go ahead and give the values initially only. So to do that, we have something known as constructors. What are these constructors? These constructors are things that run when you create an instance of this cookie class, right? So as soon as I call this thing, these parentheses, the constructor of this class will run. And that's what I want to do. All right. So I'll just have cookie. The constructor is named after the class of the name itself. Then it has this parenthesis and these blocks. So it's kind of like function, but it's different from function in different ways. In terms of syntax. Yeah, it looks similar to a function, but here you don't have to mention any return data type because it's a constructor, right? Why would you want to return anything from here? Function names can be anything, but constructor names have to be after the name of the class. If you create cookie two over here, it will give me an error. You can see it thinks the variable cook name cookie two isn't a lower camel case identifier. It saves this because it's considering this as a function. So if we just, you know, get a chance to see this documentation, you'll see dynamic cookie two. It's thinking that this is a function. It's not a constructor, but actually we want a constructor. So it has to be right after the name of this class. And then we have a block similar to the function. So whatever variables we create, whatever the scope is, is limited over here. And what I want to do over here is basically ask for the values of the shape and size. So to do that, what I can do is just define string shape over here, double size over here. Then I can get rid of the, these things. And then I can have this dot shape, this dot size asked over here. And now you'll see we are done. And it's giving us this error because this function block is not necessary until you add something over here. So I'm going to add here print cookie class cookie constructor called. And now the error goes away. That means if I don't mention this block, it's fine. I can just have this and this is a constructor as well. But if I want to go ahead and print something as soon as, you know, cookie is called, or if I want to, you know, start baking as well. So I can just start baking like this. I can call the function right here. I don't have to go ahead and call cookie dot baking like this over here. What you can do is just call baking. Why? Because we are in this class. If you're in this class, you don't need to call cookie. You don't need to create an instance of the cookie class. You can just go ahead and use baking over here. You can just go ahead, call is cooling over here. You can just go ahead and use shape and size. You see, we get an error over here. Earlier, we didn't get that. And if you see the error, two positional arguments expected by cookie.new, but zero found. So there's quite to break down in this error message. Well, you already know what two positional arguments expected means. That means it requires two things to be passed in over here. And this error message is similar to what we get in functions. So basically it's asking us to give 
string shape and double size we can get that from the con context so that's fine but what is this cookie dot new basically whenever we create instance of the class it was recommended to use new cookie like this if you have learned java you already know that this new class or this new keyword helps us to create and allocate memory in java but that is not required in dart you can put in but it gives you a warning because that's not required anymore now we have the cookie instance created like this now i can go ahead and mention the size and shape so if i have 20 comma hello will that work not really because i've messed up the positional arguments what i want to do is go ahead and have hello 20 like this all right so the shape is hello <laughs> and size is 20 and then if i try to print cookie dot shape print cookie dot size and then run it you see we get a bunch of things that are called first cookie constructor was called why is that the case well we created an instance of the cookie class all right so this constructor was called when this constructor was called it verified that yeah the shape and size are given correctly then we have the curly bracket which was run so it printed out cookie constructor called so the first thing cookie constructor was called then it ran the baking function so baking has started was called then we add hello printed out which is cookie dot shape and cookie dot size hello 20 now you might be confused about this thing right here what is this this so let's go ahead and print this right if you're confused just print it out it should give you certain value right and you see we get instance of the cookie class so with this we get access to the class we are in it gives us access to this class and that's why it is called this so i can go ahead and call this dot baking as well now you might say why didn't i do this dot baking over here and i didn't do that because it would give me this unnecessary this qualifier if you're in the function why would you want to call this dot baking right when you can just call baking now a valid question would be why do we have to put this dot shape and this dot size over here why can i not do shape and size over here and when we try to do this you see non nullable instance field shape must be initialized since we have not given a value to these things it's telling us yeah at least give it some value and then pass it or have it in the constructor right and then when we run it we get cookie constructor call baking has started null null that doesn't seem to work does it well that's because it has gone ahead and created new shape and new size variables all right and since we have not put in any variable data type over here it is considering that this is dynamic so if i just do string shape and int size it will not throw me any error it works fine and then when i try to run it it still gives me null but the difference is now the shape has string shape and this size is int size basically when you have these two variables created like this these are dynamic they're not referring to this thing that you have over here it is automatically creating a new thing now you might say let's just discard all of them let's have string shape int size over here but then you'll see we get an error the getter shape isn't defined for the type cookie and the getter size isn't defined for the type cookie it's giving us these errors because these shape and size variables do not exist publicly constructor is similar to a function in a function you know if you put anything over here they are accessible only inside the block you are using it so i can use go ahead and you know print out shape over here and let's run it and it will print out hello to me you see i get hello over here but i cannot use the shape variable anywhere else so if i try to print shape over here i cannot do that because shape is not defined and that's why i had created so that's why i had created public variables over here so we could access shape and size property on it and then i did this dot shape meaning we are going to ask the shape from this thing right here when we instantiate the cookie class and whatever value we get we are just going to store it 
in the shape variable that we have in this cookie class. That's why this dot shape. So we are accessing the cookie class and its shape, this dot size. And these are nullable variables. So you can just go ahead and pass null over here and that is fine. But if you have string shape, you cannot pass in null over here. I want to take this opportunity and expand on the concept of constructors further. There are different types of constructor. This type of constructor is the normal type of constructor. You've already seen we can also have this done and it will work with the same thing. But if you want to run any function or anything, as soon as a cookie class is created, you obviously want to do this. Because you can't do this like, you know, just having baking over here. That's not allowed. You know, it just says the name baking is already defined. It's thinking you want to define a new function or a variable. So we cannot do this. So that's why it is said to have it in this curly bracket so that it knows, yeah, you need to run something, run it over here. Also, you can specify some value over here, let's say cookie. So you can have cookie over here, but obviously when hello gets, you know, returned over here, it will occupy the value of the shape. So to avoid this, what you can do is just create string shape again, then you'll have int size again, then we are going to create the constructor block. And over here, we are just going to set this dot shape is equal to shape, this dot size is equal to size. So this is what we had done earlier, but as you can see, we are getting warning saying, Try using an initial formal, initialing formal this dot size to initialize the field. So this is the big hand syntax for what we just did. You know, this dot shape is basically this dot shape is equal to shape. This dot size is equal to size. All right. But I want to introduce a new thing over here. I can just do print shape, not print shape, this dot shape. And then when I run it, we get an error and the error is there basically saying a value of type int can't be assigned to a variable variable of type double. So I need to take double away so that I can pass it in. That's nice. Now I can run it. And here I get cookie hello 20. So what just happened over here? Well, first we have string shape is equal to cookie. Then we have created two new variables. These variables are different from these variables that we have created. These are parameterized variables, all right? So here, what I've done is string shape and double size new variables. Then I've printed this dot shape. That means I've tried to print cookie over here. Then I've set this dot shape equal to shape. That means I've reinitialized both of these fields for which it is giving me a warning. But I had to do this because I wanted to print this dot shape. If I did this dot shape and this dot size, I wouldn't get access to cookie, right? I wanted to print out cookie and that's why I initialized it this way. So this is one of the use cases for having a constructor like this. Great. Now I can come back to my original thing. As you can see, I can reassign the properties. I can reassign it outside of the class as well. So if I have cookie dot shape, I can change it over here as well. Let's say rectangle. I can change it over here as well. What if I don't want to allow any changes at all? So after this was set, I want to restrict it from changing ever again. Why do I want to do that? Because I just want to keep all the fields of cookie in one place. So if I want to change the shape, I can do this from a method that I create over here. If I want to change the size, I can do it over here. If I want to change anything else, I'll have to do everything from the class itself, but I cannot change it outside of the class. That makes my class more secure, right? So to do that, we already know how can how we can do that. We can have final string like this, final double like this. And, you know, I'm just going to say, let's remove this because if I have this is equal to cookie, it will just question me that this was final. Then how come you're changing it? So I'm just going to go ahead and have this final string double, final double size. And then we are good to go. Now you might again question me if you're having final over here. We are having final over here. So we have created the variable. Why isn't giving, why this isn't giving us an error? Like, you know, null check operator should be used or like I should use optional variables over here. 
that's not the case because we have a constructor created if we don't have a constructor created it will definitely throw an error over here now if you try to do cookie dot shape is equal to rectangle we get an error the shape can't be used as a setup because it's fine since it's finer i cannot change its value now you might ask how can i change its value the thing is you cannot change and that's why we had created it like this whatever you pass in over here is going to be treated at this way only also one thing that i forgot to mention earlier you can go ahead and use these variables all right so we can just have your cookie of dollar shape shape so it's just saying your cookie of hello shape and 20 cm let me just reframe my english and if i run it obviously nothing happens so what i want to do is as soon as this thing is done i just want baking to start so we are just telling that yeah if you've given this order the baking has started and there we go we have your cookie which is of the shape hello and size 20 cm is baking now obviously just like we had in functions when we have too many variables to be taken it can be quite a problem so to do that a similar or the same thing is used we are just going to wrap all of this with a curly bracket and then it gives us an error basically saying that if these are optional just make them nullable variables but in our case they are not optional so what i'm going to do is required this dot shape required this dot size you can see the consistency over here right just like we had in functions we have in constructors we have in records as well and now this gives us an error over here the error is basically saying that you need to mention shape like this size like this and the error is resolved so we can run it and we have your cookie which is of the shape hello and size 20 cm is baking nice so these are called as named constructors the earlier one was known as parameterized constructor and when we don't have anything you know if we don't have a constructor at all so let's remove everything we have a default constructor created and also just to give you some terminology let's get our example back this thing right here even with parameterized constructors or named constructor this thing right here is something known as an immutable class why is this an immutable class well we've already talked about mutability and immutability right mutability is when you can change a variable's value immutability is when you can't change a variable's value and here we cannot change the value or properties inside the cookie class right we cannot change shape we cannot change size basically this is a const cookie class that means this is a constant we cannot change it once it is given the values or once it is given a set of the values so now that we have a clear understanding of basic terminology let's dive into some stuff that we missed out in classes these are the things that we want to study now private variables getters setters static function and static variables let's go over them one by one so the first thing is private variables what are these private variables so there are certain times in your classes when you don't want the variables over here to be visible outside of this class all right so you want them for some stuff inside the class for example for some calculation or something like that then what do we do well for that we have access to private variables let's say we have print cookie dot shape yeah just what we had before so i don't want to be able to access the shape property it is there inside the class but it should not be accessible outside what do i do in that case i can make shape private but there is some limitation in dot you cannot make variables private in class the private variables will be private within a file meaning you won't be able to use cookie dot shape or cookie dot height if i made it private outside of the file for example if i have int height which is equal to 0 this is a public variable right to make it private i'm just going to add underscore at the beginning so with this i've made it private unlike other languages dart doesn't have private keyword here it just has underscore over here so that it signifies that it's a private variable however if you have height underscore width let's say 
This is not a private variable. This is just one variable height width, which is public. But if you just put this at the beginning, then only is it private. Now, if I try to do cookie dot underscore height, I'll be able to access this. Why am I able to access this? Private variables shouldn't be accessible, right? Well, that's the problem. Or that's kind of like a feature in dot. Private variables are private for a file. They're not private for just a class. If you use in the same file, then cookie dot underscore height will be accessible. However, if this main function is defined in some other file and class cookie is defined in some other file, then cookie dot underscore height will not be accessible. It will give an error that cookie dot underscore height doesn't exist. So I cannot show it to you right now, but in Flutter, we are obviously going to take a look at it. So you can trust me on this one and make it clear that private variables are private to a file, not to a class. So now that we know how to make private variables, let's move ahead and understand why we would need private variables in the first place. So I need private variables so that I can calculate the size of the cookie, right? So I'll have int underscore width is equal to five. Let's say my height is six or let's say four. Then I have a function here or a method which I'm going to call void calculate size and then I'm just going to set size equal to underscore height into underscore width and that's not allowed right because size is a final variable so what I can do instead is just return an int and then return height underscore height into width that would be fine right because height is an integer when you multiply integer with an integer you will get an integer so calculate size will return 20 from here that's good now this is just for demo purposes you wouldn't want to do this in real life because well calculate size why would you need it if you already have a size over here but this is just for demonstration so these are private variables you can use it inside of methods to perform some calculations and stuff that remains inside your class you don't want it to be accessible outside of your class it's kind of like your society or building if you're living in a community, you want the community stock to remain inside the community stock. You don't want it uh, accessible like outside, right? That's what private variables do. So now that you've understood about private variables and these are public variables, let's get into getters and setters. What are these getters and setters? Getters and setters are basically used to return a value. Why would I want to return a value? Well, let's go over them. First of all, let's get syntax out of the way. To create a getter, we use data type. So you can pass in string, int, a class name if you want to. You can have any of that, then get, and then the name of the variable. Let's say height is my variable. Now I will just return it. So it's kind of like a function block. You can either have this or you can have a fat arrow function. And then you return height. All right. So this is a getter. With getter, what I have access to I can just do print cookie dot height. But then why don't we just make this a private variable? That's because the height value might change in this function. For example, I will have another method. Let's call it void modify height. Then I'll have a new height that I get and underscore height is equal to H. So I can change the value of the private variables inside but I don't want it to be modifiable outside. Meaning if I do cookie dot underscore height, I'm able to change the value. I don't want to be able to change the value from outside. I only want the value to be changeable or modifiable from inside. And that's why we have private variables over here. So if we have cookie dot height is equal to 10 like this, it will give us an error saying there isn't a setter named height in class cookie. That means I cannot modify a getter over here and that's why we have created a getter for a private variable meaning it is a read only value when there's just a getter it is only a read only value so you can just read from it not modify it however if you just remove this private variable and use and also remove this getter because you have this as a public variable you'll be able to change cookie dot height equal to 10 
and if you try to make it final you won't be able to modify the height over here i hope you are understanding something if not i would recommend you to watch this part of the video because i'm just going to brief through what just happened and if you understood just skip this part basically if we have public variable like int height is equal to 4 then we will be able to change it outside of the class and i don't want it to be changeable or modifiable outside of the class because it might create a lot of confusion in my code and that's why i will put in final here right because i want this to be immutable this solves the problem here but method over here is giving me a problem because this is a final if this is a final i cannot change it over here but i want it to be changeable over here and not modifiable over here how can i do that there is no keyword for that so i can just remove this int height i can make this a private variable i put underscore height is equal to h over here but then i won't be able to access cookie dot underscore height outside of the file so for that i've created a getter and the getter is basically saying int get height and then i put out underscore height and then i can just have cookie dot height the way i want it so i cannot modify it but i can print it so it's a read only value that i get super so this was about getters and private variables now there's setter as well which helps you to set a value so i don't have to create a method for this instead what i can do is set set height this is the convention basically if you have a getter with height over here you want to put set height in camel case then have a function like syntax and you'll get int h over here because you want to set the height and you'll set underscore height equal to h you can't do height is equal to h because this is a getter you cannot change the value of a getter so you'll have to do underscore height is equal to h and then getter will have the modifiable or the updated value of underscore height returned over here now i can just remove this method and i can just have cookie dot set height i'll pass in let's say 15 over here but now this gives me an error why is there an error because this is not the syntax for it this is a syntax for a function and you don't want to have a function over here you want to have a setter so for a setter you're just going to have cookie dot set height equal to the updated value which is 15 and the error gets resolved i'm going to go ahead and print cookie dot height again and then run it and you see i get 4 and 15 so the set height works i don't have to create a function anymore the getter is used with the setter but this is a syntax for a setter it's kind of similar to a function but you don't have a return data type and you can set the height using assignment so now that we have understood private variables getters and setters let's get rid of them all of those were kind of linked together but the static variable and static function are not related to each other now i've already told to you that creating an object can be memory consumption so as you can see over here every time we create an object we have to create something that looks like this in a diagram format you have to initialize all the fields you have to have all the functions with you it can be memory consuming we have already talked about it but what if i don't want to get the initialization part done all right So I don't want to create an instance of the class at all. So I don't want any of this. I don't want actually any of this. I just want cookie, so that I can access some properties on it. That will help me save. You can say memory in my program. So I want to be able to do that. So for that we have static function and static variables. These static functions and variables are used for certain tasks. For example, static variable is used when you have a constant. Let's say. so you have a class that contains all the constants so maybe let's get rid of this cookie class and i'm going to create a class called constants and this class serves one purpose give me all the constants related to my app so for example i would have a string that says greeting whenever the user comes into my app so i say hello how are you So I store it in a separate class. Why do I store it in a separate class? Because 
If I use it and scatter it throughout my application, it might be difficult for me when my client or my employer comes and tells to me that, hey, I want you to change this greeting. That means you'll have to go over certain files. Go ahead, change the text. What if all of that information, all of that hard-coded stuff is present in just one file? That makes it easy for you to organize your code and make the changes easily. And it's so easy that even your client can do it or your employer can do it. That's why we've created this class. All right. So I have greeting over here. Let's say I have another one that says bye, which says your yeah, bye. Well, that's all the constants I have till now. And what I'm going to do is first of all, let's create instance of the constants, which is constants like this. Then I'm going to print constants dot greeting constants dot by there we go so if i run this it will say hello how are you and bye great that's how it's expected to work but as you can see why do i have to create the instance of a class over here isn't that weird because i don't need access to any of the things that are mentioned over here like I don't want the constructor to be called. I don't want anything to be done right here. What I want to do is directly have constants.greeting, constants.by, so that I don't have to create an entire object for this. So can I do like constants.greeting? I've already told to you that this syntax is not allowed, so we cannot do that unless we have something known as static variable with us. So what we can do over here is call it static string greeting. And we get an error over here. This says the static greeting can't be accessed through an instance. Now we are wise enough to understand this error. This error is basically saying, hey, you've created an object. And now you're trying to get a static variable out of this object. But by static, you're telling that this should be accessible to me without creating an object. What do you mean? So what we can do over here is just have constants dot greeting. With this, I'm able to access this. And now if I run it, I'll get the same thing. But this time, constants constructor will not be called. Let's print it out over here. So we'll have constant print constructor called and then run it. We have constructor called because we have created an instance of the class. Then we have constants.greeting. So it's not calling the constructor again. So with static variables, the constructor doesn't get called. That means an object is not created. And that saves memory. And the same thing I want to do for by as well. So I'll have static string by. I'll put constants.by over here. Let's remove this initialization of class. Why did I remove the constructor? Let's put it back. Let's run this and we get hello. How are you? Bye. The constructor is not called at all. And this is what static does. I hope that was clear to you. This is what is static. Now let's get to static functions. These are static variables. Now static function also has a similar type. You have static. Then you define the function as it is. Yes. Static and let's say, give me some value then you're not having anything over here. You're just going to return 10. So now I can't do print constants dot give me some value. That's not allowed. What I need to do is constants dot give me some value. And then run it. And there we go. We get 10. Now you might say this static approach seems very nice. Shouldn't I use it all the time? No. Why? Because there are certain cases where you cannot. For example, when constructor is called. When constructor is called, certain things can be run. So that time you want to create an object. You cannot live without creating an object. Or when you have some variable over here. So if you have string height, which is equal to 10. No, sorry, int height is equal to 10. And then I try to return height. First of all, it will give me an error basically saying instance members can't be accessed from a static method. That means if I want to be able to access this height value, I need to make this static so that I can use it in a static function. Or you can just create this as a give me some value like this. 
then you can use it. So both of these things have to be static or both of them have to be non-static. And it makes sense, right? If you just do this, you're basically telling that this height variable is initialized when the constructor or when the instance of this constant class is created. So when you do this, int height is equal to 10 is given, but then you're mentioning it in static and then saying, even if I don't create an object, I should be returning this height value. Is that possible? No, because it's a logic fault. Non-static cannot be used in static. Now I can just use constants dot creating like this and constants dot give me some value and it will return 10 to me. So I hope that was clear. Now we are just going to get rid of this and of this, and we are going to dive into inheritance. So we are going to create multiple classes and we are going to learn something about abstract class and then about object oriented programming or as we know it, ooh, cool. So let's get started with this. So for inheritance, first let's get some classes up. So I'm going to have a class vehicle and here I'm going to have final or let's have int speed, which is equal to 10. Then, then we are going to have a Boolean value, which says is engine working, which is equal to false. And that's pretty much it. And let's just get one function up, which just says void accelerate. Then we just have speed go equal to, let's say 10. So we have speed is equal to speed plus 10. We've already seen this in the if conditions part. This basically means speed is equal to speed plus 10. Great. Now I'm just going to create another class, which is car and car is a vehicle, right? Now what I want to be able to do is get all of the functions and variables inside of this vehicle. Why? Because car is a vehicle. It also has a speed. It also has a Boolean value, which knows like if engine is working, it also has an acceleration. So what would I do? Copy paste, right? And that works. But what if in my vehicle, I decide to add another variable and that variable is Boolean is light on, which is equal to, let's say true because it's nighttime. So the light is on. So that means I'll again have to copy this. I'll again have to paste it and just imagine if there are hundreds of engineers working in your team and some engineer decides to have vehicles variable added. So there's another variable added, then there's another variable added. And you're just like, Hey, lots of changes happen. And then you decide to again, go ahead and copy paste it. But the problem with copy pasting over here is car also has its unique set, right? All vehicles have all of this, but car also has some properties of its own car, let's say has number of wheels. All right. All vehicles don't have four wheels, but over here, all cars have four. These are the type of cars we are manufacturing. All cars that we have have four, but all vehicles that we manufacture does not have number of wheels as four because it can be a bike, right? So that means I'll have to create with this variable again. If I just go ahead, copy this paste it, then I'll again have to create a number of wheels. But what if this class is so big that there are so many variables defined inside here? If that's the case, then it is a problem. That means we can't go ahead, just copy pasting. So we need another solution for this. And that's where inheritance comes into play. Inheritance just says, Hey, car is a vehicle. So whenever you have an is a relation. So let me just comment it out because this is the keyword or you can say a keyword in your mind, which will help you to know, do I want inheritance or not? So whenever you have an is a relation, it is using inheritance or it should use inheritance. I'm not saying always, but many a times whenever you have is a relation, you want to use inheritance. Let me give you an example. So I'm just going to draw this out. Let's remove all of the stuff. I'm just going to go ahead. Let's say you have this thing right here and this thing over here is your family. All right. And in your family, the head of the family is, let's say your father 
or mother let's put in mother over here so either your father or your mother or both have or multiple children right so there are going to be three people over here let's put that out so the first one is let's say naman which is your first sibling then you have another one which is you and a third one which is let's say rivan so you have naman inheriting from your mother or father you inheriting from your mother or father or rivan inheriting from your mother or father this means your mother or father are parents and these are children right naman is a child you is a child rivan is a child and that's what we call in inheritance as well in programming this is called as a parent class or base class or super class and these are known as child classes or sub classes we understood why it's called parent class but it's called base class because we are based on these them right that's why the base class and it is also the super class because it is super right and these are sub classes so that is similar to sets you have a super set and you have a subset so i hope that is clear this is exactly what we have in programming we have inheritance over here car is a vehicle so if we have a new diagram which says you know this thing right over here is vehicle and there can be multiple vehicles let's say the first vehicle is a car second one is a bike and the third one is a truck now it makes sense right so now we understand what inheritance is but how do we make sure inheritance is there for that we have a special keyword in dart which is extends whenever you have extends over here you extend the functionality of the class by another class and our another class is vehicle so when you have this car is a sub class so you have car over here that is a sub class and vehicle becomes a super class so car is extending the functionality of vehicle but nothing changes over here right let me show it to you you can have another one over here let's say int number of wheels which is equal to 4 and then you go ahead and print number of wheels and then you try to print it but you cannot print it because print has to be done in a function so let's go ahead and have void print something and then we are just going to print number of wheels over here sweet now i can run it and i see nothing because we have nothing in the main function so let's go ahead and create a car so we are going to have car car which is equal to car and then we are going to print car dot and now you see the magic over here you have number of wheels you have is the engine working but we have not defined it anywhere it's because of this extends vehicle if i just remove it and I have car dot you see everything goes away but if you have car extends vehicle then we can have car dot number of wheels is engine working is light on speed everything that was mentioned over here it has extended the functionality of car by adding properties and methods of vehicle so now we can have is engine working and car number of wheels great now if i run this i get false which is the value over here correct and number of wheels which is 4 great so this was inheritance as simple as it gets just two words we had type and we could extend the functionality of an entire class now you can create multiple types of classes over here for example truck so you have truck but the number of wheels over here is 8 or 6 whatever i am not very sure but then you try to run it obviously it will just print the same thing because we have not created an instance of truck so let's go ahead and have truck truck which is equal to truck now i'm just going to print truck dot number of wheels and same thing over here print truck dot is engine working then i'll run it and i get false for which is for car then eight false which is for truck and you can keep doing this and that's fine so i hope you got a basic basic understanding of inheritance with inheritance one more thing is possible now since we have extended the functionality of a car vehicle 
वॉट वी कैन डू अवे इज है वहीकल कार इक्वल टू का ऑल राइट सो यू कैन डू दिस एंड इट डजेंट थ्रो एन एरर ओवे या इट थ्रोज एन एरर ओवे बट इट डजेंट थ्रो एन एरर ओवे दैट्स बिकॉज कार इज अ सब टाइप ऑफ वहीकल सो यू कैन हैव इट डिफाइंड लाइक वहीकल कार इज इक्वल टू का एंड दिस इज अ वैलिड सेंट एक्ट बट इट गिव्स एन एरर बिकॉज द गेटर नंबर ऑफ व्हील्स इज इन डिफाइंड फॉर द टाइप वहीकल सिंस दिस इज ऑफ द टाइप वहीकल नाउ यू कैन एक्सेस ऑल द प्रॉपर्टीज on a vehicle but you cannot access the properties of car but what if i want to access the properties of car but i also want vehicle to be here in that case i'm just going to use another keyword over here which is as so you can treat a certain variable as another data type so you can have as car over here let's wrap it in parenthesis so this gets treated as one thing and the error goes away now why is that the case because we are saying treat car as a car class over here if i had treat car as a truck it would not give any error because vehicle can be a car as well but if you use integer over here it will say number of wheels is not defined for integer so it needs to be either of the vehicles so that we can get number of wheels and if i use car as a truck dot number of wheels what will i get i will get a runtime error because the runtime type of car is car and you're telling it treat car as a truck that doesn't make any sense right that's why you're just going to have car as car dot number of wheels then we'll run it and there we go we get false for eight false so i wanted to show you this as keyword you can use this with dynamic so if you have dynamic some value which is equal to 10 let's put this capital then i'm just going to have some value over here and i told that you cannot have properties over here because it is a dynamic but what i can do over here is treat this as an integer and then i get a bunch of properties that i can access so this is a work around you can do with dynamic but i wouldn't recommend doing it in this case because you can just put var which is variable or final if you don't want it or just integer so that you know you don't have to do all of this work you can just have some value so now that you've understood basic inheritance what i want to tell you is dart doesn't support multiple inheritance that means you cannot extend two things so let's say the car wants to extend another class it cannot extend that so if you have class vehicle 2 and car wants to access that let's say it also has properties like end speed is equal to 2 and all of that stuff i'm just going to copy paste for simplicity the is engine working as true over here but the light is false and this we are accelerating at the speed of let's say 20 now what i want to do is have vehicle ex car extend vehicle and vehicle 2 that's not possible in dart you cannot do car vehicle vehicle 2 like this or you cannot do extends vehicle 2 like this that's not allowed in dart why is that the case because a class and dart compiler will get confused like what do you mean if you extend two things at the same time vehicle and vehicle 2 you're telling i want properties of this and properties of this and there is a chance that both of these class expose the same properties then it will just ask you like what property or which classes property should i use should i use this classes property or should i use this classes properties right even if there is one property matching it can cause that confusion and that's why multiple inheritance is not allowed in dart you cannot extend more than one class now that i've mentioned this let's get it out of the way however one thing that is supported is something like this let's put this diagram a little down and let's say the vehicle is extending from something as well all right so if vehicle is extending from something we have something right over here and then we can have some class that vehicle is extending all right we can have a diagram 
लाइक दिस बट वी कैनॉट हैव कार एक्सटेंडिंग वहीकल एंड कार एक्सटेंडिंग लेट से अनादर थिंग दैट वी हैव विच वी नेम्ड वहीकल टू सो समथिंग लाइक दिस इज अलाउड बट समथिंग लाइक दिस इज एंट अलाउड ओके यू कैनॉट हैव मल्टीपल इनहेरिटेंसेज लाइक दिस सो यू कैन इनहेरिटेंस इनहेरिट फ्रॉम वन वन क्लास बट यू कैनॉट इनहेरिट फ्रॉम बोथ ऑफ दीज क्लासेस बट दिस थिंग राइट यर इज अलाउड सो दैट मीन्स वहीकल एन कैन एक्सटेंड सम क्लास एंड सम क्लास कैन एक्सटेंड वहीकल सो दैट्स अलाउड सो आई कैन क्रिएट क्लास सम क्लास वेयर एंड देन हैव लेट से फाइनल बुलियन ग्रीटिंग सो वेन एवर यू हैव वहीकल इट विल गिव यूर ग्रीटिंग लेट से हेलो एंड दिस शुड बी अ स्ट्रिंग नॉट बुलियन ग्रेट नाउ वी कैन एक्सटेंड सम क्लास वेयर एंड वी कैन डू दैट with this whenever we create car or truck or whatever let's put final over here so that we have car instance over here so i can have car let's remove some value we have car dot and now you'll see we have greeting over here why do we have greeting because indirectly we are inheriting from some class as well because car is inheriting from vehicle and vehicle is inheriting from some class so car is inheriting from some class so think of it from your family point of view all right if you have your grandfather your father inherits from your grandfather and you inherit from your father so you are inheriting from your grandfather now what if i have some methods over here right and the method is accelerate the same method that was defined above and here i'm having speed plus equals let's say 30 not speed plus equals 10 this some class goes really fast so what do we do in this case well in this case the warning is the member accelerate overrides an inherited member but isn't annotated with override but the fix isn't to just remove this function i can just put at the rate override over here if i put at the rate override i just need to match this function signature with this function signature this is called function signature or function prototype and if that is the case that means speed plus equals 10 now if i just have car dot let's remove everything else it's causing a bit of confusion and we'll have car dot accelerate so we are not able to print it because it's returning a void to us so let's have car dot accelerate and then we are going to print speed so we have accelerated that means we have set speed equal to plus equals to 10 and then since we are using the same object we can have car dot speed with the increased speed so we have 25 over here what just happened so we have car we have in number of vehicle but it extends vehicle so it goes to the vehicle vehicle doesn't have any speed because it is extending some class and some class has a speed of 15 then we are accelerating so speed plus equals to 10 which means 15 plus equals to 10 it doesn't consider this one it considers this one because we have put at the rate override if we don't put it and don't have this function it will not be 25 it will be 45 because it will be plus equals to 30 you can put override and change the function block over here also it doesn't mean that this needs to match with this you can also have int accelerate the name of the function should be same not the return data type or this entire thing only the name of the function needs to be same and then you can return speed and if you do so and try to print car dot accelerate as well it should give you the value now because car dot accelerate has a type of integer now not void so let's run it and we have 25 25 printing over here sweet and if you remove override from here it will give you an error just like we had with void so now if that is clear to you you know we can get rid of this class let's make vehicle the base class only let's remove accelerate from here okay let's put accelerate but let's put remove override and let's just print car dot number of fields over here so we discuss something known as abstract classes and implementations so let's get into that
So what is this implements and abstract classes? First, let's understand implements and then it's easy to understand abstract classes. So there's a thing called as implements and first we need to understand why we need to use it. That will make it much more clearer. So we need to use implements when we have something like this. As you can see, car is extending vehicle, truck is extending vehicle, but both of them have number of wheels. That means it is essentially a vehicle property, right? If we have bike as well, bike is going to have vehicle as well, but we have independently defined in all of those classes. Now, if I have bike, let's say class bike that extends vehicle here I can I have all access to all of the things you know I have access to number of wheels I have access to sorry I have access to is engine working I have access to is light on but it doesn't anywhere tell me that in number of wheels should be defined because that's what all vehicles need to have so you need to implement this that's the core concept Whatever you have, you need to implement that variable. So to do that, we can have implements. So instead of this, we can have int number of wheels, which is equal to, let's say 10 over here. And then I'm having in number of wheels is equal to four in number of wheels is equal to eight. But still nothing over here tells us that we need to implement it. So for that, we will change this from extents to implements, right? And now since we have implements, we get an error. Let's remove it. And what is the error saying? Missing concrete implementations of getter vehicle dot is engine working, is light on, number of wheels, is engine working, and two more. What, I, what does this error message even mean? Well, you don't understand this part, right? But you do understand this part because you've already learned about getters and setters. It's basically saying I need to define is engine working getter, is light on, number of wheels, is engine working and all of that. Now you might ask, why do I need to have getters and setters? Does that make sense? I don't have anything related to getters or setters in my code. And that's true. What you need to do is implement all of these variables. What I mean by implement is you need to put at the rate override for sing every single one of them. That means you need to have boolean is engine working, which is equal to true. So that means our error message is modified over here. I'll do the same thing for rest of the things. I'll have at the rate override, then I'll have boolean is light on, which is equal to true. Then I'll have at the rate override in number of wheels and that is equal to four and the error goes away. Now I have a certain set of warnings over here showing up for truck. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to implement it. I'm going to copy these two things because truck is kind of having the same thing over here, but at the rate override in number of wheels that's equal to six. So now we have implemented number of wheels over here. So whenever we implement, we need to implement all of the variables, all of the functions that are defined in variable. For example, if I avoid accelerate here and accelerate is basically saying that I just want to print accelerating. That means I will have to override accelerate function as well. So I'll have to do at the rate override void accelerate then i'll have to create my own function block which says print accelerating the car i want to make this change now i can use this at the rate override over here as well and we'll have accelerating the truck and the same thing for bike but i'm just going to remove it two classes are enough to understand this so basically whenever you implement you get a error message saying that you need to implement all of the properties, all of the methods that are defined here. And they can be the same as this one or they cannot be. What if I want to keep it the same as this one? Well, I just go ahead and print accelerating. 
what if another engineer comes in and then just changes you know and says accelerating vehicle haha and then you lose track of it and then you forget and then your code is functioning abnormally you're expecting accelerating the vehicle haha which is written over here but you're getting accelerating will i use super over here now you might ask what is this super well it's one thing that was present in extends so whenever you had extends something and you use super it would refer to the parent class the class that you were extending if i do something like super dot it gives me accelerate is engine working is light on number of wheels so super refers to the instance of the vehicle class that we have and it gives us access to the nice all of these things that are present so will i do super dot accelerate like this when i try to implement it as well not really because super dot accelerate doesn't exist in implements it only is present in extends so if there's extends you can use super dot and do something but in implements you cannot do that so if your class extends vehicle and then you say super dot accelerate you'll be able to do that or if you want super dot is engine working you'll be able to get the value of it and if you want you'll also be able to change it let's say true you'll able be able to change it as well so you're able to modify the content of the parent class in the subclass so i hope that was clear to you now let's get back to super dot accelerate and implement can i do the same thing in implements not really super dot this thing is not allowed it says the method accelerate is always abstract in the super type so it basically gets this part this thing right here not all of this so since this is abstract we only get access to this much there's no code block so why would you run this function so you cannot do this when you're implementing you always want everything on your own right if you're implementing you're basically telling hey give me all the properties that i want to implement i don't want to create anything on my own just give me a set of instructions that's why we don't have access to super because we cannot call this function over here so that's the difference i wanted to show you now you can use extends and implements together so you can have extends some class implements some class so does that mean i can extend vehicle and implement vehicle not really you cannot extend and implement the same class you'll have to use different classes for them so let's bring our other class back or the super class of vehicle but in this case it's not going to be super class and we are going to have all of these defined over here not accelerate accelerate is going to be present over here okay so all the properties are present in other class and vehicle just has the function void accelerate so you can implement vehicle but you will extend other class that means i have access to all of these properties i don't need to override them but i have to implement whatever vehicle has to give me which is accelerate so if i just have this it will give me an error saying vehicle dot accelerate need and this is what concrete implementation means concrete implementation is something that is not abstract and we are going to take a look at abstract in just a minute so now if i extend other class and implement vehicle i get access to the accelerate function and that means i can print is engine working over here i can print other things as well like is light on and number of wheels and then i have car dot number of wheels it will work the same way because number of wheels over here is 10 but then i will have car dot accelerate which will print out all of these things right so you have 10 that means it is printing the number of wheels of a car because that's 10 then falls true 10 again which is this part right here but now i want number of wheels to be present in vehicle i can do that and that means i have access to at the rate override 
for this variable which is in number of vehicles and I can set it to 4. And now when I run it, let's see why I cannot run it. Oh, it's number of wheels, not number of vehicles. And here you see we get 4 falls to 4. Perfect. So now that you've understood implements and how it works, let's get into abstract class. What is an abstract class? Abstract class is quite similar to the class that we see. We defined it using abstract which is a keyword class, which is the keyword. And then, you know, you name the class. So let's call this class vehicle. Let's remove the extending of other class from here. And then we are going to have a class block. Let's remove all of these things from here. We can have car like this because we are going to create a bunch of properties. Now, what is abstract class? You're not defining anything. So if you have a function, you're not going to define a block for it. Although you can define it, but you can, when you implement it, you have to redefine it. So let's see an example. What if I have void or let's say I have void accelerate so I can have that. But as you can see, it gives me an error. If I remove this, it doesn't give me an error over here. But when I add this, it gives me an error because I need to override accelerate. Now, earlier, we couldn't create functions like this, right? We had to put in stuff like this. But in abstract class, this is allowed. You don't have to put in a function block and all of that stuff. You can just put a semicolon and then override. Let's put over here. Then we avoid accelerate. And then we are going to print accelerating. Great. Now, temporarily, I can just comment this out, run it, and truck gives an error. So we can comment truck out. We can look into that later. Then run it again. Accelerating. Sweet. So abstract class forces a contract over here. It says whatever methods, functions I define over here. And if you implement it or extend it. All right. Extending is allowed. You can extend an abstract class. And abstract class extending also means that it gives an error over here. Earlier, when you used normal class, you and you extended a normal class, it didn't give you an error if you didn't override a function. But here, if you extend an abstract class, it will give you an error because if you extend or implement an abstract class, you have to put at the rate override and define the function over here. It's not there just so that you can call accelerate in your function or in your class. So that is the difference between a normal class and an abstract class. I hope you're getting the hang of it. Now we can have some variables defined as well. Let's get int number of wheels over here, which is equal to 10. And now you see, we don't get the override option over here. However, if I implement it, it gives an error. If I extend it, I can use number of wheels over here. If you see number of wheels, I can use it. So I can extend this property. So I get access to number of vehicles. However, if I implement it, I have to implement and override number of vehicles. That means I have to rewrite this variable with a new value or the same value as before. So that is an abstract class. Now you might ask if abstract classes can be implemented and normal classes could be implemented. Does that mean normal classes are abstract classes? And you're kind of right. Abs normal classes are abstract classes. They are implicitly abstract. Abstract classes are there just so that it can force some kind of contract on you. The contract is saying that you need to define all of these functions. But if you just create a normal class over here, that means you have need to have something like this you can create or construct or instantiate a normal class, but that's just not allowed with abstract classes. Okay, so I hope you got the difference between classes and abstract classes. So just to revise, classes are implicitly abstract, but abstract classes cannot be constructed and abstract classes can just have a semicolon right after this. You don't have to necessarily define them like we have to do in normal classes. So now that we've learned about abstract classes, implements and all of that stuff, let's get done with it. And we are basically done with inheritance.
So let's remove it and jump into object oriented programming. What is this object oriented programming or OOP? So object oriented programming is what we are basically doing till now. Object oriented programming is a paradigm based on the concept of objects. And we've continuously been working on with objects, right? If we had something like date time dot now that we've already seen in the previous lectures, like we had date, which is date time dot now. Now you'll be able to understand the syntax a little bit more, right? Date time is a class dot now is a method defined inside this date time. And probably this dot now is a static function. Right? So you're able to break it down and we've continuously been working with classes. So when we created classes like cookie, cake, vehicle, car, we've continuously been working with classes and creating object because this thing right here is an object. It is a date time object because date time is a class. Now I hope that makes sense to you because we have studied a lot about classes. This date time thing is a class that is built into Dart so that we can use it. So the Dart team has created this date time class so that we don't have any problems getting the current date and time. Otherwise, we would have to implement this on our own. And it's not not possible. It's not impossible. You can do it. But why do waste time on all of these things when Dart team can do that for us? So this was object oriented programming on the it was based on the concept of object, but there are certain types of OOP concepts. All right. So the first one is polymorphism. The second type is abstraction. The third type is inheritance. And the fourth type is encapsulation. So these are the main four types of object oriented like concepts in object oriented programming. Let's go through the one by one. What is polymorphism? Polymorphism is the ability of an object to take on many forms. What do I mean by this? When we had a class vehicle and let's change the example a little bit. Let's get animal over here. All right. We've been working too much with vehicles. So let's avoid sound over here. So the animal can make a sound, right? So we are just going to print here animal making sound. Now you will have a class CAD that extends animal and yeah, we are just going to override this void sound. All right. We're not going to, you know, just have this much. We're going to override it in reality because we want to have cat making a sound. I told you in extends, you can have override and that's it. Now I'm just going to create a new class that will be dog. And here we will write dog making sound or we can just say dog barking. Now in the main function, I can just have animal cat is equal to cat. Then I will just put cat dot sound over here. Then I can have cat is equal to dog. Then I will have cat dot sound again. Now you might say, Hey, this is not possible. How can you do it? I can do it. Animal cat is equal to cat. So cat is a subtype of animal. So I can make a sound because animal has sound defined in it. Then cat is equal to dog. I can reassign this. I can reassign this because dog is also a type of animal. All right. I cannot do something like class is equal to five because that is an integer. Integer cannot be animal, but dog can be animal because dog is extending from animal. Dog is a subtype of animal. Again, to visualize, I would recommend you to think about your family tree. Let's say this is your parent, parent, let's say parent you is equal to you. Then you have you dot sound. Then you have you equal to Rivan now. So you are Rivan now and Rivan can also have the sound property because your parent can make a sound. If your parent can make a sound, you can make a sound. So I hope that cleared things up. So this thing right here is polymorphism. We've already seen this. Why are you showing this again? That's what you might say. And I agree. I'm showing it again so that, you know, polymorphism is just a fancy word given to this thing right away. Yeah. Polymorphism is the ability of an object to take on many forms. This is achieved through inheritance and method overriding. 
This thing right here is method overriding. It allows objects of different classes to be treated as objects of a common superclass. What did I just say? It allows objects, so we have cat of different classes. So let's say we have cat over here, cat cat is equal to cat. Then I have dog dog, which is equal to dog. So let's say we have this and then we have dog dot sound, same thing. And then if I run it, all right. So it allows objects of different classes, cat and dog, to be treated as objects of a common superclass. And the common superclass is animal, right? It, they both are treated as objects of animal. So that is polymorphism achieved through inheritance and method overriding. The next thing that we have is abstraction. Abstraction is the process of hiding the internal details and complexity of an object and only exposing the essential features and functionalities. What do I mean by this? I told a long definition. What does that mean? It basically means, let's say we have an abstract class and that abstract class is animal. And animal says, hey, make some sound. So you have white sound. Let's get rid of this animal now. And then you have cat extending animal override. So all of this is fine. You can also have implement here. That's fine. And abstraction is basically just us doing animal just like we did before. In polymorphism, what I did was put animal cat is equal to cat. That's exactly what abstraction is. Animal, animal is equal to, let's say, cat. And then I can have print or let's not print animal dot sound and then you can create another object which is animal which is equal to dog and then you can have animal two dot sound and that will give you cat making sound dog making sound cat making sound dog making sound so here we are just putting out relevant information we are hiding all the complexity inside by exposing only the essential features. For example, we have got rid of this abstract class from here. For example, what we have done is remove the animal class from here. Now we only have abstract class. Abstract classes allow us to put animal over here, making our anim variable more, you can say diverse because now animal can be set to dog, animal can be set to cat, but animal cannot be set to animal because abstract classes cannot be instantiated. So that's what abstraction is. Abstraction hides the internal details and exposes only the essential features and functionalities, which is this part right here. It can be achieved through abstract classes or interfaces. So now that we've understood polymorphism and abstraction, let's get to inheritance. And we've already seen what inheritance is. Inheritance is basically, you know, just having a vehicle, extending it, and then using the properties in the super class. We've already seen that. So I'm not going to go into inheritance. And the last OOP concept is encapsulation. Encapsulation is the bundling of data and methods together as a single unit. And the data is hidden from the outside world. It provides data protection and supports the principle of data hiding. What does that mean? Well, it's basically about the public private thing that I talked about. So if I just remove all of this and I have class person and here the name property is let's say private and then I have getters and setters about them. That thing is known as encapsulation. By encapsulation, what I've done is bundle the data and methods. So the data is name and the method is, let's say, get name, set name or get age, whatever. So we have bundled all of that data together as a single unit and that data is hidden from the outside world. So this underscore name is hidden from the outside world. This provides data protection obviously because our data is protected within one class and the principle of data hiding, which is as the name suggests, it hides the data. 
Also, these classes can be made private, not just these variables. You can have class underscore person, which will make this class private and even function. So if you have get name like this, this is also a private function. All right. So putting underscore before any variable name, you know, makes it private. So now that we've understood the OOP concept, there was nothing too difficult about it. These are just terminologies. If you want to remember polymorphism means poly, you know, poly means many morphism is like many forms. So many forms, and this usually includes method overriding abstraction is basically using abstract classes, abstract or interfaces so that you have a diverse range and this allows you to hide complexity of an object. Third one is inheritance, where if you extend a certain class, you get the properties of a class and you establish an is a or parent child relationship between the classes. And the last one is encapsulation, which is basically using private public and it encapsulates everything. So it's like cap, it's like a capsule, you know, it is bundling all of the things together in one capsule. So it's encapsulation. So we are done with classes, but there's one concept I would like to cover with classes, which is mixin. Now, what is a mixin? Mixin, as the name suggests, it mixes in, you know, if you use this mixin with a class, it mixes in the properties of the class that you're mixing it with in the class. So let's just, you know, get rid of these words and see a practical example to create a mixin. You just type the word mixin, just like a class, you add class, you have mixin and then you have a name so let's say jump so jump is a mix in and then you have a block created after that let's say this has a property of jumping and this jump is 10 centimeters long let's say so you can define it like this similar to a class and let's say i have a class called animal and my animal can jump so i can just use the with keyword which allows me to mix in stuff. So whenever I use with, I can use this mix in. So it's expecting a mix in over here. And now if I do this and have print, I get access to a property called jumping. Also, I'll have to create a function. Now I can just create final animal is equal to animal. And then I'm just going to print animal dot function like this. Now we'll run it and it's giving us an error because we have printed it. Let's have this. So we have animal dot FN and then run it. So we have 10 written over here. So it's basically mixed in this jump with this class. Now you might say, Hey, this is very similar to the extends keyword that we had. When we had extends, we could extend a class. So let's try to do that. If I do extends jump, it gives an error. Because extents can only be used for classes, not with mixin. So I have to use with over here. So when I use with, I can have jump over here. So I can print jumping. So what if I just create this as a class and then extend and have jump? Is that fine? Yeah, it's the same exact thing. So you might ask, why do I want to use mixin? That's because mixin is not establishing a parent child relationship. It's not creating this thing that we saw over here. It's not creating all of this. All of this is for inheritance and extending with mixin. You're basically telling, Hey, I have a bunch of code over here. I want this bunch of code to be reusable inside of this class. So please help me out with it. I'm not setting any parent child relationship over here. Hey, animal is a super class of jump. No, that's not the case. I'm just saying animal can use this jump property over here. So whatever properties jump class, a uh, jump mix in has, I can use it inside over here. That by no means means, you know, animal is a parent or a subclass of jump. So if you have class cat that extends, you know, animal, does that mean I can create a function? Let's call this fun and have print jumping over here. Does that make sense? 
Absolutely, it does. Why wouldn't it? Because animal has a property with jump, and with jump has allowed it to have the jumping property. And since cat is extending from animal, that means it will get access to the jumping property as well. What if I use class cat with animal? That means I'm using with with a class, right? That's not allowed. This was allowed prior to dot three point zero point zero. With dot three point zero point zero, classes cannot be used as mixin. To use classes as mixin, what you have to do is convert this to a mixin class. So with a mixin class, you can have that. But mixin class cannot be used with with because mixin class is class plus mixin, right? So now you can use with animal over here, but you don't have access to jumping. But yeah, now you can use with. Prior to Dart 3.0.0, you could do that, but now you have to do mix and class. So let's put this over here, and we have our extends over here. Great. Now you might ask if we are not setting any parent-child relationship, does that mean I can have multiple mixins? You're right. We can have multiple mixins over here. If my animal can, you know, scream, we can also have. Boolean is screaming property of a year, and we can just have with jump comma scream. Since we are not having scream and jump as the parent class of animal, that means we have the print is screaming property of a year, and then when I run it, you get ten and false. And you can have as many mixins as you want. So mixin is great for code reuse, but it doesn't create any class hierarchy. There's just one more thing that I want to show you, which is on. As you can see over here, mixin scream on object. When we don't specify anything like on, it is default by mixin scream on object. On object, this object is a data type. All right. So if you have object over here, you can use it. But it give, will give you an error over here because, well, it's an object. It's not an animal. What exactly is this object? Object is the base class for all Dart objects. As you can see it over here, the base class for all Dart objects except null. That means object is a super class of string, integer, boolean, everything, but not null. So if you try to give this. A value of null, it won't accept it. But if you give it a value of five, it will accept it. If you give it a value of one hundred and five, that is a string, it will accept that. So object is this thing right here, the base class, and then we have stuff like you know integer, double, boolean, all of that. So I didn't explain object to you before because I wanted to explain. With the help of you know inheritance, so that everything comes together for you. So, anyways, coming back to our example, we have class object over here for a scream. So, this mixin scream on object is basically saying you can use it anywhere you want. You can mix in this anywhere you would like. So, with scream, basically, I'm having the ability to restrict this scream's usage anywhere I want. So I can just put on and mention whatever I want, and it will restrict the access over there. Now let's dive into the new class modifiers that we've got. So let's consider I have an abstract class called Animal, and classes Human and Dog are implementing the Animal class, and Cat is extending Animal. Now I'll create an instance of Animal class and set it to Cat, and then I'm going to have a switch of Animal, and the case will be Dog. And then when I try to run it, I get nothing printed out in the console, and that's expected because I've not handled the case of cat. So the problem I'm trying to solve is that whenever I put animal, I want all the subtypes of the animal class to be included here. And by subtypes, I mean direct subtypes. So I should be getting a compile time error or a compile time warning saying you've not handled all the cases of animal class. So to do that, Dart three introduced a new modifier called sealed. So with sealed class now, we get an error. The error says that the type animal is not exhaustively matched by the switch cases since it doesn't match human. So we need to implement 
द केस इज ऑफ कैट एंड ह्यूमन सो आई एम जस्ट गन टू एड केस कैट एंड केस ह्यूमन एंड देन आर एरर गोज अवे सिंस वी हैंडल ऑल द सब टाइप्स ऑफ एनिमल क्लास वी डोंट गेट एन एरर एंड वेन आई ट्राई टू रन इट आई गेट द प्रिंट एज कैट this is the difference between abstract and sealed class there's obviously more but sealed class is quite similar to an abstract class for example so when you try to instantiate the animal class it says animal classes cannot be instantiated so the sealed class is implicitly abstract another question that might be in your mind is how does dart do this dart does this because the sealed classes prevent other classes from implementing or extending it outside of the same library for example if i have library a dot dot here and if i have all of these defined in library b dot dot that's just not allowed all of them need to be in library a dot dot for this to work since they are in the same library dart is able to know of the subtypes of animal class and by subtypes i mean direct subtypes that means if i try to have a class cat1 which implements cat I won't be getting this in the switch case because this is an indirect subtype because cat1 implements cat and cat extends animal it's an indirect subtype but if i directly implement it from the animal class i get an error over here so that's about sealed classes other than sealed class a bunch of other modifiers were introduced in dart3 the first one is final modifier this final is very similar to the sealed class it cannot be implemented or extended outside of the same library but inside the same library it can be extended or implemented a basic difference between them is that animal class can not be constructed but animal 1 class can be constructed so sealed class is very similar to the abstract class because it cannot be constructed like this but final class can be and another one is that if we have final anim here like this and then if we try to have switch animal like this it doesn't throw any error to us so with the final class we don't get the cool features the sealed class gives us but final class does prevent classes outside of the library from being implemented or extended the third one is base class so base classes cannot be implemented but it can be extended so that means if you try to create class human extending animal 2 it will work but if you try to create class human implementing animal 2 that won't work and whatever class extends animal 2 class needs to be base final or sealed that means if we have a class called human extending animal 2 you see we will get an error here saying it must be base final or seal so this should be base final or seal and the same goes for a final class so if we are in the same library and then if we try to extend animal 1 we get the same error over here this also needs to be base final or seal this is because the final class encompasses the effects of the base class The cool thing with base classes is that whenever we extend this and call this human class the constructor of the base class gets called. So whenever an instance of the human class will be created obviously that won't be created with seal it can be created with final. So whenever human class is instantiated the animal 2 class's constructor will be called. Fourth one is kind of a reverse of base class which is interface class. base classes could only be extended interface classes can only be implemented so even if you are outside of the library you can implement the interface class but cannot extend it and this interface can also be constructed for example if you have animal 3 like this we can do that so this is not a true interface from other programming languages so to make this a true proper interface what you'll have to do is combine it with abstract so you have abstract interface class which you can use and this is a true proper interface so if you have animal 4 like this now it cannot be constructed it has the properties of both abstract and interface so now this is a proper interface with us in dart and the last modifier that we have 
is a mixin class and as the name suggests it's a mixin plus a class so it will be used as a class as well as as a mixin so you can use the with keyword now you might say why do we need a mixin class here if if we have a normal class animal 5 which can be used with the with keyword for example if you have class human we can use this with animal 5 class right but that's not the case in dart 3 in dart 2 you could do this but in dart 3 with keyword for a normal class is removed you'll have to use mixin class for it to be used with the with keyword so that's one breaking change in dart 3 nothing else is quite breaking these are all additive features so a normal class cannot be mixed in now but a mixin class can be now let's get into lists so what is a list list is an ordered collection of objects meaning it is a collection of objects wherein the order matters so let's take an example you know what if i want to store the marks of the user all right and this user is ravan and i want to store his marks all right so how can i do that well i'll have to store the math mark english mark or computer science marks and this is what he's got now i want to store all of them together now i can't create separate variables for it because i just want to store all of the marks together in just one place so that's why list exists list will help us to store all of the marks together in a bundle and this bundle is denoted by a square bracket all right so that is one thing so how do we create list so to create a list we just have list this list thing is a class you can see it is an abstract class all right and it implements some other thing so now we are able to understand whatever documentation says to us abstract class is a list that means if we try to create list is equal to list like this it's not allowed because it's an abstract class and abstract classes cannot be created so what is the way well first of all we'll have to give a variable name like this so we have list list and then directly we can assign the value over here so we can just have 10 20 30 written over here and then when we print this list and run it we should be seeing 10 20 30 great so this is how you create a list you are able to store the values together now what if i want to retrieve one value from this list to do that we can just use this operator right here you can see that the square brackets and pass in 0 1 or 2 so remember the example where we had string and then let's say we had greeting which was equal to hello and what i did over there was greeting like this zero this gave me access to h right why did that happen because it grabbed the first element over here and in programming everything starts from zero except length so it gave me h over here and similar to this if i do list at zero like this it will give me 10 if i do list at 1 i will get 20 if i do list at 2 it will give me 30 so if i just try to print it first it should give me h then it should give me 30 and that's exactly what i get second so remove the string example from here and we have a list with us now great but what if i have 3 over here because the length of this list is you know 3 elements and i'm accessing the fourth element over here and if i run it it gives me a runtime error saying range error index out of range index should be less than 3 and obviously index should be less than 3 because there are three elements you cannot access the fourth element by doing list at 3 so you need to do two over here and then when you run it you'll get it so this was about creating a list and accessing a list but if you just hover over this list it will tell you list dynamic list and i've told to you before if we have dynamic we should probably try to avoid it so what this dynamic has allowed us to do over here is not just create a list of all integers i can also add strings over here so i can add hello i can add a boolean value false and it wouldn't complain why because this is a list of dynamic 
and this is enclosed in some angle brackets that we are going to talk about in just a minute but the point is if i just have list at 3 over here i'll be ex uh, able to access a string but this list is of marks right if i have marks how can i access a string that should not be allowed i should not be able to put anything other than integer how can i avoid that to avoid that here in your list you need to define list like this you need to put in angle brackets and then pass in integer over here if you do this it will throw an error saying yeah you cannot put string and boolean values over here this should strictly contain integer values that means i cannot have boolean values as well i mean double values as well right and if i create list of double i can have this because this is considered as a double value so if i just have list at 0 and then i run it it gives me 10 because double includes integer in itself but double also allows you to add decimal points now you will ask what is this thing right here this angular brackets that we have are called generics these generics can be used anywhere for example when i try to create a class let's say of student all right and this student has final list not list final string name and final int marks and i'm just going to go ahead and create a constructor for this and this is going to be a positional constructor so we have this dot marks and this dot name and there we go all right now i can use generics in this class as well so if i just go ahead and put the student should be of the type string i can have that my class is of student of the type you know string now you might ask what is the meaning of this well you wouldn't find meaning over here but what if i remove marks over here from here i just have name and here i'm saying this name can be anything you want all right it can be an integer it can be a boolean it can be a string it can be anything you like so for that i'm just going to put t over here that's a convention not necessary so you can even put a but by convention people usually put t and then you can use this t value over here so you have final t name now let me just comment this list thing out to understand generics i can just have final student is equal to student all right but now it will ask me to do something over here first of all it will ask me to put a name so i can just go ahead and put rivan over here and it will understand that t over here the student you see over here it's student with the generic type string because i passed in a string if i passed in 20 it will be student of integer and the name should be integer now you might ask what's the benefit of this the benefit of this is if we have student dot name it gives us the great type of integer name even if i put string over here it will give me string if i put an integer it will give me int if i had to do this the other way i would have to use dynamic over here and if i use dynamic we all know we don't get the nice type checking now i get the nice type checking and that gives me the right type also i can define it like this over here just like we had for list double i can just have student with the angular brackets and then i can have string let's say and then it will give me an error over here saying that you've defined that this student is of the type string that means your final t name should also be string so please convert this to a string and i've converted it to a string so that's exactly what's happening over here list is also a class all right and it's an abstract class and if we go into the implementation of this list it will tell you that even it had t over here and if you didn't pass t it will just consider it as dynamic so we passed in a double saying yeah this is a double don't give me dynamic if you give me dynamic i have some problems with it because it will allow me to pass in anything string boolean i just want integer or double values to be present inside this list so this generics are very useful you can even use it in functions so we have void set name and then you can pass in t like this over here 
and then create a function. But people don't generally use it over here. They use it inside of these parameters so that you have t name right over here. And then you can have, you know, your print like new name and then you just print out the new name over here. You're not actually setting, you're just printing the new name. So I hope that made sense to you. This is what the angular brackets are for. So let's remove the student class from here. Let's remove it from here. And let's uncomment these things out. So now the question is, why do they give us this angular brackets? Why don't they give us like list double, something like this? That sounds much better, right? Now I agree with you, this might seem a lot more intuitive, but here's the problem. What if I want to create a list of a class? For example, I had a list of student class, right? What if I want to create a list of student class? I'll just remove this from here. I'm just having a strict type that this needs to be a string. So what if I want to create a list of student class? If I just have list double or list string like this, I won't be able to access string list of student because student is a class that I created and list of double would be a class that Dart, Dart creates. If I just have that, I wouldn't be able to create a list of student. So to do that, we have generics over here and generics allow me to pass whatever type I want. It can be a student, which is the class that I created, integer, double, even object. And we know what objects are. Objects are super class or base classes of all the data types. So that means again, I can have string values over here. I can have Boolean values over here, but it's different from dynamic. Dynamic says, hey, you can pass in any values and dy uh, object says, you can only pass in values that are non-nullable because object is a root of the non-nullable dot hierarchy. Okay, cool. So let's pass in a list of student class. How would that look? Well, we are just going to have something like this. Then we are going to have student like this. So we created a student class over here. Then we need to pass in the name. Let's say first student's name is Ravan. And then we'll go ahead. The second student's name is Naman. The third student's name is, let's say Rakesh. And the fourth student's name is Son. All right. So we have four students over here. I can access all of these students. So let me just rename this variable. I have students and make sure you have students over here or student list like this, not just student, because that would mean you have only one student and can cause a lot of confusion. Again, descriptive variables, right? So we have students at zero now. So that would give me an instance of student class, which is Rivan. So it gives me instance of student, which is Rivan. Now to access the name, I can just have students at zero dot, and it gives me name. Why? Because students at zero gives me an instance of student class, which means I can access the name property on it. This is just like, you know, final student, which is equal to students at zero. Let's remove this. And then I can have student dot name because student is this student right here. So you can literally create list of anything that you want, any type that you want. That's why these generics are present so that you can create a customizable list of whatever you want. But of course, if you pass in something like this, it will be a list of dynamic and you'll have all the dynamic elements on it that wouldn't allow you to, you know, just have a list of students. You can also have strings over here. And if you have strings, you know, we get a problem we get a problem because if we try to access students at zero, one, two, three, four. So if I have students at four, it shouldn't give me student dot name because string doesn't have a property of name. So yeah, you can go ahead and use if condition over here to check if student is, so this is lets us know what the type is. So if student is a type of student, which is a class. So you're just checking if student variable that we have over here is student or we can just do student dot runtime type 
is equal equal to student that also works so either of them if you just use is student it will automatically think that yeah this is a boolean condition because is allows a boolean condition so if student is student then i want to print student dot name otherwise i can just go ahead and print student because that's not really a student it might be something else like a string like an integer value or it can be a false all right a boolean value so i'm just going to go ahead and have five away run it and we have four away perfectly written no error but if we have student set two it should give me rakesh and it does sweet so we can use if conditions else conditions and you know create a bunch of things that's what the programming language is for you can create customizable things now there is a bunch of more things that list can you know give us list doesn't just allow to you know first add a bunch of elements and then not do anything about it you can just create it first then you can read it but there is a bunch of more operations you can do like add it add an element remove an element insert an element update an element and you know filter some elements and also loop through some elements so let's go over them one by one what if i have a list of student now all right so we are just going to continue on this example so i have a list of student and here what i'm trying to do is add another student so first we had a few students then another student got involved in our class so i just want to update this list so i'll have students now how do i update it should i do students at 0 1 2 3 so i'll do students at 3 or 4 because students at 1 0 1 2 3 if i do 3 that means it will replace the value if i do students at 4 that means i can add a value so if i do students at 4 equal to let's say new kid and then save it obviously it's going to throw an error it throws an error because i'm giving it a string it has a nice type checking saying that this is a list of student give me a student class or instance of a student class so you can just go ahead and create an instance of the student class and then print students again what do you think will happen let's see so you see we get students so we have instance of student class over here and we have 1 2 3 4 four students exactly like we had over here but then i try to do students at 4 e equal to student new kid which says index out of range index should be less than 4 it's basically saying this because students at 4 doesn't exist and it thinks that you're trying to reassign it it doesn't know that you're trying to add a new student it thinks you're trying to reassign so you can do students at 3 which is equal to new kid so that will replace the student sonal class and add student new class now obviously you can't see this because it's continuously giving you instance of student now to avoid this instance of student and just get the proper value of student what we can do is come to the student class and here create an override method which will be string to string and then you're going to create a function basically which says student with something like this all right and now if you run it we get student ravan student naman student rakesh student sonal and here you get student so new kid so we learn something new over here we already know that we have override string to string student name but how could we use override we are not extending anything right how can you use override directly well that's because it's an inbuilt dart thing whenever you have created a class dart has created a two string method on it right so if i just remove this and you know just have students at three dot something we get name which is the name property on it then we get hash code hash code is something related to equality we are not going to discuss about that right now then there is the runtime type then there's two string this two string this runtime this hash code this no such method all of these things are not created by us 
they are created by dart itself when we create a new class so what i'm doing is overriding the existing method that dart has created for us so that it can help me in my program so i've gone ahead and created this override property and that's because dart has already created the student class for us i'm overriding the existing two string property that dart has for us so that i can display the name so that i see the new updated list over here and it's helping me in my program right you can go ahead and do the same thing for let's say one of the other properties mentioned over here but now i still haven't given you the answer i can update the value all right because i replace sonal with new kid but how can i add it because sonal is still in my class i also want new kid to be there so for that we have a bunch of properties on list as well so we have students dot so if you just do this much you get properties just like we had on string there is on list as well just like we had on integer we have on list as well so you can just have students dot add add all any as map cast clear contains we're going to go over some of them let's start with add add allows you to add a student and this is also type safe all right so when you do students dot add it tells you give me a student value you cannot give me a string you cannot give me an integer give me a student so now you can see how generics were used inside of a list right over your abstract class list and you see here they have used e generally people use t but they have used e maybe because t was already used or for some reason but you, as you can see they used a generic over here which implements this and in their implementation they've definitely gone ahead and said that whatever value you mention over here should be the value for all of our methods like add or some other properties like students dot remove reduce all of that stuff so let's go ahead with add and then i'm just going to add student new kid and then i'm going to print students again now i'll run it and we see we get naman rivan naman rakesh sonal but here we get a new student kid what has this done we had a list over here it went ahead and added this new kid to the start of the list or to the end of the list sorry now what if i want to add this at the beginning of the list or let's say at the in the middle of the list how can i do that so for that we have another property or another method called insert add just adds over here insert takes two positional arguments over here one is the index which is int index and then a student here this int index stands for at what position do you want to insert the student's class i want to insert at the beginning right so should i put one no everything starts from zero except length so we are just going to have zero over here which means it will add it over here and push rest of the things after it so we have like this run it and we should see new kid as the first student and there we go we get the first student now if i want to add after naman what will i do i'll just do two run it and then it will be rivan naman new kid rakesh sonal perfect now what if i want to remove a student so i've added new kid but then let's say rivan misbehaves so we want to remove a student class so to do that we'll just have students dot remove we have already seen this method and what do we want to remove we want to remove student rivan right if i can just run it also i need to print students again so that i can see the updated value run it but as you can see it wasn't able to remove the student rivan why is that the case now that's the case because this student rivan class and this student rivan class is a bit different why because this is creating one instance of the class and this is creating another instance of the class so they both are not the same thing these two things are not same these two things are different because they are different instances this is one instance and this is another instance 
so to fix this error what i can do is create final rivan student which is equal to student rivan like this so i'm saving the instance of the student rivan and putting it over here which i can do right now i can just take this rivan student as well and remove it if i do this and run it rivan gets removed so now we have student naman student new kid student rakesh student sonal and rivan is removed so this works because we are trying to access the same instance of the student class but earlier we were creating two separate instances of student class because of which it couldn't identify that yeah these two things are the same things now what if i want to filter some list i want to filter this list based on the marks so what i'm going to do is i have final int marks over here then we are going to have this dot integer taken over here and then we get an error for all our student classes so we can pass 10 20 30 40 50 60 70 80 and when we are updating let's not update it let's just have print students like this and this is not this dot in this dot mark sorry so yeah we've created it this way now what i want to do is i want to fetch all the students with grades above let's say 20 so it can be 20 and more so i want to be able to filter naman rakesh sonal out and remove rivan out of here how can i do that so for that obviously i can go ahead and create some kind of for loop and run it so yeah you're partially correct we can do this what we can do is you know this is my plan first i am going to create a new list of students which will be empty all right why will it be empty because here in this new list of students which will be empty i am going to create or add all the students who have the grades above 10 or 20 sorry then you know i'm just going to run a for loop and we iterate over all the elements inside of the students class and after that i store i check if the grade of one student that we are looping through is greater than 30 if the condition is true so if it is true then i will add the student to my new list and finally i can just print that list outside of the for loop right this is the normal approach we will take so let's go ahead and create a new list of students why are we creating a new list of students because if we try to save students in a new in, in the same list we won't be able to loop through them right it will create some sort of confusion that's why we have filtered students over here which is equal to empty list then i will run a for loop which is for int i is equal to 0 i is less than students dot length we did the same thing for a string as well i just want to run from 0 because my list starts from 0 and i want to run till list dot length and this should be less than students dot length why because see the student length over here is 4 so i'm running from i is equal to 0 so that means 0 till 4 that means i'll run till 0 1 2 and 3 it will not include 4 if i try to include 4 it will give me an index range error why because student at 4 doesn't exist student at 3 exists now i can just have i plus plus then i can just have filtered students dot let's say add and what do i want to add well i just want to add students at i right i don't want to put in any specific number over here i don't don't want to add students at 2 that would mean i continuously add rakesh in the filtered students no here i want to add students at i whatever student we are looping through but as of now we are adding all the students to filtered students we have not passed in any if condition so we want to add an if condition checking if student at i dot marks is greater than 
or we can have greater than equal to 20 otherwise it wouldn't include numen i want to include numen as well and then i can just have filter students dot add students at i so we have grabbed the current student that we are looping through then we have dot marks so it gives me 10 20 30 40 and then i'm just checking if it is greater than or equal to 20. if it is greater than or equal to 20 then we are adding it to filtered students and then i'm printing filtered students and i don't need to be concerned that it will give me an instance of student class because we have the override method over here neat now i can run this and i should be seeing student rivan naman rakesh and here we have student naman rakesh to sonal because rivan only scored 10. what if rivan scores 30 and we run it so we get rivan included as well so now we have 10 and yeah, this is how you would do it, right? But what if I tell you there are two neater approaches you could take. One is the foreign loop that I talked about. I told you in the loop section that we are going to cover something known as foreign loop where we go to list. So that's what we are going to cover here. Here, instead of having all of this int i, what if I directly get access to the student over here? So what if I loop over this? But while looping, I directly get access to the student class. So I can just have final student in students. This is the syntax for it. We have a for loop. Then we create a variable using final student. Then we are having in because it is a foreign loop. You can think of it this way. This is a foreign loop. So we are having in keyword right here. Students. So that means I directly get access to a student class or student instance. Now I can just have if student.marks is greater than or equal to 20, then filtered students.add student. And if we run, it will give us the same output. What just happened in this foreign loop? Well, we are just saying run a for loop for every student in students. And here we have created a variable using final student. You can also have for student student or variable student but you cannot have integer student because it knows we are looping through a list of students you cannot have integer over here so the type checking is there so this was another approach we could take and foreign loop just makes this easier whenever you don't have to access you know specifically i so you don't want to get access to index at all and you just care about you know what we are looping through for example the student object over here you can just use the foreign loop you don't have to go through the hassle of having foreign ties equal to zero and all of that stuff because it introduces an unnecessary variable and it can be a bit tough to you know continuously access students at i students at i so a foreign loop is a neat thing but what if i told you in this case, we could go one step ahead and not use foreign loop as well. So what we have is not even a list over here. What we can have is just use the students list and filter it out. So what we're going to do is students and search for a method over here, which can do this. Add basically says it will add it. Add all basically takes in an iterable. Iterable is kind of like a list, but it loads lazily by loads lazily i mean if you have students created over here all of those get instantiated over here but if you have an iterable of students which you can have like this okay it doesn't give us any error nothing at all but that just means all of these instances won't get created right there and then it will only get created when we access a particular instance of the iterable over here and it gives us almost the same method that list had to give us. But you cannot add, you cannot, let's say, remove, you cannot do all of that stuff. Now coming back to the filtering option, how do I filter that stuff out? So to filter it, students have one of the methods over here, which is where, all right? If you see where, now this where, gives us an iterable again which is iterable of student and then this is how it's defined boolean function student test what is this thing right here 
well it's basically telling that the students dot where function that you call has an argument inside of it that it gives us which is student so we're kind of looping through it all right so we are looping through it because of which it gives me student class because this is a list of student it gives me a student instance and here it expects me to return something so it expects a function out of me so i can either have this or i can just have this and here i can put a condition and this condition is for my filtering so i can just have if the student dot marks is greater than equal to 20 then you know just add it to the list that's what it does and if i do this much will i get rivan removed out of here not exactly why is that the case well that's the case because if you come over here where returns an i triple of student if where returns an i triple of student it's giving us something like a list returned to us it's not like students dot add where the return type is void if you see over here students dot add is void that means it doesn't return anything if it doesn't return anything it's probably because it's already added to the list but when we have students dot where it gives me a new list a new i triple and that i triple consists of student classes so if i just print final filtered students which is equal to this now i copy this filtered students print it over here and run it i get student naman student rakesh and student sonal rivan is removed but this is no longer a list this is an i triple if you don't believe me just check its runtime type all right run it and this is where i triple student and if you just hover over this i triple students i don't want an i triple i want a list so to do that what you can do is print fi filtered students dot and then you can convert it to a list by just having two lists like this and if you do this much you will get a new student list and updated student list and this solution is so much prettier than you know running through so many steps it saves a lot of time for us and it's much more readable how is it much more readable let's go with th this in english so we are getting a fi filtered students and how are we getting the filtered students where we are fi going through all the students where student dot marks is greater than 20 right we are going through a list of students where student dot marks is greater than 20 and then it saves it in filtered students and we're converting it to a list and printing it out over here we can do all of this in one single variable we can just have students is equal to students dot where but it gives us an error because i triple can can't be assigned to a list so i can just convert this to a list as well run it and i'll get the same output so we didn't have to create separate variables for it i could just reassign and print the students so that it gives me the same output so that's where where helps us to filter things out gives us an iterable which can be converted to a list so we are almost done with lists so here let's take a look at a few more methods that list has to provide so we'll have students dot we know what length means it will just give us the length of the list reversed that means it will give us the list that is reversed that means sonal will come first raki is second naman third and rivan fourth if you don't believe me i would recommend you to just have two lists over here just print it out like this all right if you just have this done and run it first you should see naman rivan like this and then sonal rakesh naman rivan like this great now let's take a look at other properties that we have so we have students dot first so it gives me the first element first or null so if the first element is null it will give me null indexed is empty is empty is quite useful it helps you to know is the if the list is empty or not if the list dot length is zero that means it is empty it is not empty if list dot length is not zero then we have iterator which gives us the i triple form of this then we have last which gives us the last element of the list last or null 
similar to we had what we had first on null then we have add add all add all basically allows us to pass an i triple over here by i triple it doesn't necessarily mean that yeah you need to go ahead and pass i triple over here no you can just pass in another list over here because i triple can take in a list but a list cannot be an i triple all right and you can add multiple uh, list elements over here all right and obviously this needs to be a student class so go ahead and add student classes so it will add all of those student classes together and add will obviously add them at the end then we have as map so it converts it into a map what is a map you might ask and that's what we are going to take a look at in just a minute after we have gone through some of the important functions in list so we have clear which clears off the list you know it just makes it empty removes all of the elements inside of a list then we have contains and this is also important contains is basically like used in if conditions it gives us a boolean value and it checks so if student contains you know student rivan with grade 10 then you can do something so it helps us to know whether the list contains an element and this contains is basically like running a for loop and then checking inside so this contains prop method is created by dart inside which is like hey we will run a for loop and check every element with the element that is passed in the parameter over here and then we have a bunch of methods like index of basically if you want to find index of a particular student class or student instance you can do that then we have first where and last where so if you have first where it basically means that when we run the where filter and if there are duplicate elements inside of a list so we can have list sonal 30 40 like this how many ever we want or these things are different right because they are different instances of class what if i have final sonal student here which is equal to this thing right here okay so i can have multiple sonal students over here i cannot just have one okay i'm allowed to have as many as i want so it's basically telling me students dot first where will find and return only the first student it finds matching to the condition you've passed in and similar to that is last where so it will give you a student instance which follows the condition that you've passed in over here but it's the last thing so it will give me this sonal student then we have remove at so if you want to remove at a particular index then we have remove which we have already seen remove last which removes the last element and all of these things are english you know you can just understand that by your own but element at gives me the element at a particular index and index of gives me the index of a particular student all right so these two things are reverse of each other so we have looked in uh, at a lot of list methods so now that we've covered list i quickly want to cover sets because sets is quite similar to a list remember how in a list we can have multiple type of students you know all these three things are the same student sonal student sonal student sonal however what if i don't want the same students to exist over here to do that i can create a set so i can just name this as a set instead of student and that gives me an error because sets are not defined like this this is how lists are defined for a set you need to use curly bracket so you can have curly bracket like this and it doesn't give you an any error anymore but rivan you said it cannot contain multiple type of students right i mean it cannot contain the same student again and again how is it not giving us an error then well it's because if we just print students out now and run it we get student ravan student naman student rakesh student sonal and that's it all the rest of the sonal students are not counted anymore so it just removes all the duplicate elements inside of a list that's what a set is it removes all the existing same elements if we do the same thing with list and then we'll have to convert this to a square bracket and run it we have sonal student like this rest everything is similar to a list 
but set just removes all the existing elements that are same in a list what if i want to convert a list to a set so that you know i can remove it but still i want to keep it a list how can i do that well you can just do it using to set okay so if you just do, do to set and run it it will remove all the existing student zonal classes except the one that was already there okay so that was about set and list the difference is just that set cannot have the same elements again and list can have so it's quite useful if you want to filter out all the existing zonal students so you don't have to run where conditions again and again you can just have to set it will remove everything great so now that we've understood about list and sets we need to run into maps let's get into it so what exactly is this map thing a map is a collection of key value pairs where each key is unique so let me show you how it looks so map looks kind of like this you have a thing like this you know curly bracket then you have a key so you have a key and a value for that key then you can have key 2 and a value for it which can be value or value 2 so the key needs to be unique over here but value can be the same or different that doesn't matter so it's a key value pair this is how it looks like it's this map thing is commonly used to store and retrieve data based on a specific identifier so let's take an example earlier we had seen how we created a list of marks to store one user's marks right what if i want to store multiple students marks and these marks are just based on one subject all right so in list i would do something like final list which is equal to and i would store the marks so we have 10 15 30 now how do i know that this is rivan's marks this is naman's marks or this is another kid's marks i cannot know but map can allow me to know it how i can rewrite this entire structure as this so we have a map then we have marks which will be equal to this curly bracket thing that i told you this is used to create a map yes this is also used to create a set but in set you only have one elements written over here but in map it's different because map is a key value pair so here you'll have the name so let's say the name is rivan and rivan marks is 10 naman marks is 15 and other kids marks is 30 so this is how you've created a map now we know exactly what student has got what value we don't have to depend on this right and then to know which student has scored what marks we can just have print marks and you know if we do this we'll get this entire thing printed out you can run it and see it but i just want to get rivan's marks so to do this again we are going to use this square bracket operator just like we did for map uh, for list for string we are going to use that as well but here instead of specifying any position or anything else what we are going to have is the key present over here so i can just pass in rivan here whatever is the key and then run it so if i run it i should be seeing 10 now because that's rivan's marks and there we go we see that however now if you hover over this you see this is of the type map dynamic dynamic so in our generics we have two data types first one and second one both are dynamic why is that the case we've already seen this with the list when we didn't specify anything for a list you know if we just had list like this it was list of dynamic the same thing happened here but instead of having one generic type over here we have two because this one is for the key and the second one is for the value so this dynamic is for this thing right here and this dynamic is for this thing right here so we can change this what will i change this to i will have string comma integer if i do this i have map which is having string over here and integer over here now since we have mentioned the types over here if i do dot i should be getting everything interrelated if we just remove this we won't get anything interrelated no auto suggestion for this why 
because here we have specified int so it knows that if i do max at revan so if i call max add the key revan then it's going to give me a value of 10 and we know that this is going to be an integer that's why it's going to be an integer so we can just have is even let's say so we'll get to know if it is even or not and then we can run it but you can see we're getting an error we're getting an error because the property is even can't be unconditionally accessed because the receiver can be null it means that this thing right here can return a nullable integer so we either need to do this if we are confident that Rivan surely exists or we can just do this so that if the key doesn't exist it will give us a null value and it won't throw null operator null check operator used on a null value now you might ask why do we get an integer which is nullable returned over here if we are just passing an integer here we are not passing int like this right we are just passing int so so it shouldn't give us a nullable integer and you're partially correct it shouldn't but there's a benefit when it receive when it sends out integer which is nullable for example if i have a key that doesn't exist in this map for example i put in sonal over here this key doesn't exist and if i just do this like this you know if the nullable operator wasn't there then it would give me something like uncaught type error cannot read properties of null all right so it's basically like the hey we try to get marks at so null but this key doesn't exist here so there's no value for it if there's no value how are you saying that yeah this thing is not null that's why we can put question mark here and that's why it, re it returns to us an integer which can be nullable because if a key doesn't exist it is going to return null to us so yeah we can go ahead here and have the extra check like if marks at so null is equal equal to null then let's say i want to print key does not exist otherwise i'm just going to print let's say print marks at so null all right so with this nice type checking i can just do marks at so null dot is even all right and we can put an exclamation mark here we can put an exclamation mark because we have already checked if marks at so null is null then it's going to pre print key key does not exist but it it is not null that means it's going to print marks at so null so we can for sure know that this is not going to be null right so now i can run it and there we go we have key does not exist however if i put naman here and naman here and then run it i should be seeing false because 15 is not an even number so i hope that was clear now let's get into the operations map allow us to do also you can have something else like map string comma string so that means you'll have to convert everything to a string over here then it can be map int string so that means it can be 10 20 and let's say 30 you can even do this all right so you can have anything over here even your classes so you can have map int student and then you can pass in your student class over here and that will work just fine so i hope you understood this you can pass in any type you want now let's get into the operations like adding a map removing from a map iterating over the map so we can just have those operations really quick so to add to a map we can do marks add let's say i want to add to 40 equal to 200 so what i've done the way we print it i can do marks at 40 and set it equal to a string however if i try to assign it to an integer it will give an error to me because we have specified the data type for a map and if i save this and of course let's go ahead and print marks we should be seeing 10 20 30 along with 40 added and there we go 10 10 20 15 now all of them look similar like it all looks integer but when we print it it just feels like that in reality it's int and string all right and you can see the new value is added over here perfect if we had a string over here you'll have to pass in a string like this convert this to a string and you know 
that's how you can do it. So this is how you can change in a map. There's another method you can take. For example, like if you remember in a list, if we try to do list at 0, 1, 2, 3. So if we try to do list at 3 equal to, let's say, 45, it would give an error to us. But in map, this is allowed. Also, you can update the value the same way. So you can have marks at 10 equal to 100, let's say. And then you can print marks again and you should be seeing 100 in the beginning. And that's what we get. Perfect. So you can update and add new values just like this. It just checks if marks at 10 already exists, then it is not going to create a new key value pair. However, if it does exist, then it's just going to update the value over there. And yes, you cannot have two keys of the same value. And I've already mentioned that before. You can see two keys in a map literal shouldn't be equal. Now there's another way of adding marks. And that is by doing marks dot. You know, list had its own bunch of methods and properties. Even map has that because map is a class. And if you come over here, you can see it's an abstract class map K V. So it's the same thing. So we can not instantiate map. However, we can have marks dot and a bunch of properties on it. And to add a map, you can see we have the add all property. We can just use that. And in the add all, it requires us to pass map of int and string. So the exact same thing that you have over here, you need to pass that in. So I'm just going to pass in, let's say 40 comma 45. And the advantage add all has over the other thing that we saw, like marks at 40, is that you can pass in a bunch of maps together. So you can have 50, 65, you can have 70 and let's say hello. You can have all of them together in one single map that you pass in over here. And then when you run it, it will work. Also, you can also if you found this very, you can say a weird kind of syntax, you can just extract all of this out in another map, which will be equal to this and then you can pass in the map and that will work just fine. It's just like, you know, creating another variable and storing it. So no big deal there. So this is how you can add. If I want to remove something, what I can do is marks dot remove. And you see, this doesn't ask me to pass in a map. It can be an object. And here you just need to mention a key and the key is let's say 10. I just want to remove this part of here. So you can just do marks dot remove. 10. You don't care about the value. To add a value, you need to pass in a value. But to remove, you just need the key. And you pass in a key. And then when you run it, it shouldn't show 10 here anymore. And there we go. We don't have 10. It starts from 20. So we have learned about adding, deleting, and updating values. Now let's go through iterating. Meaning, I want to loop over all of these things. So for that, we already know we have something known as for loop. We can just use that over here. So we can just have for int i is equal to zero, i is less than marks.length. Let's just remove another map. We are not doing any calculations over here. i plus plus, and this works. Marks.length is a valid thing on map as well. And the length it will give us is three. So this one entry is known as a map. And now we can just, you know, go ahead and print marks at i, right? If we do marks at i, will that work? Not really, because what you're basically telling is print marks at zero. So it goes ahead and searches for the key zero. Is there a zero where you're no? It's just going to print out null. So if you want, you can go ahead and run this and you'll see null three times written over here. Perfect exactly what we expected. So how do we read a value on a map? So for that, we have access to marks dot keys. And if you see this keys is an iterable. Why is this an iterable? Because this keys is giving us access to all the keys that are present in the map in kind of a list format. 
all right iterable is not exactly a list but obviously you can go ahead and convert this to a list so that you have a list with you so anyways coming back to the point it's just giving me a list of like 10 20 and 30 so if i go ahead and print this now i'll see 10 20 30 in a list printed three times and that's what i get now to access the property over here or to access one key over here what i can do is marks.keys at i if i do that much it doesn't work why because it is an iterable if i use this over an iterable it won't work so i need to convert this to a list so that we can get access to this thing now we have converted it into a list so we can access the zeroth element the first element and the second element now we should be seeing 10 20 30 written over here so we've got access to all the keys now what if i want to get access to the values as well so i can run another for loop over here and print it but what i want to do is print all of them in the same line so to do that what i can do is string interpolation i can just put a string over here cover it with curly bracket then put dollar because this is a big thing so we have a key and then we are going to have a value so to get the value again we are going to put dollar braces and then we are going to have marks dot keys dot two list but if i use keys again will that give me these values that i want not really it will give me again these values because we'll do the same thing so now we'll have marks dot values dot two list because that will be an iterable as well. And then we are going to have i over here. And now if I run it, we will see 10, 10, 50, 20, 15 and 30, 30. So we are able to get the value of each map's keys and values. Now an easier solution to this could be using a for each loop that is present inside marks map only. So we can do marks dot and if you scroll down, you will see something known as for each or a map. So if you do marks.map, you'll be able to map through it, meaning you'll be able to loop through every entry that is present over here. But I'm just going to use for each because that is going to give me a cool thing. So I can just have for each over here. And if you see the for each function definition this is how it looks we have void so it doesn't return anything then we have a function which returns an integer and a string why is there an integer and a string because our key is an integer our value is a string so it's basically returning key and value to us so we can just have this much done and this is a function obviously so we are going to have this or you can have a single arrow I'm just going to have this because it looks neater and then I can have key. Let's have string interpolation here and then value and value is not defined because here I've defined it as val. So you're going to have value like this. And then if I run it, I get the same result, but this is much neater solution because dot has done this for us behind the scenes. So we don't need to care about, you know, running for loops and stuff. Another thing to note here is I've not mentioned the type, but it is correctly identifying the type because for each is giving us integer and string. So it knows that, yeah, this thing is an integer. This thing is a string, but yeah, we need to give variable names to this so that we can access it on code editors, like, you know, visual studio code or anything that we will use in the flutter section, you'll see that we get autocomplete for whenever we type for each function, it will automatically generate those variables and values for us, which we can obviously change, but it saves a lot of time for us. This is an advantage of using code editors instead of dot pad because dot pad is frankly not much advanced. You cannot do a lot of stuff here. For example, the file system is not present here. So now we have understood about marks and we have understood about maps and where we would want to use a list where we want to use a map. Both are different things, not to be confused. This list is like an array list and this map is like a hash map in Java or like an object in JavaScript. But object in Dart 
is different from object in JavaScript. I hope that makes sense. If not, because you've not coded in JavaScript, don't worry about it. It's just extra information so that people who know it can follow along well. So we have covered maps as well, but I just want to take this opportunity and expand on the concept of maps further by using list of map. What if I want my list to have a list of maps? All right. So this thing right here is suppose marks of one student. All right. So we are going to have map of string comma integer and here this is math marks. This is English marks and this is let's say computer science marks and math. I got 20 and English. I got 20 and in CS I got 20. So I'm an excellent student. So I got all of these values, but these are marks of just one student. What if I want to store marks of several students? So this is marks of user A. I want to store marks of user B, C, D, E as well. So for that, what can I do? I can create separate maps. That's true, but I just want to store them in one particular list so that I can continuously access that list instead of accessing these variables. So for that, we can have list of map of string comma int. And you can do this. Why can you do this? Because list allows you to pass in any type. In map also, you can pass a list over here. And in a list, you can pass a map over here. All this wants is a type. And this type can be classes, maps, lists, sets, whatever you want. So here we have a list of map string comma integer. So now we are going to store marks of all student and this is going to be equal to a list. So we have created it this way. Let's push the console behind and for readability, I'm just going to go to the next line. So we have a list of map. So I've created a map and here I'm just going to pass in, let's say math marks, which is 25, then CS marks which is 30 and English marks, which is 15. Oh, I think our grading is out of 20. So let's put 20, 20 over here and English is bad. So we are getting 15. Now we can put a comma over here since this is a list. So what we have right now is a map. Now I can create another map over here. So I can just copy paste this and here I'll have, let's say math, CS, English, the same keys but the values are different. So in CS, we got 15, math got 10. And finally, the last map over here is marks user at A. All right, so our excellent student comes right over here. And if you see marks dot for each is giving us an error because marks is now a list. It is not a map, so you cannot run for each over here. So what can I do? I can just have marks dot map. So this is one function which I didn't show you in list. So you can use this marks.map function. This map is basically iterating all of these list elements. So you can use it. And when you do this, you get, let's say E and this E thing right here is a map of string comma integer. It correctly identifies that if you map through it, you'll get a map of string comma integer, this thing right here, or this thing right here or this thing right here, because this is marks user A. So I can go ahead and print E, run it, and we get nothing printed out over here. Why? Because this is an iterable. I told you iterable have lazy loading. You can see this, it returns a new lazy iterable with elements. Now what I can do instead is convert this to a list. All right, so we can convert an iterable to a list, right? The map gives us an iterable. I've converted that iterable to a list. And then when I run it, we get math at 20 and all of these stuff automatically printing out because list is not lazy loading An iterator or an iterable is lazy loading. I hope it makes sense to you now what I mean by lazy loading. So you see, we get all of our maths and CS and English marks correctly. However, what I want to do is map through the ma map as well and you know just print out all the values over here so i can just have e dot 
and just what we saw we are going to run it we are going to have e dot for each so let's have for each right here then we are going to get a key and a value which we can print out so let's print dollar key then dollar val and that's pretty much it now when i try to run it i get math 20 cs 20 english 15 math 10 cs 15 english 15 math 20 and all the values are showing up and there are nine values which is correctly so because there are three maps and they, all of them have three entries which is nine great so i hope you've understood the use cases for a list and a map so our topic is now enums it is a comparatively short topic but it's quite interesting and has many use cases that people don't know about let's get into it so to understand enums or what they are called as enumerations we'll have to first create an example so let's go ahead and create a class called employee and this employee class is going to have two things inside of it first it is going to have the name of the employee and second it's going to have the type of the employee so the type of work the employee is doing and then we can have employee this dot name this dot type all right now we can go ahead and create employee one which is equal to employee but then the name will be let's say Rivan, and the type is going to be let's say software engineer so i'm just passing in swe then we can have another thing here so let's paste it again and this is going to be employee 2 and naman and let's say he's related to finance department so we only have two employees as of now but then a third employee comes in and the third employee passes in the name correctly but then the type is open-ended right there's no limited constraints from which the employee can choose so they just go ahead and use something like ha 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 so they're just playing with our program since we've kept this as a string they can enter anything over here which is a string and we'll be fine with it but in reality we are not fine with it because the user or the employee cannot just have ha 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 written over here either they have to be in software engineering finance marketing or something like that our company doesn't have a position or an employee type of ha 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 so this is the problem that i'm facing and enums help solve this problem they help us create kind of boundaries in our application because they will help us to improve the code quality obviously because we are limiting what our strings can be over here and they also prevent bugs and things that are very error prone for example this part right here because if the type is ha 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 it can cause problem when you're trying to you know print some stuff for example if you have a function over here so we have let's say void function which has switch type and then you have case of software engineering so you manually have to first of all type these strings and make sure all of those are same and then you have software engineering written over here then after that you again need to make sure that finance is correctly spelled and then you can print finance let's say and finally you have let's say default meaning none of the cases matched over here so you have a print saying something went wrong this default case should never be executed in our case because this ha 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 isn't a valid thing right and we want a proper detail of our employee they cannot have something went wrong either it should be software engineer or finance nothing else so this is what enum will help us to do to create an enum you need to get out of a class you need to get out of a function and you need to globally declare it in your program and then you can just have employee type even here the casing is similar to a class it's going to be pascal casing so e and t are big capitalized and here we need to mention the boundaries or the options that we have here so what are the options the employee can have I either employee can be software engineer 
and make sure that this is you know all small case if you try to put it like this the linter will throw an error or a warning saying the constant name software engineering isn't lower case camel case identifier so you need to put swe over here then you have finance then let's say you have marketing so these are the three things that you have in your enum all right so that's how easy an enum is now you can replace this employee type everywhere so instead of using a string you can have employee type over here which gives us an error in the switch case and even over here so let's first fix this part so here it requires something known as let's say employee type right so to pass in an employee type we'll have to first pass in employee type like this so is this enough not really because then we have to put dot and that gives a bunch of options finance marketing and software engineering values is basically a list containing all these three things in our case we want software engineering for the first guy then we can let's say copy this paste it over here and this time i want finance and this time sonal is actually employee type dot marketing so software engineering finance and this is marketing now we are doing some good work now i don't have to care about you know typing the strings correctly in fact i can just do employee type dot swe and i'm sure that this is correct because if i spell this incorrectly it will throw an error so if employee type is software engineering we print software engineering if employee let's say type is finance then we print finance and if it's none of these two things then definitely it is marketing because the user cannot enter any of this also if you just ignore the default case you see we get an error over here why do we get an error because it's saying the employee type is not exhaustively matched by the switch cases since it doesn't match employee type dot marketing this is just meaning that hey you forgot to put a case of employee type dot marketing please put that so that's a nice thing that we get with enums it's not possible with strings because how many cases can you handle right cases with strings can be literally anything you want so we have case then employee type dot marketing or you can just put default and then you print marketing so that's good now the error goes away and if i just print let's say employee one dot let's say fn actually i shouldn't print it because i'm already printing it in the function itself right over here we are not returning anything from this function we are printing it so we can do this this will be employee 3 so let's call employee 3 dot function as well let's run it and we should be seeing software engineering and marketing and that's exactly what we see so enum is basically providing us with code clarity and is helping us to avoid and fight bugs in the first place so this was the basic type of enum and this is what most of the people use but dart has gone beyond just enum so enums are more like classes now all right So let's say you wanted to pass some values along with these things, right? So you have software engineering, finance, marketing. You want to pass a credit score with it, or let's say the salary each employee gets if they are either of these three things. So to do that, we have something known as enhanced enums that were introduced newly, not in Dart 3.0 or 3.0.1. They were introduced after Dart 2, I think. so to do that what we can do is put a semicolon here all right after you put a semicolon after this you can just go to a new line and then have final integer let's say salary all right so you've declared a variable over here but this variable is not like you know final salary is equal to 150000 like this it's not like this in fact it's like a constructor so you have constant 
employee type this dot salary so now we have created a constructor for this enum which is employee type and we get an error over here we get errors over here because it's basically saying that hey you've created an constructor if you've created a constructor that means you need to pass in the values of this employee type for every single one of them that means i'll have to do software engineering like this and pass in the salary of software engineer let's say 200000 then of the finance guy so let's say 250000 and the marketing guy which is let's say 150000 so the errors get resolved and now the benefit of having this is if i want to print the money each employee makes so if it's software engineering then i want to print type dot and if you'd see we get type dot salary this type is the employee type that was passed in from here so i can use this type to have type dot salary index name and rest of the things we've already seen for every class every enum that we create so the salary is now added over here because it's a field in an enum. Now we can access the salary of every single one of them. So we can just have type dot salary for each one of them like this. And actually we don't want to do switch case anymore. You can just have print type dot salary. If you just do this much, it will print out the salary of your employee, right? Why to do switch case? Because in switch case, you're basically returning type dot salary every single time. Instead, we can just remove all of this and print type dot salary once and for all, because you're not doing any specialized task for every single one of them. Okay. So let's just print type dot salary here, run it. And we should be seeing 200,000, which is the software engineering and 150,000, which is marketing. Great. So I just wanted to show you that you can have many more arguments for this constructor, for this enum constructor, I should say, and then you can use it over here. Also, you can use type dot name. Let's convert this into string interpolation. So we have dollar type dot name. If you use type dot name, then we'll have software engineering and then if we try to run it we get software engineering this marketing this but as you can see we are getting a warning over here that this thing right here type dot name is available since sdk 2.15 but constraints 3.0.1 which is this version don't guarantee it so we should probably stop using it now there are many more things you can do with enum for example you can have implements and you can implement another enum with it and you can do all of that stuff but i'm not diving into it you can try it on your own so now we are done with enums as well now let's get into the world of exception handling and it's really simple so let's complete it really quick so what exactly is exception handling as the name suggests over here exception is being handled now what exactly is an exception so I'm not going to give you a definition for this. I'm just going to show you what exception is and you've seen it before. So when I try to print 10 truncating division, let's say two or three, I should be getting three. What exactly is this? It tries to divide 10 by three. So it gives 3.33 and then it converts it to an integer. So we get three that's truncating division. Now, if I try to do 10 divided by zero, it should give me infinity, right? Because 10 divided by zero is infinity. Then I try to do 10 truncating division zero. And then I want to print the most important thing in my program, which is my name. So it's fine if this result or this result or this result doesn't get printed, but Ravan should get printed. But yeah, if everything is fine, then print all of this and Ravan should be down below. Now, if I try to run it, I get three, I get infinity, and then I go get this error. And because of this error thing right here, I cannot see my name printed. That's just very bad because the most important element in my program, my name 
isn't there and it's not there because an error came along and this error that you see right here is an exception and we want to handle this exception how we are just telling that it's fine if it doesn't get printed but rest of the program should continue working if there's an exception it doesn't mean that yeah you just stop running at all you just exit out of this no right now the program just got out of this it threw an error over here unsupported operation and just terminated this entire function this entire program saying there's an error i cannot go further now that's where exception handling will come into play we need to resolve this error such that rest of the things still continue working so how do we handle exceptions first of all this exception handling technique is only used for things like this all right or if you are calling an external service to get some data for example if you're calling your database then you can have the exception handling done if you're having this kind of thing right here you can have exception handling done but if there's some logical error in your app let's say you print rivan 12 so you're just wondering why is this printing rivan 12 i just wanted to print rivan that's an error right i should just handle my exceptions over here no it doesn't work that way it can only handle exceptions which are basically runtime exceptions and you can't possibly know that yeah this thing right here can throw an exception so wherever you feel that this might throw an exception something like this you can handle it but not for something like rivan 12 where you obviously know that this error is there because rivan is there this is still possible because let's say the numbers entered over here are by the user right and if the user enters zero we cannot do anything about it yes we can put if conditions and check hey the user cannot enter zero or whatever but an exception handling is just a neater way of doing stuff so to start with exception handling first you need to have a try block so this thing right here try and then you need to have a catch block and this catch block gives us something known as e which stands for exception okay now you just copy this code inside of the try block so this code that you need to put in try block is whatever you feel that can throw an exception so this part of code can throw an exception so you wrap it in a try block and then you have a catch block if you don't have a catch block after try block it will give you an error because a try block must be followed by an on catch or finally clause we are going to take a look at all three of them but first let's go over the catch block so we have catch over here and this catch gives us something known as an exception now i can just print this exception to know what just happened all right and that's exactly what exception handling is as easy as uh, you can see so if i try to run it what do i see i see 3 i see infinity i see unsupported operation the same error that we got earlier but instead of red it is white why because we've printed e over here instead of e if we printed some error occurred and run it we will be seeing 3 infinity some error occurred then rivan so the main point over here is after this thing right here through an error my program didn't stop working because i've handled the exception i've introduced exception handling over here because of which i get some error occurred written over here and after that my print statement is still working and other codes might still work over here so that's catch block now there's another block after catch that we can use which is finally so this finally block that always executes all right even if this thing right here doesn't throw an exception so if we just have 10 divided by 0 again and then you know we try to run this now print some error occurred will not happen what will happen is this print here will get called so infinity will be there and rivan will get called what this finally does is if there is a try block that was executed or the catch block that was executed it doesn't care finally just cares about you know that i just want to run every single time 
so we just have finally block executed all right now if we just do this you'll see that we get infinity uh, sorry three infinity infinity then finally block is executed so this thing right here is executed even if try block is executed so let's have our exception again even if the catch block is executed so it will just print this every single time so this thing right runs every single time this block right here is optional but allows us to specify code that will always execute regardless of whether the exception occurs or it doesn't occur so it is typically used for cleanup tasks or releasing resources in try block or catch block or whatever so this was the thing that we were talking about, you know, when we didn't have catch block over here, you saw like this, it said that ne there needs to be on catch or finally. And the final thing that is on, so this on is used so that we can catch a particular exception. So there are multiple types of exceptions right there. As you can see, format exception implements exception and exception might be an abstract class. So if we just use on exception, you can see abstract interface class, which means it is a proper interface. And we've already studied about this in class modifiers. We print E. Now, if this runs, what should we get? Should we get unsupported error or an error occurred? We get an error occurred over here because the type of the exception is unsupported exception error, not exception or format exception so this thing right here so on basically allows us to catch some kind of exception all right and this exception can be things that are classes already created in dart so it can be format exception exception and a bunch of other exceptions that you can find if you just google it out so i hope you're clear with try catch block they are quite an important concept when we learn about futures Futures are one of the most interesting things in Dart because they're not available in any other programming language. Or actually, they are available in other programming languages like JavaScript, but they're named as promises. So we are going to learn about futures now and there we can use try catch block where it will make much more sense. Right now you might just think, hey, if I know that this thing, this operator right here can have an exception, why do I have to do this? With futures, that's not the case because in futures, you'll be contacting external APIs, right? If you're contacting external APIs or you can say external services, if you don't understand what API is, if you're contacting external services, that might be a problem because when you contact external services, you don't know if this will run or this will not run because when you contact external services, it's not just dependent on your code. It's also dependent on your internet connection, your internet stability, right? If your internet is off and then you try to make a request, that wouldn't work. Why will it not work? Because I'm trying to connect to something outside of my program. If I try to do that, obviously I need to go ahead and, you know, get some data to get the data. I'll have to use the internet connection. So that's why futures use exception handling extensively. So let's go ahead and understand what futures are. So what exactly is this future? This future is basically a class that represents that a function or some computation may complete in the future. And this will produce a result or an error. It is related to something known as asynchronous programming. Asynchronous programming allows you to perform tasks concurrently without blocking the execution. So for example, if we have multiple print statements here, so let's have print hey, then we have print let's say hello and we have print greetings. Alright, so we have three print statements over here. How are they going to execute? First hey is going to get printed, then hello, then greetings. So only after hey gets printed will hello print and only after hello gets printed will greetings print. So this is an example of blocking the execution, meaning these tasks aren't being performed concurrently. So how this works is hello gets printed only after hello gets printed will hey get printed and only after hey gets printed greetings will get printed. However, 
this will take some time right and it is fine when we have print statements or something like that but what if we are talking to an external service to get our data right so how will that work in that case so let's say instead of this print we are sending a request to an external service so that we can get back some data and you might ask what is this external service let's take an example of jasonplaceholder.com this thing provides us with fake api api here stands for application programming interface it's basically how two services can interact with each other so you have if i have my dart application over here and i want to get some data from external service i can use something known as an api so to get some data from json placeholder i can use this free fake api that they give for testing and prototyping and if i just do slash users after this url i get a bunch of things over here and i get all of this in some form of an edited format because i'm using the extension because i'm using an extension in chrome which is json formatter and that just prints it out in a json format and json stands for javascript object notation it's basically a way in which data is retrieved another way is yaml which you will see in your flutter but basically it gives us data in json format which is javascript object notation and it's kind of similar to a list of map in dart right so if you have this list we have one map over here then there's string over here a number over here string over here a string again over here so this means it is a list of map of string comma dynamic right because this is a string all the time but this can either be a string this can either be a number it can be anything so that's why here it is compulsory to use dynamic otherwise it will give us an error because id is a number not a string so anyways i want to fetch all of this data that it's returning so suppose i send out a request and in some time we are going to learn how to send a request but let's just say this comment here is helping us to send a request so that would mean it sends a request from dart pad to this api then it retrieves all the data from here and sends it back to dart pad so that i can continue but if i do this you know it might take a lot of time that means a request is sent so we wait for that request to complete so it might take like 10 15 20 seconds then only hello and greetings will print i don't want that that is kind of a blocking behavior right and that's why we have asynchronous programming that allows me to run the tasks without blocking anything so what happens over here is i will send a request and while it is sending the request i'm just going to go ahead and print hello and greetings so it doesn't wait for this request to you know complete and then only move forward this request will keep running and you know whenever it has a value it will print it out but in the meantime it's going to go ahead and perform all the operations so that's what asynchronous programming is just the print statements over here that we had before like print hey that was synchronous programming and this is asynchronous programming so i hope you've understood this concept well now let's move ahead and dive into futures so let's take an example i have a function over here and this function's job is to give a result let's say after 2 seconds okay give a result after 2 seconds that's what it does now to convert this into a future what will i do and actually since i'm giving a result let's convert this into a string so i'm going to be returning a string okay and now we are getting this error because it wants to return a string but we are not returning a string but we look into that now how do i convert this into a future because it's giving me a result after 2 seconds if it is giving me a result after 2 seconds i do not want to wait for it because then my user has to wait for it and that's not a good experience at all so what i'm going to do is put a keyword here called async async here stands for asynchronous right so i've put async here and then the error comes over here this says the functions marked async must have a return type assignable to future so that means i'll have to convert this to a future okay but 
if i hover over this this is abstract interface class future of the type t this is again generics and if i just return a future that means it is of the type future dynamic just like we had before with lists and map i don't want to do that so i'm just going to have string returned over here that means this function is asynchronous function it's going to take some time to execute and as soon as it executes and 2 seconds is over and it gives me a result and the result can be either an error or you can say a proper value then i want to return it and if it is a proper value then it's going to return a string right so i can just return hey and that's exactly what a future function is as simple as that we just need to convert this to async and when we convert this to async we have future over here if i remove async i cannot put future like this that will give me an error because i'm returning a string from a future string over here however what you can do instead is future like this you can wrap this with a future and then return a string so you have return like this and this works as well so what is this future is a class that i'm returning from here and this class has a function which gets run as soon as you know we return something from here and this is just telling us that we want to return a string so no need of async over here we can just return a future like this async is needed so that we can use await and we are going to talk about it in just a minute but let's just get done with it now i can just call this function so let's have give a result after 2 seconds call and run it and you see we get hey hello greetings but we don't get hey like this why is that the case that's the case because we are returning a future string that means we have not printed anything so i want to go ahead and print it over here obviously that's the only thing that makes sense now if i run it what should i see i should be seeing hey right but no i see instance of future string why is that the case well that's because i'm returning a future string and then i'm calling it so i'm calling a future string so it's returning to me a future string so if i just stay, store it in a variable let's have final variable which is equal to this now let's call this variable result okay now if i print this result obviously it is going to give me a future string it's not giving me a string it is giving me a future string it is kind of enclosed in a future class so i want to get rid of this future how can i do that to do that i'll have to convert this function this main function into async why because this async gives me access to await this async is not necessary for future classes this future class can be created even when we return future like this this async is required whenever we want to use await and what await does is basically await for it right and if you want to search the meaning of await you can go ahead and search it according to english only wait for an event right so that's what we are doing we are waiting for this event to complete and then we have access to string result which we are printing over here now now if i try to run it i will see hey four times written over here then hey hello and greetings now you might ask if we put async over here we should be converting this to future void right if we did something like this and you know just try to return a string over here and also let's get rid of the future class when i try to do something like this it gave me an error because whenever we have async this needs to convert to a future and you're right it needs to but whenever you have void it's not really necessary you can convert this to a future void but it's not necessary it's a good practice definitely but it's not necessary and there's a difference between future void and void so if you want to know more about it i'll mention an article below which you can refer it basically tells that future void and void are different from each other dart doesn't throw any error if we use just void like this with an async but future void and void are different void is like a quick fire and forget meaning if you just call this function like this let's say we call give 
me a result after two seconds like this and it is of the type void all right so it will just fire this and you know it doesn't care about the result if it gives some result it will give if it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't care about it but if you have future void it will wait for this caller to complete and it will continuously listen to it so it's not fire and forget in future void but in void it is fire and forget i'll mention an article which goes deep into it but that was the basic gist i wanted to provide anyways coming back to this i'm just going to put it as void main because the starting functions are generally void main that's why now i can run it and well i get he written over yeah that's cool but give a result after 2 second is not giving me after 2 seconds what are you talking about it gives me right there and there itself and that's because we have just wrapped it in a future class however we can do more with this future class for example add a delay so to do that we need to return future dot delayed and if we do this it asks for two things over here first thing is a duration all right you'll see this what is this duration this duration is another class that you can provide over here so you'll have duration like this so if you don't understand anything you know this is a new function altogether and since this function is new you can just hover over this and it will give you proper examples for this so the thing that it gives over here is duration so we need to mention a duration and then we have this thing in a square bracket which means that it's optional you can pass it and you cannot pass in it doesn't matter and this is computation computation is basically telling do you want to return anything if you want to you can go ahead and return so first of all we want to pass in a duration so duration can be created like this uh, it is a class as well and this duration gives you multiple things you can pass in days hours minutes seconds and in the context of this function duration means how many seconds or how many hours or how many days do you want to wait i just want to wait for 2 seconds so i can just have seconds like this because it is a named constructor you can see this curly bracket right here that gives a hint i'll pass in 2 okay and after this i also want to return a string right so i can just have my computation in a separate function because it allows for that you can see it right over here and you have future string computation so i can return some sort of string here let's say hey again with many exclamation marks and we should be done yep there we go we are done if you want async over here you can have that async as well and it will not give any error basically the task of async is just to use await whenever you mark a function as async you allow the use of await keyword if you just remove async from here you see await will give an error it just says that we need to pass the function body or mark the function body as async only then await is allowed and obviously as a result of this you need to convert this to a future so that you denote it but in void i have already mentioned why we don't have to do that okay so now that we are done let's run this and you see we wait for 2 seconds so we get hey written over here like this and rest of the things follow along now what if i have print hello like this and then i run it so after this run gets executed you know you'll see hello like this then 2 seconds then hey gets printed and then rest of the things get executed now what if i remove the print result only and then i just say you know you can get rid of this as well then we run it we get hello after 2 seconds we get hey hello greetings so it is adding a delay of 2 seconds after which rest of the things get executed immediately now instead of marking this function as async there's another thing you can do so you can get rid of this async and await what you can do instead is get rid of this as well whenever you have a future function like this you can do dot and then it will give you some functions you have as stream which returns a stream we are going to study about streams shortly after futures then we have catch error which helps us catch any error it's like try and catch block but you have catch error function there itself 
but what we are interested in is then this then gives us some value which we can use okay so we have value over here and that value is a string so basically you call this function give a result after 2 seconds and after that function is executed completely and you can call dot then and dot then will give you a value which will be a string so you can go ahead and print val like this and then when you run it you get hello written first hey hello greetings all of them get executed and hey gets printed at last because it waited for 2 seconds since it was waiting for 2 seconds what this decided to do was print hello so let's run it again it will first print hello then it ran all of these print functions and then after we got a value after 2 seconds it printed the value so that's what then does so you could go ahead and use async await the way you want it to or you can just use dot then so that will print hello hey hello greetings all the synchronous code first and then it goes ahead and prints hey after 2 seconds also this function doesn't have to be asynchronous anymore because we are using dot then dot then doesn't require us to put is put the function as async only when you want to use await will you use async great so now that we have an understanding of this let's go ahead and fetch data from this url that we have how can i do that to do that we'll have to use something known as an external package or a dependency now what is this thing well there are certain things that are created by other developers in the dart community so that everyone can use it and one such thing is the http package so if we just go to pub.dev you can see it is dart packages it is basically a package repository it is a registry that contains all the packages you can use for dart and flutter apps and these packages are basically set of codes it's just like this code base but it performs some task and returns some functions to us which we can use and these things are created by the community or the google team itself but they've not shipped it with dart because that might be unnecessary elements present in the app because not everyone wants to you know have api calls in their apps or in their programs so that would be unnecessary right that's why dart packages are made and you can yourself go ahead and put out your own package on this pub.dev it is a registry of packages so you can search for anything this thing we are going to search for is http you can see this was created by the dart team itself if you see over here dart team themselves created it but they shipped it as a package not present in dart pad only or in dart only because not everyone wants to use it and dart size will increase if they have unnecessary code like http which not everyone wants to use but anyways coming back to this point of this app we are going to use this http package that we have to send api requests and we want to send an api request to jasonplaceholder.com/users now how do we use this and first of all i've still not cleared why do we need packages we need packages because well obviously we can send api requests from dart itself but that would include using elements which are really low level by low level i mean things that you know you won't be able to understand because well even i don't understand them it's for experienced developers who can simplify this for us giving us a very usable format in the format that you know people like me and you can understand obviously once you have enough experience you can develop your own package like http that probably would not be a big deal for you but as of now i don't think either you or me is able to do this so anyways you can see this using tab the easiest way to use this library is via the top level functions you know we have something known as uri 
which is uniform resource identifier. Then we have HTTP.post. So we are using something known as HTTP. We are posting it and that's it. But we are not going to dive into APIs here because all of this are basic concepts related to APIs and you know, HTTP, the way internet works. I'm not going to dive into it because, well, I want to cover futures, not API. This is not an API course, but basically to use it. First, we need to make sure that we can add HTTP in our Dart program. So if you're using a code editor and you have Dart installed on your machine, you would have to go ahead in a file called as pubspec.yaml and then take this Dart, copy it and add it to the pubspec.yaml like this. Then when you save it, it will run something known as Dart pub add or something like that. And then you'll be able to use HTTP in your apps. But we are not using code editor. We are using Dartpad. What can we do in Dartpad? We don't have anything like pubspec.yaml file. In fact, we don't have any files at all. So Dartpad is very good with this stuff. It has a built-in support for these packages. So all we need to do is call import. So import helps us to import other files. It can be files related to your program. We'll see that when we get in the Flutter course where we are going to install Flutter, run Flutter, and that will contain all the imports of our own files and of packages like HTTP and many more that we are going to use. And I would just like to mention again that it's fine to use packages that are created by someone else because that reduces our work easily, like much more. You wouldn't want to write your own implementation of these API requests because that can be very time consuming. You're trying to create an application, right? And if you want to create an application or a program, let's just avoid all of the extra stuff that we need to do. Let's just go ahead and use this package. So anyways, coming back to this, we have import and then we have to import this. With this import, you cannot only import Dart packages, but you can also import your own files that you've created so that you can use classes from there or let's say functions from there. You can do that. But we want to import a Dart HTTP, right? And this is how we do it. It's written over here. It's mentioned in their documentation. So we need package colon HTTP slash HTTP dot dot. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this thing over here. Great. Now it's not giving me an error, but it's just saying unused import. We have not used this HTTP package anywhere. So let's use it. But as you can see over here, we have as HTTP as well. What is this as HTTP? Well, basically let's get rid of a few things now. So let's comment this function. Let's remove this thing from here. Let's remove all the calls as well. Now, if I want to get a URL, what I need to do is just call get like this and it's able to get it. Yeah. The warning from here is gone and it's giving me an error over here because I need to pass some URL. So it wants me to send in some URI, which I can use to, you know, get some data from that function or from that service. And what is my service? JSON placeholder.typecode.com slash users. So I can use this get function, but here they've used as HTTP because people generally don't like to use just get function like this because your program or your file might have another function, which is get like this. And that might create confusion. So you do not know that you're using get, which is this function or get, which is coming from HTTP. That's why you can suffix it by suffix. I mean, you can add as HTTP. So all the stuff related to HTTP goes in this HTTP variable, or you can say module that you have. Now you can just do HTTP dot get like this. And now you can freely create void get and it won't complain. It won't complain because this void get is different from HTTP.get. If you want to call this get, you can just call get like this. But if you want to call HTTP's get, you can call HTTP.get. So I hope that was clear. That's why they've used as HTTP over there. Basically in HTTP source code, if you want to inspect it, you can just click over here. It will divert you to something known as getup. 
GitHub is basically containing all the source code related to the package. You can just go to lib HTTP dot dart. And this is the exact thing that we are importing. You can see there are lots of import statements over here. There are a lot of export statements, meaning it is exporting certain files and files contain classes, functions, all of that stuff, which we can use. And you can go ahead and see that there's get function defined in this HTTP dot dart, and it's not enclosed within any class. If it is not enclosed within any class, it's a global function, just like our main function right here or our get function right here. And that's why we were able to use just get like we have over here. If it was enclosed in some class, we would have to use, let's say some class dot get, but that's not the case with HTTP because it's a global function. So I hope you understood this. If you are interested, you can definitely go ahead and check the source code for more. This is like the entire implementation of HTTP plugin. Now let's close this and come over here. Now, what does get require? Get requires something known as URI. Let's go ahead and again, get to HTTP package, which I closed for some reason. So I'm here and now it will help me to use the package because I'm new to this package, right? Whatever implementation they have done, they need to guide me through it so that I can use it in my own programs. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy rest of the stuff. What I want to do is not post because post is basically sending data. I want to get because I want to get all of this data, right? So to get some data, what can I do? Well, I need to have something like HTTP dot get right. And nothing like that is mentioned in the documentation at least, but we can take some inference from HTTP dot post. Usually API elements are similar to each other when they're created by something like dart or flutter team themselves, because they know how to, you know, manage all of these things and bring consistency. So we can just have get over here and this requires URI dot HTTPS. And then we just need to pass in the domain name and that's pretty much it, right? So let's go ahead and do that. So we can copy this URL. Let's go ahead and copy it. So we have some URL and then we have URI dot HTTPS. Now there are a bunch of other methods that you can use on URI because URI is a class like URI.file, URI.HTTP, URI.HTTPS, URI.pass. So basically if you pass in, let's say JSON placeholder.typeycode.com slash users, it will pass that and convert it into a URI and then we can pass it to HTTP.get because HTTP.get requires a URI. So I think we can either use HTTPS because JSON placeholder dot .com is HTTPS or we can use URI dot pass. Now I could suggest you URI dot pass because I've already used HTTP in the past, but let's go ahead and use HTTPS, but obviously you can use HTTPS. And if you want to know more about it, it will tell you first thing that it needs is authority, then an unencoded path. So what is this thing? Authority is like example.com. You can see that it gives example.com is this thing right here. JSON placeholder dot code.com. Okay. That's fine. I'll enclose it in a string. Now after this, it wants something known as a path. What is a path? Well, in a URL, this thing right here is the main authority. You can say, and this thing right here is a path. If you want to know more, you can just have URL breakdown, then go to images for a good diagrammatic representation. And there we go. We have HTTP, which is the scheme. So in our case, we are using HTTPS because this is HTTPS. Then we have authority, which is example.com, including the port, but we don't care about the port. Port is usually used when you're creating your own server on your own machine and it allocates a path to the server that is running. And yeah, Dart can be used to create servers as well, but that's a topic for another tutorial, not for this one. 
Then we have path to the file. Path to the file is basically anything after slash. And then we have parameters, which is question mark and all of that stuff. But let's ignore parameters. We don't care about it right now. We want path. And the path over here is users. So I can just go ahead and pass users like this and we're done. So I can close all of this stuff, pass in the URL over here and there we go. But what does get returned to us? It returns future response. You can see, I don't obviously know what it's going to return, but by seeing the function definition all the time, I get to know that, yeah, this is going to return future response. So that means it is encoded in future and it will ret return a response to me. So I can just have async over here so that I can await it or you can just have dot then done. And I will st save this in a response. Now this response can be variable or final, but this thing right here cannot be a constant. Why cannot it cannot be a constant because as I said, constant is a compile time constant and HTTP.get and any future is not compile time constant. It is a runtime constant. So we'll have to use final over here. And now if I just try to print response, what do you think it will give me? Well, it is a class response, right? If it is a class response, most likely it is going to give us instance of response because that's what we've seen for other classes as well, right? And if I run this function, we see instance of response and you could see console was blank for a second or two because it was fetching data from this server or from the service. But it's giving me instance of response. And since I've used this response earlier, you know, I can just tell you that response is a very big object. What we are interested in is response.body because response.body will give us this thing right here. Response will give us a bunch of other properties that we don't really care about, like headers, status code. All of this is, you know, we, we need to care about it. But as of now, we don't care about it. All right. We care about only the body, the thing that it's returning, right? The 10 items that it has. Now I can run it and there we go there in my console, I get everything. So if I just put it down, we have this thing right here. So we have successfully fetched some data from an external service using HTTP package an external dependency. If you just try to do this without it, you won't be able to do it just using all of that stuff. All right. So this is where HTTP can help us. And as a matter of fact, any dot package. But yeah, you need to make sure that this is a dot package, not a flutter package to use it in dot pad. If it is a flutter package, you cannot use it. And flutter packages are known as plugins and dot packages are known as well packages. So anyways, we have all of this data. Now this API is actually pretty good. You can play along with it by just having users slash one. So you're just passing in, let's say the ID of the user that you want to get. So it just gets you one user. So you can just use that. So in your path, you'll just have users slash one. Then when you run it, it will just give you one object over here, one map. It won't give you a list. As you can see, it gives you one object, not a list. And if you hover over this body, it is actually a string. It is not really a map. Why? We want it to be a string like a map, right? And the reason for that is because our HTTP service doesn't know that we what URL we have connected to. We just pass it that, yeah, we have, we want to get data from this URL, just do your thing and give me the result. But in reality, it doesn't know. So it's just giving us a string of everything possible so that, you know, we can print it out and do anything that we want. Now, an obvious thing in your mind would be, how can I convert this to a map? This is a string. And if I want to access one particular property on it, like res.body at name, I cannot do this because this thing right here is not allowed on a string. Yes, you can pass in res.body at zero, which would mean that it you are telling it to get the first character of this string and the first character of the string is a curly bracket. So it would just return to you a curly bracket. But 
you're not really getting any name property or anything so valid question is how do i get the data and to get all of this data you have to use another package but not from pub.dev it is built into dart and that is dart convert so we have dart convert like this and this will help us to convert string into let's say a map so to do this i will just call call a function which was created by json uh, which was created in the dart convert package so whenever you have package it's most likely that you are referring to an external package like something from pub.dev or or from your own file system only so from your own program as well when you have multiple files so it would be package the program name that you've passed in and some file over here but when you have dart convert it most likely means that it's coming from dart only so since it's coming from dart only you don't have to register in pubspec.yaml file or anything now i'm sure it's not very clear to you but it will get clear when we dive into flutter and you'll understand it better so you can just copy this res.body and put it in json encode what is this json encode well it's taking an object and returning a string that means it is encoding the particular body in a json format but that's not our point we want to well get the json out from this right so for that we have json decode and this json decode is opposite of json encode json encode encodes the json that means it you know it is converting it into a json format and json decode is decoding the json format in res.body and this json decode returns a dynamic to us and now you'll be like hey ravan you said we cannot use dynamic but the dart team itself is using dynamic how does that work well it works because well we're not absolutely sure that will it return a list will it return a map we are not sure why because when we had users it was returning a list but when we have users slash one it is returning a map how will dart know what we are trying to return and that's why it is dynamic i said there are certain conditions where dynamic is unavoidable but when you have the chance to avoid it you must avoid it so over here what you can do right now is you know just have json decode like this so it's a dynamic so you can call something like name on it and it should print lian graham properly if i've pronounced it correctly and we have lian graham right over here so we have successfully got data from an external api and that data is one element only so this was about future why did we have to fu use future here well you could see http.get returned a future to us if we don't have async await and you know the future classes we won't be able to get data from external services not just external services we cannot use future dot delayed or anything but the primary use case is getting data from external services also sometimes you know all of this can result in errors as well right now we were lucky enough to get data but what if you don't have internet connection so i'm just going to stop the internet connection then i'm going to try to run it well it's just giving me an error compiling to javascript because dartpad doesn't run without internet so i guess i'll have to run the internet but to showcase this i'm just going to pass in the incorrect url over here i'm just going to pass in use and nothing like use exists all right so if i just try to do this it's nothing and also here i will misspell json placeholder like this json placeholder that sounds wrong json place hr all right now we can run it and you see we get an exception now we know whenever we get an exception what do we want to do we want to wrap it in a try and catch block and the exception here is xml http request error so to resolve it we can have try block and a catch block whenever we get e we are just going to print e let's say dot to string or print e both of them work and we are going to put both of them inside of this try block and then when we run it we should be seeing the exception printing out xml http request but in white color 
so we have handled it successfully and then we can say some unexpected error occur and then when we run it we will be able to see the nice output in console now the reason for you know some er exception like this is not just because you have named this incorrectly or something this can also be there because the service that we are trying to contact is temporarily unavailable right and in that case we cannot do anything it's not our fault it's the service provider's faults and maybe they are fixing it so that's why error 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 or exception handling is so difficult or so important not difficult sorry it's quite easy as you can see and obviously if you don't want to have a try catch block like this you can go ahead and not use async await as well you can just have dot then which will give you the value so you'll have value like this then you can just print value dot body because that will give you a response and then you can catch an error over here as well so you have catch error like this you can catch it like this and then we have print error so if you do this it will work as well and you will get xml http request error perfect but yeah one thing to note if you are using dot then don't use async await if you are using async await don't use then because either of them need to be used if you use both it's just showing your lack of concept because both are essentially doing the same thing giving us a value out of a future so now that we've understood future you know we've learned quite a lot about futures let's get rid of them and learn another thing present in asynchronous programming which is streams all right so let's dive into streams and then we'll also understand what is the difference between streams and future actually as a fun exercise let's just start with what is stream and what is the difference between future and stream so what exactly is a stream stream is basically an asynchronous generator so it's related to asynchronous programming just like future which allows us to produce a sequence of values over time so you remember how in future what you had to do was send a request so that you could call a function and then it gave you some value back but what if you're creating an app where you want to continuously listen to users input and you know listen if the user changed their name or not how would you do that in future you cannot because you don't know when the user will update the name so that you can send a request to it right so that's where streams come in in stream you send a request similar to future but not very similar to fu uh, future why because this is not a request it's a request to subscribe basically you're subscribing to an event over here and that event is basically telling you hey just keep giving me updates it's like a youtube channel only right if you subscribe to my channel you'll keep getting updates about my videos about you know community posts and stuff over here if you subscribe to an event you get updates related to that event so you just have values returned like this all right so let's say the first time user changes name from rivan to rivan r then rivan ranawat so this is where you would use stream you cannot possibly use future in this scenario why because you don't know when the user will end change the name if the user changes name then only i will send a request so that i get the updated value so let's see a code example for this a nice example i can think of is a countdown app so let's create void countdown and i can just have let's say a for loop where i say for int i is equal to 5 i is greater than 0 i minus minus and then i will print i all right so what i've done is gone from i is equal to 5 and as long as i is greater than 0 i'm decrementing right so i have 5 4 3 2 1 printing out and then i can just call this function right over here and then when we run it we should be seeing 5 4 3 to 1 but as you can see all of them got printed really quick i do not want that what i want is 5 to be present then 4 should come in after a while 3 should come in after a while and so on 
So in this case, I can go ahead and use async star like this. Whenever you use async star, you need to have stream, just like when you put async, it needs to be a future. So in async star, it needs to be a stream like this. But if I just do this and run, it isn't going to return me anything at all. Why? Because, well, this is a stream. So you have a stream of void. And why would you call anything like this, right? If you have a stream, it basically means it's going to return something. Why would you have a stream that doesn't return anything? That doesn't make sense. So to return something from the stream, what can I do? I can just have return I like this. Will that work? No, because this return will only work when you have future or integer or whatever type is there but it won't work with streams. In stream, instead of return, you need to have yield. Why is the yield written over here? Well, that's because if you search the meaning of yield, it will tell you to produce or provide. That means it is providing me with a value i every single time. And then if you're returning a value, it makes much more sense if we just have integer over here. And then if I try to print it, will it print anything? No. I can tell you this because we've not printed anywhere. How will you print it? You're just returning a value from here. You're basically providing a value from here, but you're not quite printing it. So should I go ahead and print this function? Will that work? If you've guessed no, then perfect. Because you've understood it. You've understood that it's going to return stream of integer. That means it's going to return instance of something and that is controller stream integer. It's not quite returning me a string. So for it to return stream, we have to probably access some values returned over here. So we can just have countdown dot and that gives us a bunch of values that are related to controller stream. So we have first, which gives us the first value and in our first value, we should be getting five. So let's go ahead and try it out. So we have print like this. And then when we try to run it, it's going to return to us an instance of future int. Why? Because if you hover over this, this returns to us a future. So what can I do? Well, I can just use a wait over here and I should be seeing five now, right? Because it gives me a future integer. I awaited it. So it gives me an integer. Perfect. But I don't want the first value. I want all the values to be printed. So I'll have to find another method and you can keep scrolling and you'll find some methods. We can't use is broadcast is empty because those are Boolean values. We know we want an integer returning listener kind of thing. So we can just keep on searching for it. So we have async map, we have drain, we have all of these functions, but the one I'm listening for is listen. Right now, this listen function gives us stream subscription. What is this stream subscription thing? This stream subscription is a listener on stream and can save a reference to the stream's subscription. This allows us to pause, resume, or cancel the flow of data we receive. This stream subscription also has multiple handlers over here. These things right here are called handlers. It gives us on data handler. So whenever you have data listening, you get, well, a function we can use to handle the data, the incoming data. Then we have a function on error handler. So if there's an error, what should we do? On done handler, where it says, if we are done with the stream, what should we do? That means we've got all the values from five to one and the C stream value has stopped. What should I do? In that case. So that's what on done is for and cancel on error. So if there's an error, should we cancel or should we not cancel by cancel? I mean, should the stream continue or should it just stop? So let's go ahead and first let's just pass in the on data handler. And as you can see on error on done and cancel on error are in named arguments, but on data is not a named argument. So I can just go ahead and create 
something like this. And since it's a function, I need to put in a function. But that's not it. Why? Because this is function integer on data. So it's giving me an integer over here. So let's have value over here. And then we can print value like this. And then we should be done because this value will be an integer. Correct? Now, if I run it, I get 54321 instantly. So it's no different from five print statements that we have put. So to make a difference, what we are going to do is use await future dot delayed seconds one. So I'm just going to put a delay of one second so that the values keep coming after some time. And if you're wondering, hey, Rivan, how can you use await over here? Isn't this an async star function? Or isn't this function marked as async star? Well, you're right. This is marked as async star. But as you can see, we have used async over here and async star is a special type of async, you can say. So we can use await with async star as well. And here it's giving us an error because it expects a duration and I've put seconds one. So I need to put duration, then seconds one. A small mistake right there. And then we should be able to run it. And we see five, four, three, two, one, and we're done. So as you can see, stream gave us this output and this was really cool. And for fun, what I'm going to do here is also have on done, but on done cannot be just like this because this is a named argument. And you might ask, why is this a named argument? Couldn't they just put everything as positional argument? And you're right, but it can cause a lot of confusion because, well, this is function on data. Then you have function again, then you have function again, then you have Boolean value. So it can cause a little bit of confusion with all these three functions over here. So they've kept the first one as on data and then all of them as named arguments. All right. Now we can also have on error over here. So let's have on error. Now you might wonder why are these two things over here as named arguments? And these two things named arguments are there because if we don't want on error to be present, we can't just pass in, all right? So if I just skip it, yeah, I'm done with on error. I don't want to have any handler on it. I just want there to be an, a handler on done, all right? So I'll just have it like this. And I've correctly defined it. Let's have another print statement here. And it says, hey, I completed it. And then when I run it, I get five, four, three, two, one. Hey, I completed it, right? What if I put a print statement after this? So I just print hi over here and then I run it. What will I get in that case? I get high instantly. Why? Because it's an asynchronous generator. <laughs> Stream is an asynchronous generator. That means it printed this thing first and then, you know, it continued with its own thing. So this was about the basic of Stream. There's much more you can do with Stream. For example, Stream gives us a bunch of options that we can have. For example, we can have return stream dot and as you can see stream gives us a bunch of things we can have stream dot periodic which is like future dot delayed but a bit different why because stream dot periodic is basically like hey in every one second you're just going to put that out so we are just going to have stream dot periodic and now you'll say hey why are we getting an error over here as i told you before when you have stream you cannot have return but that was slightly incorrect why? It's not because of the stream that I cannot return. It's because of this async star that I cannot return. So if I just remove this async star, I get to use return because then I'm just returning a stream, right? I'm finally returning the stream what it wants. But if I have async star, it's basically telling, hey, you've already converted this to a stream. Then you're again trying to return a stream. That doesn't make sense to me. 
So whenever you are wasting star, you need to use yield. You cannot use return. But when you remove it, you can return. But it needs to return a stream. Just like you know anything else, if we have integer passed in over here instead of stream, and we need to pass an integer, right? So that way. Now in periodic, what do we want? We want a duration. We want a computation, just like we had for future dot delay. But this is going to be a bit different. Why? Because we are going to have seconds one, and then in our computation, I'm going to return one, let's say, and it's giving me this error because we are getting some value over here. All right. Now instead of returning one, we can just return the value, and let's run it and see what we get. So we get zero, one, two, three, four, five. But it didn't stop here because you have not set any constraints, and it's just returning to me periodically after every one second the value. And this value is basically like, hey, we are calling this once, we are calling this second time, we are calling this function third time, we are calling this function fourth time, and it will keep on returning. So that's what a stream is, and this is what stream dot periodic is now of course a valid question over here is rivan how do i stop and to be honest i'm not sure there might be a way to stop this but i'm not very sure about it because there is another approach i would take to stop it and that's using a controller so as of now i'm just going to restart the dart pad so that the console you know stops its work and i can just focus on my coding and right now the other way i was talking about is creating something known as a stream controller what is a stream controller well let's break the word down we have stream controller this is basically a controller of a stream so with this controller you can automatically create a stream you can add the values to the stream for example i can just use the stream controller and add values from any function i want but yeah this stream controller's instance should be passed down i'll give you an example for it a really nice example but for now stream controller is basically a thing that can control your stream by providing methods to add some values to a stream cancel the stream pause the stream whatever just like we have stream controller on this you know the instance of stream controller we have this so that allows us to do whatever we want now i can just have final controller which is equal to stream controller and i'm just going to go ahead and instantiate this but the stream controller is not defined it's saying that why because the stream controller is not manually present here we need to import a dart library a library that was created by dart themselves a package you can say so we can have import dart async right here okay so it's coming from dart themselves and when we have dart async we get access to stream controller now we can use this controller to have the properties we want so it can be controller dot and as you can see it has multiple options dot done dot has listener so this is also a boolean value is closed is also there is paused is also there on cancel so what happens when you cancel the stream or the stream has been cancelled on listen so we already know it's similar to this on listen function but the difference is this listen values listen for any error or it listens for any value but this on listen is basically called whenever the stream as is listened to right it's started listening to so we have on pause so what to do if the stream gets paused on on resume sync now this is a new concept and a very important one stream which is basically returning us a stream of this and as you can see it returns to us a stream of dynamic instead of a stream of integer which is what i want why because the stream controller requires a generic type to be mentioned over here we have already seen that we can pass generic operators or generic types to a 
class. And that's exactly what stream controller wants over here. Otherwise, how will it know what is the stream of? And now if you come over here, this is now of the type stream integer. So when you do dot stream, it gives you a stream value from this controller. Then you have a bunch of other properties, but we have sync over here. What is this sync? This sync gives us a bunch of properties or a bunch of functions, you can say. It gives us add, which allows us to add a particular value to this stream. Add error, which allows us to add any error if we want. We can add another stream over here. We can close this sync, so we stop listening to everything. We can convert it to a string and we have done. It will give you a complete value, all right? So if you have controller.sync.add, let's say a value one, a value two, a value three, a value four, and a value five, done will just give us a future of that value. So the entire thing that we get, the bunch of values that we get, we will get them in this future dynamic get done. So anyways, let's get back to sync. And I just want to add a value to this sync, which will be one. And now if I just have controller dot, I again get a bunch of properties on this and what I want to do here is controller dot stream. So I just want to get access to its stream and then I want to listen to it and this will give me some value. I can just print it and I'll have the value printed out like this. And it's not on listen, it's just listen. Don't confuse that. On listen is called whenever, you know, you start listening to a stream. But here you want to listen. So you'll have this. And then when we run it, we should have two streams that are going on. This one is one. All right. So this is this stream's work. And then we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That will continuously keep moving. So this was controller. Now there's so much more you can do with a controller. Let's remove the stream completely and let's call countdown over here, obviously. And we're just going to put a void over here. We don't want to do anything fancy. We have our stream controller. We are just going to be satisfied with it. Now I can just have more values added over here. So I'll have add two, three, four, five. And now if I run it again, I see one, two, three, four, five, right here. Great. Instead of just adding some values over here, what I'm going to do is add an error as well. So I'll have add error like this. And then I'm going to return an error. And the error can be a string because it allows me to add an object. And then it should say, hey, error. That's our error message. Quite good. Now, if I return it, you see, we get one, two, three, four, five, and then an uncaught error, hey, error. To resolve this, we can add on error property over here, which gives us error. And now I can just print the error right over here. Cool. So if I run it, I should be seeing hey, error right here. Perfect. So with this controller, I get more access to it. I can add errors, I can add values, I can do bunch of stuff over here. For example, I can also do controller dot sync dot and then I can add another stream, I can close it. So if I just close it, will the error get printed? Let's see. So if I run it, we get uncaught error, cannot add event after closing. So as you could see, even though we closed, we are adding an error. That's why it gave us this exception. So to resolve it, we can either put it this in a try and catch block. That would work as well. Or you can just resolve your error and that's done. But yeah, one thing I'd like to mention that whenever you're done adding values, it's always good to close your stream controllers sinks over here. Also make sure to close your stream. So you will have controller dot close. So make sure to close the controller as well. And to close the sync as well. It's always a good thing to do so. 
so this was about streams there are lots and lots of things in streams as well but i'm not covering all of them because i just wanted to let you know the basics and other stuff is not generally used by 99% of the developers only the 1% use it for example there's stream transformer i've not never used it in any of the app i've built for myself or for client so i don't know why you would use it and i don't want to confuse you any further whenever you want to use it you'll definitely know by yourself we can also create records on our own so to create a record we just create a normal variable then set it equal to the normal parenthesis which is the standard type for a record then we pass in the values so we have 4.5 for a double a string and then a boolean and integer value now if we just try to print this record and run it we get the correct values and we can access them using dot dollar 1 dollar 2 dollar 3 dollar 4 one thing to note is that these records are immutable and these dollar 2 dollar 1 dollar 3 dollar 4 that we are getting are getters and the records don't have any setters because they are immutable so that just means we cannot do records dot dollar 2 equal to some value because the error message says the setter is undefined so we only have a getter other than this we can also define named arguments for these records so we can just have greeting here and let's say is adult here if we print it we get that and if we go to records we get double an integer which is 4.5 and 2 then the named arguments and if we do records dot we see dollar 1 and dollar 2 which stands for 4.5 and 2 greeting and then is adult also these records are type safe that means if i change this to var and then do records equal to let's say 2.0 then i pass in false then i say greeting is hi and is adult is false then here i get an error the reason for this is i've passed the correct data type at first which is double but then i've passed in a boolean value it shouldn't be a boolean value it should actually be an integer so if i pass in an integer the error goes away which means it's type safe just like other variables in dart we can also make these records nullable so if we just define it like this double and integer then we put a question mark just to show that it's nullable and then give it a name so let's pass in name equal to 4.5 to then print the name then i set name is equal to null and then print name again let's see what we get so you see for at first we get 4.5 comma 2 and then we get null and the last thing that i want to show you in records is the equality of records so if we have a record that looks like this int int and end then it has the variable name of point and that is equal to 1 2 3 for x y z respectively and then if we have another record that is similar to the first record but instead of having x here we have a and here since this one was a this will be a as well instead of x and everything else is similar and then if we do point is equal to color you see we get an error this is because dart considers both of these variables different from each other for a record to be equal to another record all the fields should be matching here so if i just change this back to x and then i'll have to change this to x as well now we see point is equal to color you can however change the values over here so we have 5 10 and let's say 12 you can do that but these arguments should be the same for both of them to be comparable or assignable together records are real values you can store them in variables pass them to and from functions and store them in lists there's more to patterns so suppose we have a list like this so to get access to these elements what we do is list at 0 or list at 1 or list at 2 but with records that's not necessary 
what we can do here is just put a comma b comma c inside a square bracket just imitating this list and set it equal to this list so let's see what we get here we can print it out like this and we see 1 2 and 3 but what if we have more elements than just 1 2 3 what if we have 4 5 6 7 8 9 as well now if we try to run it we are going to get an error right because we have nine elements and we are just assigning to three of them. To resolve this error, what we can do is just have dot 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 at the end. Now, if we have that, the error is resolved and ABC contain the value one, two, three. And the rest are contained in these three dots. But what if I want four, five, six, seven, eight, nine as a separate independent array? We can get that as well by just doing D putting a D after these three dots and then having dollar D like this. Now, if I run this, we have one, two, three, which is ABC and D is a separate array because dot, dot, dot gave it access to the remaining elements. And obviously, if the second element here doesn't matter to you, you can put an underscore here. So it will neglect that value. And this underscore isn't a variable. So if you just try to do underscore, it will come undefined. Now, what if instead of a list, we have access to a JSON or a map? So if we have access to this, we are used to printing the values like this JSON user ID, then running it, and then we get the user ID. With dot three, this can become much more simpler. With dot three, what you can do is just have final followed by user ID, then the name of the variable, let's call it user ID again, title, and then again pass in the name of the variable. So we have title and set it equal to JSON. Now, if we try to print user ID and title, let's see what we get. And ex as expected, we get the user ID as one and the title as this thing right here. So we have destructured this successfully as well. We have a map. We've passed in the field name over here, then assigned a variable name to this, which is user ID. Then we can use this user ID anywhere we want. Then we have title. And then we've assigned a variable name to it as well and passed it over here. If you want to do it for body, you can again pass body here and whatever the name should be, let's call it B. And you can pass print B to it and run it and you'll get the desired output. Doing stuff like this can often be error prone. So for this, it's recommended to put an if condition and to follow the syntax, there's a special type of if condition that was introduced in dart three. So we have if JSON, which is the name of the map that we have used to get our values case, which is now a keyword, then this part right here, the map the mapping that we have done, if this is the case, then it means we are successful with our mapping. And here you will see we are getting errors. The reason for that is we have not put final year and we cannot put that in an if condition. So here, what we can do is pass string user ID, string title and string B. This will actually be an integer, but let's see what we get if we put string over here. And obviously we'll just print stuff out here. So let's copy it, paste it. Then we have an else condition. And in the else condition, let's just remove this. We are going to print out stuff again. All right. So let's try to run it and see what we get. And you see, we are getting incorrect JSON now. Why is that the case? Because we've passed in a string over here and the value retrieved is not string. It means that user ID is now having a type of its own, which is a good thing. So we can just pass in an integer, run it again, and we get the correct output. So just revisiting this if condition again, we just need to put a name of the map we are using to get the values from, in our case, JSON, case, and if the case is this, that means user ID is there, which is integer, title, which is string title, and body, which is string body, then it's the correct thing. And then we print it. Otherwise it's incorrect JSON. And if we mention the wrong type, we are going to get incorrect JSON. This if condition can also be rewritten in switch. So let's try to write it. 
if you have switch json and case is just like this the same thing here so we have user id int user id title string title body string b then we are just going to print these stuff out otherwise we have incorrect json again so let's remove this if condition now and run this we get the same output again and again if you misspell anything or do anything wrong here you'll get incorrect json now let's try to get elements of a class so this is a human class we have the human has name and a age and the year and in the main function we are creating an instance of human class and printing its name and age and then when we try to run it we get nice name and two as the name and age that's how we did in dot 3 and before but with pattern matching what you can do is final human then pass the name of the fields here name age with a colon before them equal to human and now you can print name and try to run it and you'll get access to nice name and similarly for age so this is pattern matching in dot for class related stuff so here you need to mention the name of the class followed by a colon here then the name of the field again colon then the name of the field again which is equal to human and you can also pass age here name here then try to run it and we still get the correct output but if you misspell this like this suppose name is nimi and then you try to run it you get a compile time error of course that name isn't defined for the type human since your class name is human and there's no property of name here you cannot use nimi so you need to pass name here and if you're wondering why we need to put this colon before the name that's because we want it to rename for example if this is the age property and we want to use ag like this you can use this or if you want name property and want to call it something else so let's call it something else and then try to print it you'll be able to use both of these values it's kind of like mapping and it works so the field is age and you're using the variable name ag or you have the field name name and then you're using something else but if you want to go ahead with the default one you can just go ahead by putting colon at the end or at the start sorry so now i have a different example with me i have a list of items with the elements hi and man then i have a switch case where list of items has the case of hi and man exactly what we have here and if that's the case then we are printing dude if we are in dot 2 and try to run it you see we don't get anything now if i switch to dot 3 and then try to run it you see we are getting access to dude that means it's able to recognize switch case conditions properly and we can do this for records for maps or whatever we want another cool thing we can do here is check for two different elements in a single list so i can just check here pu putting an or sign saying if hi is this or hi is this and man is there in the list if that's the case then we are going to print dude then i'll try to run it and we get the same output so that means if i put hi in the list of items and then try to run it i get dude again so we can put or conditions here how it's working is basically if the first element is either high or high and the second element is man or you can also put or or man like this or any other thing you want it will work another cool thing you can do with switch cases in dot 3 is just put a when guard here so when and suppose we have int index is equal to 2 and when index is equal equal to 2 then only it should print dude so when you try to run it it spits out dude so what's happening here is we are checking for the or conditions and the entire list then we are checking when index is 2 then only print dude otherwise we can put a default condition print
Bruh. And let's shift index to one, then try to run it. And you see, we get, Bruh. since index is one and index is not equal to two. So it went to the default condition because this case did not match. So this is extra addition guard that you can add to your switch cases. Another cool thing you can do with switch cases now is use them to assign variables or use them in Flutter itself in the UI code. So just to demonstrate it to you, I'm going to create two variables. Page is equal to zero. Last page is equal to one. And then I'm going to have a text where I'm going to use switch case. So I'm going to have switch. Then I'm going to pass in page. Then after the brace, we don't need to put the case keyword here. Instead, we can just match the conditions. So we have zero, which will be returning, let's say, click here. And then one, which says click me. And then underscore, which means the default case. So you don't have to write default like this. You can just have underscore and then we can write none. And there we are. So we have used switch case inside of a variable just to assign it a value. Now, if I try to print text and then run it, you see, I get click here, which means I'm getting the condition executed when it was zero. Now, if I try to use last page, I can run it. I get click me. Now I can also add a when condition if I want. So I'll have when, and then if I try to run it, I get none because the last page is one, but page is not equal to last page. So I get the default case executed. Now, if I just make page and last page, both one, then try to run it. I get click me. So I have a problem with dart now. If I have, let's say a string and that string is, let's say motivation and that motivation string just says, this is a good world. And now what you want to do is in this motivation, capitalize this T and keep rest of the string as it is. So I just want this to convert it like this. This is a good word. So I want it to be like this. Now it's easy to change, right? I can just do motivation is equal to motivation at zero. So it catches the T and then I can call a method on this called to uppercase. So that means it will convert it to an uppercase. So this T will get converted to a capitalized T. But if I just set it to this much, my motivation will become a capitalized T. Rest of the things will disappear. I do not want that. So I'll have to add rest of the string to this. How can I add rest of the string over here? We already know about substring, right? So substring helps us to get certain parts of the string. So definitely substring will help us over here as well. So I can just do motivation dot substring. And then I have to provide a starting value and an optional end value. So my starting value is going to be one because substring starts from zero. But I've already passed in the value of zero, which is a capitalized T. And I want rest of this thing. So I'm going to start my substring from one. So it will include H and the rest of this thing. And if we don't mention the end, it will go till the end of the string, right? So this is my motivation and I can just go ahead and print motivation over here. And if I do this much, I get this is a good world exactly the way I want it. But if I have hundreds of other functions and everywhere, I want this format for my strings. So if I have my name passed in like this, I want my name to be written like this. All right. The first part should be capitalized. Now I can't keep taking this thing over here copying it and putting it on all the strings. How can I do something that will make sure that I have a function on the string present itself? So I have a function present on this string, like we have two uppercase. Now that seems impossible, right? Because this all function two uppercase substring is created by dart itself. If it is created by dart itself, how can I change it? I'll have to go to the dart source code and change it. And obviously dart won't accept my changes 
just because I want it in my code. That's why Dart has made this very easy for us. In my code, I can have something known as extensions. With extension, I can specify some code or some function which will get added to the string. Let's see an example. I'll have extension capitalize first letter on string. So this is the syntax for an extension. You have the extension keyword, just name the extension. The extension name doesn't really matter, but just so that you can find it later on and it's easy for you to debug your programs after you write the code, just name it something good. And this should be Pascal case as well. Then you have the on keyword. So it says that this extension and all the methods that you're going to provide in this extension are going to be available on what type. So I've passed in a string. You can also have an integer so that you can use it on integer or on some other types. You already know more about it. And then I'm going to have a function created like a normal function. So I'll have string capitalize first letter. Then I can just copy this thing from here, paste it, return it, but I get an error over here. The error says that motivation is not defined and rightly so motivation is defined in this function, not over here. How can I access the value that we get on the string? So for that we have access to the this keyword. So we just replace motivation with this. This gives us access to the word or the string on which we are calling this method. So we have this at zero to uppercase, then this dot substring, which gives us a warning saying unnecessary qualifier. So we can just remove it and put substring and that works as well. And now if I just do motivation is equal to motivation dot, you'll see we get access to capitalize first letter function. Earlier, this was not present on string, but from now on, this will be present on every string we create, not just motivation. So if we just do this and run, we should be seeing the same output. And we see that. But now if I just create another string, let's call it Rivan like this. And then we have name is equal to name dot, we again get access to capitalize first letter, which just shows that this function that we created is accessible on every string we create. And that's very useful for me. So you can create multiple methods in this and you can create multiple extensions as well. This is a great way to reuse your code and reduce the complexity of your program. I personally like this feature a lot and use it wherever I can. So this was it for this course. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next course, which is the Flutter Beginners course, where we will use all of the Dart knowledge we have till now and that will help us quite a lot.